Welcome back. In the previous steps, we looked at two basic data structures. One was array. Array stores all the elements sequentially and whenever you delete an element, you have to remove that element and push all the other elements after it to the left. But retrieving values at a specific position with an array is very easy. I can directly say I would want element at index 5 and I would be able to directly get 80. The other data structure we looked at was linked list. In linked list, each element is linked to the next one. And in doubly linked list, 25 is linked to 4 as well as it has a link to 45. So that's called a doubly linked list. In linked list, insertion and deletion of elements is easier because if I have to remove 25, all that I need to do is move the link from 45 to 4, 25 is deleted. As simple as that. If I add, if I want to add a new number, 21 in between, I just put 21 here and change the link of 25 to 21 and 21 to 4. However, with a linked list, trying to retrieve something at a specific position or searching for something is a costlier operation because you have to traverse through the links one by one until you go to the end of the list to find out if something is present in the list. The data structure that we want to focus on in this step is called hash table. It takes a completely different approach on how it stores elements. It tries to combine the fixed positions similar to an array and the advantages of the linked list. For example, here we have 13 different positions which are present in here. These 13 things in here are called buckets and you store elements into each of these buckets. How do we store elements into this bucket? We have something called a hashing function. So let's say I would want to decide where I want to store 15. Which bucket do I want to store 15? What I would do is I'll evaluate the hashing function 15. The hashing function we are using in here is mod 13. So we would divide by 13 and take the reminder and put the element in that bucket. For example, over here, 15 mod 13 is 2. That's why it's in the second bucket. If I want to put 34, you can see it in the bucket with index 8. That's because 34 mod 13 is 8. 34 is 2 times 13 is 26. 34 minus 26 is 8. That's why it's at index 8. You can see that 13 is at index 0 because 13 mod 13 is 0. So what we are doing is we are using something called a hashing function. The hashing function is used to decide which bucket an element goes into. Let's say now I would want to insert 2 into this list. What would happen? I would do 2 mod 13. The bucket number is 2. So I would want to store it in here. There is already 15 in here. So what we would do is we would attach 2 to this list. So in addition to 15, we will have 2 in here. Let's say I would want to delete 34. All that I need to do is 34 mod 13. I would get 8. I will come here and see if there is 34. And if 34 is there, this element is deleted. Let's say I would want to find out if an element 4 is present in this specific hash table. I would do 4 mod 13. 4 mod 13 is 4. So I would check at index 4. At index 4, nothing is present. So 4 is not present in this list. The advantage of a hash table is that you can easily insert elements in and you can search for elements and you can delete elements much more easily. Hash table provides very fast searches. Insertion of elements can be little slower than the linked list at certain point in times, but it's much faster than an array. The efficiency of the hash table will always depend on the efficiency of your hashing function. In Java, we would implement the hashing function using something called hash code. If you look at the object class, there is a method called hash code. That hash code is used to determine which bucket 
an object gets stored into. The hashing function which we are using in here, mod 13, is just an example. There might be a variety of hashing functions which might be used in different kinds of scenarios. These hashing functions we can implement using hash code method in Java. One of the most important things is you do not need to be an expert on hashing or hash table. The idea behind this is just to give you a high level picture of how hashing works so that when we introduce collections which are based on hash tables at a later point in time, you'd be able to get how they work in the background. In summary, the key part of a hash table is the hashing function. We use the hashing function to decide which bucket to store an element into and if there are elements attached to that bucket already and you are trying to insert a new element, it would be added to the list of elements. Hash table makes searches also very easy because you directly go to the bucket and look for the elements. So you are not really searching the entire list of elements, but a set of certain elements inside that particular bucket. Similar logic applies to insertion as well as deletion of elements as well. In the previous steps, we looked at a few data structures, right? We started with arrays, we looked at linked lists, we also looked at hash table, and now we would be looking at another data structure called tree. The awesome thing about a tree is it helps us store elements in a sorted order. There are a wide varieties of trees which are present. In this specific example, we are using something called a red-black tree. The details are not really important. It's very important to understand how data is stored into a tree. How are elements stored into this specific tree? If you look at this specific tree, you can see that all the elements on the left hand side of every element are smaller than that element. And all the elements on the right hand side of an element are greater than that element. So if you look at 45, left hand side 35. 30, 25, 40, right? On the right hand side, 50, 60, 65, 80, all of them are greater. And if over here, 35, right? 35, left hand side are 30 and 25, and right hand side is 40. Same is the case with 60. Left hand side is smaller, right hand side is greater. And 65, right hand side is 80, that is a greater number. So if there was an element that needs to be inserted, let's say it's 63, where would it be inserted? It would be inserted on the left hand side of 65, right? So this is where the element 63 would go in. A tree helps in making sure that you're storing the data in a sorted manner. If I want to find the smallest element in the tree, all that I would need to do is go to the left, 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 and I find the smallest. If I want to find the largest element, right, 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 until there is a right, and that's the largest element in the tree. So trying to find out larger elements, smaller elements, sorted elements in a tree is very easy. And also, the insertion and deletion and searching operations are not very costly. You cannot directly say whether it's 65 is present or not. We need to go through a list of operations, right? Let's say I'm searching for 65. I would start with 45. 65 is greater than 45, so I would need to search the right subtree. Now I would come here, 65 is greater, so I would need to go to the right subtree, and I get to 65. So with three operations, I'm able to search. Same is the case where I'm trying to insert or delete. So it would be three or four operations in this specific tree. So a tree helps in reducing the cost of search, delete, and also inserts while keeping the data in a sorted way. So you'd be able to leave the data in a sorted way and do efficient searches. In the last few steps, we tried to give you an overview of the different kinds of data structures. We talked about arrays, linked list, hash table, and in this video, we talked about trees. In the next video, we will get back to discussing about collections. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In this step, let's do hands-on on, on hash set, linked hash set, and tree set. Let's start with creating a hash set. So set of integers, so we'll st store a list of integers. 
numbers is equal to new hash set of integers. So we are initializing a new hash set. You see that numbers is empty right now. Let's add in a few numbers. So we are using a hash set. I would add 765432. It's a number, right? So, oops, I need to remove the quotes, right? So this is now a number. I'm adding in more numbers, right? So I'm del deleting one digit at a time and trying to store the value, right? So now we have a set to which I have added in five numbers. The order in which I have added it, you can see that on the screen, right? First, I've added in this, second, this, third, fourth, and fifth. Now, if I print numbers, what do you see? You see that they are stored in random order. So they are not stored in the order of insertion. Nope, that's not the order in which they are stored. They are not stored in sorted order also. In a hash set, we don't care about the insertion order and we don't care about sort order. Now, let's create the same numbers thing with a link hash set. So I'm creating a linked hash set and let's execute the same code again. So now I'm creating a linked hash set. So 765435476. Five, and now let's try and print what's there in the numbers. What do you see? You can see that linked hash set is storing the elements in the order in which they are inserted. So just the order in which I'm inserting them, it's being stored. It's not stored in or sorted order, but it's stored in the order in which it's inserted. Let's say I'm adding in one more element. What would happen now? You'd see that it's exactly stored in the order in which elements are inserted. However, because this is a set, you cannot store duplicate. So if I say 76, what would happen? It would return false back. It says, okay, boss, you are using a set. You cannot store a duplicate. Let's go and create a tree set as well. So let's now create numbers as a tree set. Now numbers is empty. So let's add all the values as earlier. So 765432, three, four, and five seven six right now if i print numbers what would you see you are seeing it in this sorted order right so in this specific thing we are storing the numbers in the sorted order because it's a set this also will not add duplicate values what we did in this video is we looked at all the three different options for sets we understood that a hash set neither cares for the sorted order or the insertion order. A linked hash set stores the insertion order, but it does not worry about the sorted order. And the tree set cares about the sorted order, but it does not care about the insertion order. Now, let's look at the exercise for this specific step. What we want to do is we would want to create a list of characters like shown in the screen. So, create a list of characters like this. Probably you can write a class, a Java class in Eclipse where in the main method, you can have a list of characters like this. What I would want to find out is the unique characters in this specific list. Think about what would you use if I would want the unique characters in a sorted order. And what would you use if I would want the unique characters in the order in which they are present? So, in unique characters in sorted order would be A, B, F, and Z. But unique characters in the order in which they are being inserted is A, Z, because A is repeated, I don't include it, B, and then F. So, it would be A, Z, B, and F. Think about what collection you would be using to be able to do that. I'll see you on the other side. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In this video, let's solve the exercise from the previous step. Let's create a new class and I'll call this set runner. And I'll add a main method as usual, finish and 
I will paste down the characters from the previous one, right? So I'll do the imports, Java util list, that's cool. And now I would want to find out what are the unique characters in a sorted order, right? So the as soon as somebody says unique to you, the thing which should come to your mind is set. So the solution for this is a set, right? So as far as set is concerned, as of now, we have options three tree set, we have hash set, and we have linked hash set, right? So if I want to store elements in a sorted order, then we would go for a tree set, right? So I would create a set of character and say tree set is equal to new tree set of characters. Is that allowed? Let's check. Let's import tree set. Let's import set. Now, you can see that this code is going through. So it's allowed. So let's now print C this out and tree set. See what would be the output. Now it's printing a, B, F, Z in sorted order, right? That's because we are using a tree set. So let's make sure that it's clear it's a tree set. Okay, tree set, right? I would want to store in the insertion order A first, Z next, A is duplicate, so don't worry. I don't worry about it. B next and then F. Then what I would need to use, what do you think I should use? I should use a linked hash set because that's the one which maintains insertion order. Over here, it should not be tree set. It should be linked hash set, right? So now I can go ahead and print. Let's import linked hash set and let's use this in both places, right? So now let's see what would be the output you can see that the elements are stored in the order in which they are inserted a z b f a z b and f that's cool right now if you don't care about this i mean if you don't care about sorted order or if you don't care about insertion order then you can go with a hash set let's quickly do that so hash set we would want to use a hash set and I'll copy this here and over here as well. And let's import hash set. Right. So now in the hash set, you are getting the same output as the tree set, but it might not be the same. Let's say if I just add in a few more elements, it might be different. If you make it numbers, then it might not be the same hash set would depend on the hashing function sometimes it might be sorted but you cannot depend on it being sorted the most important thing out of this particular exercise and the previous step is that if you want unique things so if i want unique things i have to go for a set and once i go for a set the decision you need to make is whether you want to maintain insertion order or whether you'd want to maintain sorted order if you want one of them, then you would either go for a tree set or a linked hash set. If you don't care about neither, then you would go for a hash set. Out of all these, hash set is the most efficient. But linked hash set provides you with insertion order and tree set provides you with sorted order. In the last few steps, we looked at the different set implementations from wide range of perspectives. In the next step, we would look at tree set in more depth. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In this video, let's look at tree set in depth. The operations that can be performed on a hash set and a linked hash set are exactly same as that on a collection. However, a tree set provides you more operations because the data in it is sorted. What tree set provides is a implementation of something called a navigable set and because of tree set implementing a navigable set we would get a few features from that let's explore that features in this specific video let's now create a tree set 
right. So, typical way of creating a tree set is tree set of integer and numbers is equal to new tree set. Now, I would also want to initialize a few things in here. So, let us directly do that in here. So, I will say set dot off and provide a few numbers, right. So, it does not matter what they are 34, 12, 99. Cool, right? So we created a tree set, and you can see that it's in sorted order. That's the basic characteristic of a tree, right? In a tree, everything is sorted. So that's what you see in here as well. Tree set also implements a navigable set interface. That means it provides a few other operations which are traditionally not present in the collections interface. These kind of operations are only present on trees on places where there is data which is sorted. So, let us try them right now. So, numbers dot, let us say I would want to find out what is the element which is lower than 40 in this particular list. So, I want to find out what is the element which is lower than 40 in this list. Which is the element? 34. The floor is inclusive. So, if I do floor of 34, it would return 34 as well. However, if you want strictly lower than 34, you do not want to match 34 and you would want only those numbers that are less than 34, then you can say lower. So, floor, floor returns the number which is less than equal to 34, lower returns a number which is less than 34, which is 12. So, you do not really need to implement and find out which is the element which is less than 34. For any of the numbers, you can find out what is the one which is less than that very, very easily, floor or lower. The same thing applies for ceiling of 34. It returns the number which is upper than 34. So, ceiling is greater than equal to 34. So, if I say 36, greater than equal to 36, it returns 54. The other corresponding function is upper. So, upper would not return. So, upper is greater than 34. Oops, it is not upper. It is higher. So, higher returns the number which is greater than 34. So, let us print numbers again so that we have it right here. So, greater than 34 is 54. You can also try and retrieve a subset of this. You can try and retrieve, okay, I would want all the numbers which are between 20 and 80. How do I do that? Numbers dot subset of 20 comma 80. So, what does it retrieve? 34, 44 and 65. These are the numbers which are between 20 and 80. Let us try another option, operation. Th subset, I would say 34 and 54. So, you can see that it is only returning 34 back. So, the lower limit is inclusive, the upper limit is exclusive. So, it is not included. So, it is, if I do this, so all those numbers are returned. So, greater than or equal to 34 and less than 65. If you would want to explicitly specify, so I would want to include greater than equal to and less than equal to, you can say this. So then it, it, it would act as if we would want to include both the lower limit and the upper limit. So this is inclusive here and inclusive on this side as well. And if I do a false, both of them would be excluded. So only 54 is printed. The other interesting method which is present is numbers.headset and you can say 50. So it prints all numbers up to 50 and you can do tail set. It prints all numbers after 50. In this step, we were looking at some of the most interesting methods which are present in tree set because tree set implements the navigable set interface. Because the data in a tree set is sorted, we can try and get values between a certain range or less than a specific thing or greater than a specific thing. And that's exactly what we were doing in this specific step. I hope you had a great time learning about this set interface. I'll see you in the next step. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In the previous steps, we talked in depth about the list and the set interfaces. And now, it is time to move on to the queue interface. 
A queue is used when you would want to arrange things in the order you would want to process them. For example, a to-do list, right? So, for example, as soon as I come in in the day, I would have a list of things to do. And as new things come in, I would take them and put them in the right place in the to-do list so that I can pick them up when the right time for them comes. So, for that kind of processing, queues are awesome. The important thing is queue also extends collection, so it supports all the collection methods. In addition to the collection methods, queues support methods called add, offer, remove, poll, and peek. We will look at all these methods a little later when we do the hands-on. The implementation of the queue that we would be using is something called a priority queue. In a priority queue, by default, elements are stored in a sorted natural order, in the order in which you would want to process them. However, we'll see later that we can provide custom comparator implementations to change the order. So if you want to have a specific custom order in which you would want the elements to be processed, we can do that as well. In the next step, let's start with the hands-on for the queues. Until the next step, bye-bye. Welcome back. In this step, let's play around with the different methods which are offered by the queues. Let's start with creating a new queue, right? So queue of, let's create a queue of string. So queue of string, queue is equal to new. We would want to use the priority queue, which stores it in the natural order. Priority queue of string. Let it be empty at the start, right? So the queue is empty. The method which we can use to get an element out of the queue is queue.poll. When the queue is empty, queue.poll will return a null. Now, I want to add an element to the queue. So I can say queue.offer and put in an element. So I can say I would want to offer an element called apple. You can also do an add all that would actually add multiple elements. So I can create a list and use that to add multiple elements to a queue. So apple, let's say I would insert in a reverse order. So I'll say zebra, monkey, and cat. Now, what's in the queue? Let's see. It's in the sorted order. You can see A, C, M, and Z. And if I do a Q.poll, aha, it comes, it gives Apple. So we can process Apple now. And if you print Q now, what would happen? Apple is out of the queue. So the remaining things are ready. So if I do a Q.poll now, the next element will be picked up. Next, next again, next element, next again. And if I do it again, it's empty. The way a queue works is very similar to how a queue works at a movie theater or at some exhibition outside. Except the fact that in a queue, you can set priority for the elements. By default, the priority here is the natural order. So it's in the ascending order. So as soon as an element is added to a queue, Based on where it fits in, in the order, it will be processed. Let's move on to Eclipse and let's create a new class. What we want to do is we would want to specify a custom order. Here, the natural order is being used to process the queue. We do want to specify a different order. Let's see how to do that right now. So queue, oops, I would need to type in class actually. So I would want to create a new class. I would want to call this queue runner. And I'll actually need a main method. So let's do that. Maximize this class. And what I would want to do is let's copy this statement from here. So we are creating a queue. And let's add a list of elements to this, right? Aha. I would first need to import, import, import. We are ready, so it's compiling, that's cool. So now I can say q.poll and 
here it's not automatically printed so let's do a system dot out so if i do q dot poll you'd see the order in which they are processed right so zebra first monkey next actually cat first because cat is first monkey and zebra c m z that's the order in which they are being processed right now that's the natural order however let's say i would want to define a different order let's say i would want to create my own custom order i would want to say i would want to process these based on the length of this string so whichever is the smaller one smaller length i would want to process that first how do i do that the way i can do that is by defining a comparator earlier we saw how to create a comparator right so let's create another implementation of the comparator i'll call this class string length comparator implements comparator this would be implementing comparator for a string right so for a string let's import comparator and it would give us a compilation error control one add unimplemented methods as usual let's make this value 1 value 2 how do we want to compare we would want to compare based on the length of the strings right so we can do integer dot compare and say value 1 dot length and value 2 dot length so this would be doing it in the ascending order so let's see in the priority queue constructor you can actually pass in a new instance of the comparator as simple as that so you can it's quite simple right so we created a string length comparator implements comparator and over here we are passing the string length comparator here so now let's run this you can see that the order now is cat zebra monkey three letters followed by five letters followed by six letters if i want to reverse the order all that i would need to do is reverse this so comma that's it now you'd see that the order is reversed the higher length is processed first and the lower lengths after that in this video we were looking at the basics of q we were looking at poll offer and also we looked at how to implement a custom algorithm for how elements in the queue should be processed. Until the next video, bye bye. Welcome back. In this step, let's start with the last collection that we'll be talking about map interface. The most important thing about a map interface is it does not extend collection interface. So all the operations related to collection do not really apply to map so map is part of the collections framework but it's not really implementing collection interface map is used to store key value pairs for example i have these kind of characters right so i would want to store how many times a is present three a is present three times c is present three times as well so this is the kind of scenarios where I would go for a map. If you look at the map interface, the typical methods which are present in the map interface are related to key values, right? So the basic ones are the same, size is size and is empty. What is the size? How many entries are there? Is empty. And after that is you have put key and value. So you can put a key with a value or you can get the value with the specific key. So in the previous example, I can say I put a value with a comma 3 and I can say get the value for a it becomes 3 you can remove a specific key so it would remove the entire entry for that specific and you can use methods like put all clear is to empty the collection this is present with all the other collections as well you can get the keys as a set so you can get a set of a comma c comma other elements which are present in there so which are called the keys you can get a set with all the keys so this is key this is value key value so you can get the set with all the keys which are present in here you can also get a collection with the values so you can get three comma three 
and so on as values. Let's discuss these methods and a few more when we get to the hands-on section for the map interface. There are four important implementations of the map interface. Hash map, hash table, linked hash map, and the tree map. We'll dig deeper into them in the next step. In this step, we were introduced to the concept of a map. Map is nothing but a set of key value pairs and the interface map provides a wide variety of methods related to this. You can get list of all the keys or list of all the values or you can iterate over the keys and try to get the value for a specific key. You can insert a value with a specific key and value. You can get the values based on a specific key. Welcome back. In this step, let's look theoretically at all different implementations of the map. The first implementation that we would be looking at is hash map. Hash map, think about what would the underlying data structure, it would be, you're right, it's a hash table. So in a hash map, as usual, it's unsorted and unordered. The next one is a hash table. What is the difference between hash map and a hash table? Hash table also uses the hashing technique underneath in the data structure. So there is no difference as far as the operations are concerned between the hash table and the hash map. However, hash table is like vector. It's synchronized. All the methods in the hash table are synchronized. So it's more thread safe than the hash map. And just like hash map, it's unsorted and unordered. The other key difference between the hash table and hash map, which is kind of a typical interview question, is that hash map allows to store a key with null value. So in a hash map, you can store a key with null value. However, that is not allowed in a hash table. The next map implementation is a linked hash map. Just like the linked hash set, over here, the insertion order is maintained. However, it's not sorted. And because of the insertion order, it would have little slower insertion and deletion than the hash map. But the iteration looping around the elements is much faster because all elements have links to each other. The last important map interface implementation is a tree map. As usual, whenever you see a tree, the underlying data structure is a tree. And therefore, the data is stored in a sorted order. And as usual, whenever we have a tree, because the data is sorted, we would not only implement the specific interface, but we also implement another interface. In the case of a tree set, it was a navigable set. In the case of a tree map, it is a navigable map. In this step, we looked at the different implementations that are present for a map. We looked at hash map, which is unsorted, unordered. We looked at hash table, which is the same as hash map, but all the methods are synchronized, so it's thread safe. We looked at linked hash map, which maintains insertion order. And we have the tree map, which has the data in the sorted order. And in addition to the map interface, tree map also in implements a navigable map interface. In the next step, let's do a little bit of hands-on around all the maps. Until the next step, bye-bye. Welcome back. In this video, let's look at some of the basic operations that you can do with a map. Let's create a very simple map and do all the retrieve operations around them. All right, so let's create a map. And if I'm creating a map, I need to say two different types, right? What is the type of the key and what is the type of the value, right? So let's just say the string that we are going to use, sorry, the key with, that we are going to use is a string and value, right? And the value is a integer. And let's say this is a map is equal to map dot off. And you can specify alternate strings and integers. So let's say I'm storing how many times a specific character occurs in a string. So A is three times, B is five times, C, oops, syntax should be right. So let's say Z is 10 times. And now, you can see that a map is created, Z is having a value 10, A is having a value 3, and B is having a value 5. As usual, when we use the dot of function, 
we cannot insert a value this is a let's say i would want to try to put a value into this so let's say i would want to say map dot put r comma one nope that's not allowed because by default anything that we create with a dot off is immutable so you cannot change the data in there now i want to see what's data in there so i did a map and i see the data now, i want to find out the value for the key z how do i do that map dot get and pass in z so that gives you 10. similarly map dot and if you try to search for a value it does not exist it returns you a null value similar to other collections you have size how many elements are there is it empty you also have methods to check if a specific value is present so you can say contains key or does it contain a key a right so yes does it contain a key f false and also you can check for the value you can say does it contain a value 3 yep it's present let's just print the map yep it's here so if does it contain a value 4 false so these are all some of the utility methods which are present in common across all implementations of the map the other thing you can do is try and get the complete set of keys you can say key set it would retrieve you a data structure a collection with the keys alone and you can also say map dot values what does it return the values so if i look at the map all the keys z a b are what are written by the key set and the values returns 10 3 and 5. we looked at the basic retrieval operations in a map let's now shift our attention to do a little bit of manipulation of whatever data is present in a map let's refresh the map so we are creating a map again and now what i would want to do is create a hash map with the same values so i would say string comma integer hash map is equal to as usual it's new hash map and i'll not specify the types and say of map cool right now we have a hash map now how do i add elements into a hash map hash map dot put i can say f comma five so f is five times now if i say hash map you'd see that it's present five times so as soon as we do a put it's turning a null back saying the previous value which was present for f is null so that means there was nothing for f earlier now if i do z let's say z is now occurring 11 times what would happen the value of z changes to 11. it returns the previous value also back so when i do a z hash map dot put z 11 it returns the previous value of z which was 10 back now let's do a hash map you can see that it's a is 3 z is 11 b is 5 and f is equal to 5. in this step we looked at all the common operations that can be performed on a map and we used hash map as an example in the next step let's focus on looking at the differences between hash map tree map and linked hash map until the next step bye bye welcome back in this step let's see the differences between different implementations of the map let's take hash map linked hash map and tree map let's start with hash map hash map of let's use the same example that we used earlier so integer hash map of string comma integer hash map is equal to new hash map and semicolon that's cool right so now the hash map does not have anything let's insert a few values hash map dot put let's start in from z z comma 5 let's say a comma 15 f comma 25 l comma 250 and now i print hash map you can see that the hash map is neither in the sorted order nor is it in the insertion order so it loses both the sort order and the insertion order but it's efficient 
because it does not care about sorting, it does not care about the insertion order. So it's much more efficient than the other data structures which are related to maps. When you don't really worry about which order your keys are stored in, hash map is an absolutely perfect data structure. The next one is a linked hash map, right? So let's start with linked hash map. String of integer linked hash map is equal to new hash map. Oops, I'm saying hash map. It should have been linked hash map, right? Let's add in let's add in linked hash map dot put f comma 25 a comma 15 z comma 5 and l comma 250 so we are intersecting it in the order f a z l and now when i do a linked hash map you would see exactly that order present so f a z l so it show, stores the insertion order the order in which we are inserting it is the way it stores the keys now let's look at the tree map right tree map is the last one string comma integer tree map or i can just say tree map is equal to new tree map now in here i want to add in tree map dot put f is 25 right and then we would want to add a same values 15 and z with 5 and l with 250 now if i print in the tree map what would you expect it would be in the sorted order of the keys so a f l and z what we are looking at here are the three different implementations of the map interface and we saw what was the difference between them very very clearly now let's get to the exercises that's the interesting part given a string let's say this is a great thing i would want to find out given a string i would want to find out how many times each character is present in this string that's one the second thing is how many times each word is present in this specific string those are the two things I would want to find out. Now, how do you do that? That's the exercise for you. Use Eclipse and try to write a simple program to do that. I'll see you in the next video where we will be discussing the solution to this. Until the next video, bye-bye. Welcome back. In this video, let's look at the exercise we discussed about in the last step. Let's create a new class because we are in the map. Let's call this map runner. I'll have a main and let's have our string stored in here, right? So let's say our string string is equal to this is an awesome occasion. This is this has never happened before. Let's say this is the string. All right, let's split it. So if I press enter in here, it would be appearing on the two lines. So this is our string which we would want to focus on. I would want to now identify how many times each character is present in this specific string. How do I do that? That's where our map, right? So you can store this character is stored this many times. That's what is the awesome thing about a map. What we can do is we can start with creating a very simple map, right? I'll start with a map interface directly. So I'll say map of string comma integer occurrences, I'll call this. And is equal to new hash map of string and integer. So I don't need to specify it again, right? I'll import hash map. I'll import map. And now, oops, it's importing the wrong map. I don't want this one. I would want, oops, let's go here. And I would want java.util.map. That's the map we are interested in. Now, let's go here and say occurrences dot 
if I want to add a, a key value, then it would be like this, right? So if A is happening, I would want to say A is one, I would do something of this kind, right? So by default in occurrences, there would not be anything. So if I'm going through this string, one character by character, maybe it's possible that this character might not be present in the keys, in the list of keys of the map, or it's present. If it's not present, when we try to look it up, we would get a null back. And if it's written a null back, then we would initialize T with one. So I would start off from here. So I would see, okay, T, T is one right now. I'll scan through after this, I would say occurrences dot put H comma one and so on and so forth. After this I, I would have I comma one. And when I see this I, when I look up the keys, then I would see, oh, there is one I already present. So what I would need to do is increment. So I need to make it two. So that's kind of the algorithm that we would use. So let's try and pl play around with it. I've just looked at it We're using string. We don't really need to use a string. We can use a character as well because we want to store for every character, right? So now let's go ahead. Uh, the next thing that I would want to do is to loop around this string, right? So, so I would want to identify the individual characters. One of the ways I can do that is get all the characters. So I'll say char cares is equal to str dot char array. So this would return all the elements in a character array. And now I can start processing it using an enhanced for loop. So for char character inside characters, I'll call this characters. It will be consistent. So for char in characters, what we want to do, we get a character, right? So we would want to first check if it's there. Get the character. What we want to do, if it is there, we increment the count, right? That's the algorithm. If it is not there, initialize to one. That's kind of the algorithm, right? So let's do get the character first. So str dot get, oops, we already have the character, so we don't really need to get it as such. We need to check if it's there inside the hash map, right? So I would need to say occurrences dot get the character. If this character is there, let's assign it to a local variable. So if this integer is equal to is equal to null, that means it's not there, right? So then what I would need to do is I would need to say occurrences dot put character comma value would be one, right? So that's the initialization. Else occurrences dot put key is same character, but we would want to increase the value by one, right? So I can say integer plus one. If it's not there, we initialize it to one. If it's there, then we put the character with a incremented value. Looks very, very simple, right? So let's do a sysout. Is that all? Cool, right? Now you can see that there are so many spaces. A is five times, B is one time, C is so many times, two, D is one time, E is eight. You can cross verify it. So you can check if it's really true. So that's how we would print the characters. Now, if I want to get the strings, the logic is very, very simple, right? So it's exactly the same logic, except that we would be playing with a string. So what we would need to do is let's create a map with string. So I'll start with a map of string comma integer. And let's say I'll call this string occurrences. And this would be a hash map. Over here, what we want to do is we would want to identify all the words in this string, str. So the way we can do that is str dot split. So I can say split by space. So it would give me all the words which are present in there. 
I can take this into a local airway. So this is words, right? So we now have a list of words. I can now loop around them. So string word in words, we need to get the word. And if it's null, then we put the word with one. Otherwise, we put the word with integer plus one. Oh, it's not occurrences. I should use string occurrences. Right? We are trying to do two things in the same method, and that is really the confusion. <laughs> so now let's make sure that we have all the logic right. So string occurrences is equal to hash map words. We are splitting it by space and getting all the words in. We are looping around the words and checking if the word is there. If it's not there, then we put it with a value one, else we increment the value. And that looks cool, right? So here, last thing we would want to do is to print string occurrences. Let's run this. Okay, awesome is one, never is one, occasion is one, before is one. This is, has, and happened. So only this is pleasant two times. The other improvement I can see we can make is remove the dots because dots need not be considered as a word. So that's an improvement for later. You can try that as an exercise, how you would do that. But for enough, we are able to print the number of times each character is in the string and also the number of times a word occurs in this specific string. I hope it was an interesting exercise for you to try and I hope you have learned something from this. I'll see you in the next video. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In this video, we'll look at some of the additional operations that are present in tree map, which are not present in other maps. So let's create a tree map. Let's put a few values in as usual very quickly. Z, L. So we now have a simple tree map present with F, Z, and L. Let's add another value, A, and let's add B with value 25. And let's add another one with G25. Now, if I have tree map, what are the values which are present in here? Okay, now there are sufficient of values. All the values are in sorted order of the keys. So you can see A, B, F, G, L, and Z. That's the characteristic of a tree map, right? That's what we learned. Whenever we see a word tree, it's always sorted. As we indicated before, tree map implements in addition to the map, navigable map. And navigable map provides a lot of other interesting methods. Let's start with the basics, right? So let's say I would want to find out what is the one which is next to B. So I can say tree map dot higher key of B. This returns the key which is higher than B, so greater than B. Now, I can see C, it would return the same thing because it's greater than C. However, there is another function similar to what we had in this sets, in the tree set, which is ceiling key. Ceiling key returns greater than equal to the value which you have passed. Higher key would only check for greater than. Ceiling key is greater than or equal to and higher key is greater than. And you have corresponding functions on the lower side as well. So lower key returns A and you have a floor key which returns B. So this is less than B and this is less than equal to B. You can also get the first entry which is present inside the tree map. Tree map dot first entry. You can also get the last entry which is present in the T map. Because this is sorted data, it's easy to get all the data. Let's print the data so that we can use it as a reference quickly. So A is 15, Z is 5, last entry. Because the data in the tree map is sorted, it's easy to get the data around which is the first, which is the last, which is greater than something, which is less than something, and things like that. Now, similar to tree set, you can also have functionality to do sub maps, right? So sub map, I can say I would want the sub map from C to Y. 
it's returning everything between C and Y, right? So it's returning 25, 25, and 250. Let's try B with Z. You'd see that B is included, so it's greater than or equal to B, but less than Z. So submap is inclusive on the left side, exclusive on the right side. So Z is not really included. So if you want to include Z as well, B comma true, Z comma true. So now you'd see that Z also is included. What we are looking at in this specific video are some of the important operations that the tree map gets because it implements the navigable map interface. Because the data is sorted, we can get first entry, last entry, we can get submap between a certain values, and we can get values around keys, which is greater than this, less than this, and things like that. I'll recommend you to try and play around with all the methods which are present in the navigable map interface, and I'm sure you'd have a lot of fun with it. I'll see you in the next step. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In this section, we discussed extensively about different collections. We started with list, which can store a list of elements, including duplicates. Then we moved on to set, where we talked about the fact that a set cannot have any duplicates present. And Q is used to ensure that an order is established between the elements and each element is processed only once. And we also looked at map, which is used to store a set of key value pairs. We did a few exercises with them, we did a few puzzles with them, and we looked at multiple implementations with these things. We also look at the underlying data structures to get a feel of how the data is represented internally. I would leave you with a few tips. The first tip is hash. Whenever you see a word hash in the name of a collection, then it will be unordered and unsorted. So by default, a hash table based collection is always unordered and unsorted. So you don't maintain the insertion order and you don't maintain the sort order as well. The next tip is linked. When you see a linked, then it means the elements are linked to each other. We would be using a linked list. It might also be a doubly linked list. You have a link to a previous element and the next element. Once you are using a linked list, then order is definitely maintained. It does not store the data in a sorted way, but it stores it in the order in which data is inserted. The third tip is the keyword tree. The keyword tree means that the data is stored in an underlying tree structure in a sorted way. So anytime you see a keyword tree, then you can say the data is going to be stored in a sorted order. And in addition, the fourth tip is that whenever you see a tree, then by default, because the data is sorted, you have a navigable set or navigable map implementation. So tree set implements navigable set and tree map implements navigable map. So tree set and tree map have additional operations to do a subset based on the keys or subset based on the values depending on the collection. Remember these tips and I'm sure you'd be able to remember all these collections very, very well. I hope you had a fun time in this section learning about all the collections. I had a great time preparing the material and also preparing the examples and presenting it out to you. I'll see you in the next section. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. Welcome to this short section on generics. We were using generics extensively when we were working with collections. In this section, you will learn to create classes and methods using generics. More importantly, you will understand why we need generics. Let's get started with the why question. Why do we need generics? That's what we would discuss in this specific video. As usual, let's create a new project, right? We would want to create a new Java project. I would call this generics and I would leave everything as it is and you can go ahead and click the finish button. When you click the finish button, you would see that a project is created. I'll go ahead and 
create a new class and I'll call this generics runner and I'd add a main method plus finish we have a main method that's cool right so let's say I'd want to create a array list like class but something which would do a little bit of validation around it and things like that I'd want to implement a custom array list class for myself which would do a little bit more than the typical array list would do so let's get started so I would want to say my custom list and over here I'll create new my custom list let's create the class create class my custom list I'll use the same package we are in package generics oops com dot in 28 minutes dot generics and say finish right so we have a package com in 28 minutes generics and over here it's in generics so let's change this as well com in 28 minutes dot generics control one and move generics dot java to the package so now, the structure we have right now is we have com in 28 minutes generics where we have generics runner and my custom list i don't need the generics package anymore so let's go ahead and delete it okay that's cool so we have the structure ready now in the my custom list i would want to have a array list so i would want to have a list array list is equal to new array list the compiler is complaining saying you are not saying which what you will hold in the array list right so i'll say string right so new array list of string so that's what you would want to store in here and now I would want let's say to be able to add elements to this so let's say public void add element and string element and let's say all that we do is list dot add the element which is passed in let's keep the logic very simple and let's also say there is a remove element method public void remove element there is some custom thing that you would want to implement let's not really worry about it for now and now let's say list dot remove and element so we have a very simple class where we can store a list of values add and remove elements which are present in here the design is not really perfect in the sense that we are not really returning whether a remove is successful or not but that's okay for now what we have focused on is on the generic stuff right so i have created an instance of this my custom list in here so list now let's say I won't want to say list dot add element and element one element two I can also do remove but let's say I would want to create the same class with integers so I would want to say I want to create a list using numbers so I would want to store integers so I want to store list two with let's say integer dot value of five over here I would want to store integer dot value of seven my implementation as it is right now only works for one data type what is that data type the data type is a string right if I want to use integer or if I want to use a custom class I defined if I want to store elements of that type my implementation will not work because we have hard coded our implementation to use only a string this method will only accept a string this method would only accept a string so my implementation is tied to a specific data type how can we create classes which are not tied to one data type I would want this class to work with integers I would want this class to work with custom classes I create how do I do that that's basically the problem that generics aim to solve if you use generics properly then we would be able to insert any kind of elements and remove any kind of elements from this specific list now that we understood why we need generics what is the problem that we are trying to solve with generics in the next step let's move on to implementing generics for the my custom list i'll see you in the next step until then bye bye
In the previous step, we saw why we needed generics. In this step, let's implement generics for the My Custom list. A lot of people tend to think that generics is really complicated. Actually, generics is very, very simple thing. All that you need to do is you have to define a generic type. So this is angular brackets. So between angular brackets, you can define a generic type. Once you do this, then what happens is my custom list of T. As soon as I say my custom list of T, you would see that there is a simple error coming in here. It's saying my custom list is a raw type. Try and use the parameterization. So if I remove this parameterization, which is present in here, then you can see that there is no warning in here. But as soon as I say T in here, it's saying, okay, class accepts a type parameter. So you can specify a type parameter. So here I can say of string. Here also I can say type. What we are doing in here is as soon as I add in a type in here, I can specify what type I would want to use in here. It's not sufficient if I specify the type in here, right? I would want to also be able to use that. So over here now for the list two, I can say this is an integer. That's cool, right? So now I can say this is an integer and I would want to store integers in it. But the add element is not accepting integers yet. How can I make it accept the integer? That's by saying t in here. So array list of t. So the underlying data structure I'm saying is should use the same type. So instead of string, I'm saying array list of t. And the same thing, instead of string, I'm saying t. And instead of the string in here, I'm saying t as well. So wherever we had string in before, we are changing it to t. And this will help us in getting our functionality working, right? So now I still have an error because I was not using list two here. List two should be what I've been using. So list two, I can add integers to it, right? That's cool, right? So now I can actually let's implement a two string, public string, two string. And let's just return list dot to string for now. Let's not do a complicated implementation. It's a very simple implementation of to string. So now over here, I can print my list sys out list and sys out list two. So I can have a list with storing strings. I can have a list storing integers. And you can see that this list is storing strings. This list is storing integers. Actually, if you look at how ArrayList is implemented, that's exactly the same way. So if you go to ArrayList, java.util.ArrayList, control shift T and go there, you'd see that they are using E in here. And if you look at all the methods, let's look up the add method. You can see that it's add E, add E. So the type is E, add E. E is the thing that they use. That is exactly what we are specifying as T in here. I prefer using T because T stands for type and you can use any type in here. The naming convention which is typically used over here is to use a capital letter always. And also, if you want to actually expand it further, the best way to do that, if I do a right click, refactor, rename, you can say type. So it should be all caps. So to, to indicate that this is a specific type. If you just have one type being used, I prefer using just single letter T. And if you're consistent with this, people who look at this code will also be able to understand it very, very easily. I would want to add in another method to this list, my custom list. I would want to return the element from the list back. So what I would want to be able to do is I would want to be able to say string value is equal to list dot get of based on the index. So I would want to get the first element, it's get of zero, right? Over here also very similar thing. I would want to be able to do string, here it's not string, here it's integer, integer, I would say number is equal to list two dot get of zero. So I would want to be able to do this, I would give it as an exercise and let's see how to solve it in the next video.
So try to think about this and I'll see you in the next step. Until then, bye bye. Welcome back. I hope you got a chance to work on the exercise. If you didn't, pause the video in here and try to solve it. So I would want to be able to return a string as well as an integer from this specific method. How do I do that? Control 1, I'll go and create a method, right? So if I say public string get int of i and say list dot get of i or I think it's better to say index. I'll rename this to index. That's a better name. It does not compile because there are two reasons, right? One thing is I don't want to just restrict it to a string. I would want to use integer if it's integer, string if it's string. So the way we can define it is by saying public t. So public t get index and list.getIndex is what we would want to return back. And over here, I can save this. And now, if I run it, you would see that I can actually get the value. So over here, let's print the value, not the list. And over here, I'll print the number. So we are printing the first elements in both the lists. OK, element 1 and 5. That's cool, right? So now, what we are able to do is we are able to return the type. So the important thing here is we are able to return the type. Here we were passing the type as a parameter. Here we are able to return the type as a return value. With generics, once you specify the variable type on a class, wherever you would typically specify a type, in all those places, you can use this as the type. And based on the usage, so if here I'm saying it's string, so wherever the t is present, it would be replaced by, and in this case, t is replaced by an integer. In this step, we looked at how to create a return value of the type t. We created a simple get method and returned a value of type t. I'll see you in the next step. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In this video, let's look at a couple of puzzles, simple puzzles related to generics. Let's go to the generics runner. And over here, right now, we are using string and integer. Let's say I would want to be able to use this my custom list only with numbers. So I don't want to allow it to be used with integers. How can I do that? The way I can do that is by saying t extends number. So now you would see that as soon as I say t extends number, there's a compilation error. It says string does not match this. It says string is not a number. If you look at the hierarchy of the integer classes, right click by saying open type hierarchy, right click and say open type hierarchy, it would bring up the entire type hierarchy. As you can see, integer inherits from number. Number is an abstract class with a few abstract methods in here and integer inherits from there. This specific class, now I can use it with long and I can use long elements in here. So I can say long dot get zero and I can add an element 5L, 7L, but I'll not be able to use a string with it, right? So that's how you restrict. The advantage of restricting this is now I would be able to call all the methods which are available on element. So I can say, I can go here and say element dot byte value, double value, float value, because these are all the methods which are present inside the number class. So anything extending number, I'm sure it will have all these methods present. So that's the advantage. So when we restrict the classes that can be used in here, the advantage is all the subclasses would be implementing this class so we can use methods from this specific class. That's the advantage when we use t extends number. Until now, we have been using generics with types, right? We defined a generic along the class and we have used it in here. Generics need not be restricted just for types. You can even create generics with methods as well. For example, let's create a simple static method. So I can say static x x is kind of a type let's say do something and i can use x as the type in here x value 
and return value. Where are we defining x? What is x? What we can do is say x. I just had to move the static keyword before the method. So static, the type, and we are saying here that we are accepting the value of the same type and returning a value of the same type. This method is not really doing anything. Uh, to make it do something, let's do double value. And to be able to do a double value, value dot, only the methods in the object class are typically present, right? Because now for this method, you can call it with any things, right? So I can go to main and I can say double value and call it with a new string. I can call it with a integer dot value of a specific value, five. So there is no restriction. I can even call it with a new array list, right? So there is no restriction on what we are doing in here. Because this method, what we are saying is, let's, it's because I have to input the array list. Now, if I fix that, you can see that this can be passed in here. And what this method does, it just returns that specific type. So here, I have to have a string to receive it. So string value is equal to double value. And I can have string number. Will this work? Nope, because this would return the same type x. So whatever is the value you're passing is the value you would be getting back. I mean, is the type of the value you would be getting back. So this should be a integer. And when I'm passing a list, the type would be a array list. The real benefit of doing something like this comes in when you actually restrict the type. So if I say x super of list, so anything which is implementing list, I can use it in here. Sorry, actually x extends list. So anything that extends list, I can use it in here and over here, instead of double the value, I would say duplicate list. So I'll say duplicate list, I'll have void as the return type, and let's accept x. And over here, what we'll do is we'll duplicate the elements in the list. So what we'll do is, let's call this, instead of value, a list, and list dot add all, again, the same list. So what would happen? All the elements in the list will be duplicated, whether it's array list, whether it's linked the list, all vector, any implementation of list, you'd be able to use it and duplicate the values irrespective of the type of list you're passing in. So over here, let's create a very simple list. Let's, uh, one of the things I've done is I've renamed the variables to value one, number one, list one, because there were already variables which with those names below. So let's, you can fix that too. And now I can actually create a new list, right? So array list numbers is equal to new array list. We would want to be able to modify this. That's why I'm not using list of directly. So array list of over here, I can say list of one comma two comma three. So we are creating a list with elements. Let's say it's array list of integer, right? So that's basically what it is. And now I would say duplicate numbers. What can I, what happens? And let's say sys out numbers. The numbers should get duplicated. One, two, three should be added again. And I should see one, two, three, two times. So you can see one, two, three, comma, one, two, three. Not just with array list, but you can actually use any type in here. So you can use link list, for example, link list, link list, organize the imports, and then run. Oops, one, two, three, one, two, three. So irrespective of the type, this method would work. Any class which extends list, I'd be able to use it. The beauty of this method is the fact that in here, all the methods which are typically available in the list class are available. So all the list methods are available. So if you want to implement generic logic for any of the implementations of the list, I can do something of this kind. So this is a very generic method. In this step, we are looking at a little bit of complex stuff around generics. We talked about extents. We talked about how you can create a generic method. And we talked about how you can use extents and the generic method together. I'll see you in the next step. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. 
In this last video on generics, let's look at something called wild cards. In the previous steps, we looked at how to create a generic class. We created a generic method. Now, we will use wild cards in method arguments and these wild cards can also be used in local variables and the member variables. Let's get started. So let's say I would want to write a method which would be able to do the sum of any of the list of numbers. So what do I mean? Let's look at it right now. So let's create a static method and let's say it returns a number back. So I would want to return a number back and I'll call this sum of number lists. I would want to be able to accept any list that extends number class. And I'll call this numbers. Cool, right? So now this question mark here is called a wild card. Any list of type extending number class is a valid list. So any list which is extending number class can be passed as a parameter to this. Let's implement the logic for it. So I can say instead of number, let's have double as the result value. It, it makes it very simple. So I'll say double value is equal to 0, 0.0 and I can say for number number in numbers I can start with actually sum right double sum is equal to this so sum plus is equal to I can say number dot double value let's take double value add it in and return this sum right now this method which is present in here can be used to sum any lists. So I can say sys out sum of number list and pass in list dot of. Let's create integer list for first one, two, three, four, five. And after that, I would create a double list because by default all floating points are double so this would be a double list and you can even try long list as well right so I can say list of 1L, 2L, 3L, 4L so this would be all long literal so the list created would be of the type long right so you can see that now this particular method would be able to add all that up so you'd be able to see 15.0, 15.5, and 15.0. So that's cool, right? So it's able to add integers, it's able to add floating points, and it's able to add longs. This wildcard in here is called a upper bounded wildcard. And there are other wildcards called lower bounded wildcards as well. So how does that look? So you can say question mark, super number. So you're saying the lower bound is number say void add a couple of values and now over to this particular list I can add in numbers dot add one I can add in 1.0 I can add in 1.0 F a floating point or I can even add in a long any type which is a subclass of number can be added into this particular numbers. This is called a lower bound wildcard. Now I can execute this list. Let's start with a simple execution of this, add a couple of values and let's just create a new array list and send it out there. I'll take it as a new array list of Oops, let's create a new variable in here. I'll say list, empty list is equal to new array list of number. And I can say empty list in here. Oops. It's a void, so I cannot do system dot out dot print and of that. So I can say sys out empty list. 
and you can see that this list has all the values that we have passed in. In this video, we looked at the upper bound and also the lower bound wildcards. Upper bound helps in implementing common logic for all the lists which are extending number, which are subclasses of number. And the lower bound helps us to add a lot of different values of the types which are subtypes of number. In the last few steps, we learned a wide variety of things about generics. When we look at generics, the most commonly used type of generics is the generics with types. So this is the commonly used generics. So this is the most important thing for you to understand very well. Other commonly used generic is the one which we used with a method. So here we created a method. We declared a generic in here and used it. The other two examples that we looked at, the upper bounded wildcard and the lower bounded wildcard are not so frequently used, but it's always great to understand them. I hope you had a lot of fun in this section and I'll see you in the next section. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. Welcome to this section on functional programming. Now, if you ask me what is the biggest difference between functional programming and object-oriented programming, then the thing which stands out is that in functional programming, functions are first-class citizens. What do I mean by first-class citizens? Let's look at an example in here right so student is a object the object i'm able to store it in a variable i'm able to invoke methods on the variable and we can pass the object as data to a method now think about a function or a method will i be able to pass function as the parameter to a method Will I be able to get function as a written value from a method? Can I assign a function to a variable? Nope. Until now, in whatever we have discussed, we store objects in a variable, we send objects as parameters, and we get objects as written values. But for functions, we will not be able to do that. And that's where functional programming comes in. Function programming comes in and says, try and give first class status to functions. Now, you might be asking, how do we do that? That's basically what we would try and do in the next few steps. Trying to create variables with functions, trying to pass functions to functions, and having written values as functions brings in a complete different thought process. And as a beginner, it might be a little difficult and tricky to understand all this. So what I'll do is we'll keep it very simple. We'll try and go one step at a time with very simple examples and try and introduce you to the wide range of concepts that are related to functional programming. Welcome to this section. I'll see you in the next step. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. Let's now create a new project for functional programming. I'll say new project. Yeah, project. I'll call this functional programming. When you click finish, a new project would be created. And in the source, I can create our first class. So let's create a very simple class. And I would put it in the package com in 28 minutes. Functional programming and I would call this class as functional programming runner there are a wide range of things that we would be discussing so I don't really have a better name than that so let's add in a main method and click finish in the previous video we said functional programming is all about giving first class status to functions is kind of a cheesy definition but let's see what it all means in this specific step we'll try and create a very simple example not using functional programming that's basically using procedural or object oriented programming and we will see how it can be implemented in functional programming let's 
create a very simple list right so list of string i'll say list is equal to we did it many times during the collections thing right so list of apple banana cat and dog right typically if i would want to oops there are imports let's do the imports as well typically when we would want to loop this we would probably use a normal loop right list oops for string string in the list if i want to print out i would say sys out oops string right so if i want to loop through and print all the values this is what i would typically do cool right so now apple banana cat on dog that's cool so i can re right click refractor and extract method and i'll call this print basic right this is how we would print any list right however with functional programming it brings in another approach i'll write in some very simple piece of code you might not be able to understand that completely in this specific step but over the period of next few steps we'll try and understand and break down the code that i would write now i'll create a very simple static method i'll copy this basic so what we want to do is print with functional programming i'll call this print with fp and in functional programming the way you can do the same thing is by saying list dot stream so i'm taking all these elements in the list and i'm converting into a stream of values so this becomes a stream of values so first apple would come then banana then cat and dog so list dot stream dot for each what do i want to do with for each you can see what action you want to do action is nothing but method right what action do i want to do what i want to do is i would want to take each of the elements so i would want to take each of the elements and i would want to call system dot out dot print ln on these elements now focus on this syntax so after for each after the parenthesis i'm pressing enter and i'm pressing an enter after here as well so that you can actually focus on the syntax so what i'm saying here is list dot stream dot for each open parenthesis within the parenthesis we are saying element hyphen greater than this is a specific syntax this is called a lambda expression we will discuss that a little later what we are saying is for each element in this list do a system dot out dot print ln this is nothing but logic right this is method code so i'm saying for each element in this stream list do a system dot out dot print ln of element now what i'll do here is instead of print basics i'll say print with fp now let's see what would happen aha apple banana cat and dog right instead of looping and telling what to do with each string what we are doing is we are converting this into a stream and we are calling for each in it and we are passing what to do with each element interesting approach isn't it another interesting thing in here is the fact that what are we sending to for each is this data nope this is not data this is action we are sending the code we are sending for each element execute this we are sending a function code to for each so i said in the last video function as first class citizen and this is the first step to it we are actually sending a function to execute on each of the element in the stream and we saw it being executed and printed in i can even change the logic in here so i can say for each element just say element hyphen element what would happen 
aha element apple banana cat dog so let's put a space here to make it even more beautiful cool right so not a lot that we have done in this specific step but we have introduced you to a important syntax of something called a lambda expression don't worry about it the important thing is we are able to pass in a function as a parameter to another function and loop around it that's the first important concept about functional programming that we have learned this is just the stepping stone there are a lot of things you need to learn about functional programming and we will continue the journey in the next step until then bye bye in the previous step we created a list of string and printed it with functional programming let's now discuss about an exercise what we want to do is create a list of numbers and we would want to loop around it and print it using functional programming try and do it in the command prompt so try and do it in jshell you can pause the video in here go to jshell and try and implement that okay i'm launching up jshell right now and we want to create a list of integers right so integer and list is equal to new oops let's use list dot of and create a list right so let's say i create a list of numbers now i would want to be able to loop this list and i would want to be able to print all the values using functional programming how do i do that list dot stream dot what do i need to do list dot stream dot for each what do i want to do with each of them i press enter so that we have clarity on what we are doing in here for each of the element in here what do we want to do hyphen greater than is part of the syntax of a lambda expression system dot out dot print ln element so we want to print every element that is present in there right i'm pressing enter again closing the bracket and pressing enter what is happening 1 4 7 9 isn't that cool you can see that this is very simple line of code without using a loop or anything i am able to execute the way it works is each element is streamed and for each of the element this line of code is executed and so first system.out.println1 system.out.println4 7 and 9 awesome isn't it let's end this step in here and in the next step let's move on to a little bit of more complex stuff around functional programming until then bye bye welcome back in the previous step we discussed the for each and passed some code to print the element out in this step what we want to do is we would want to add logic in the previous step we were actually printing everything right so i would want to filter and i would want to print only certain elements so i'll change banana to bat and what i want to do is i would only want to print those things which end with at how do i do it typically right so print basic i'll call this print basic with filtering right so print basic with filtering how do i do that typically if string dot ends with at so if string dot ends with at then print it right so this is how we would do this typically now i can call this print basic with filtering in here instead of print with fp i'm changing it to basic with filtering and what's happening bat and cat only bat and cat are being printed that's cool right so bat and cat awesome how do we do the same thing with functional programming before doing a for each we want to do something let's copy this print with fp with filtering let's call it that way i mean i just wanted to leave the code in here so that it's there for future reference for you Oh here what we are doing is to the for each we are passing in a specific piece of code right we are saying 
for each element do this that's basically what we are telling in here now what we want to do here is we would want to only pick up those things which end with a t the way you can do that is by adding some something called filtering so i can say filtering logic so for filter only allow these things to go in which are the things that i would want to allow to go in I love these elements which have ends with as a t so what are we doing in here we are saying filter oops let's make it even more clearer so that you can see what's happening in here so what we are doing is here filter open parenthesis element hyphen greater than that's lambda expression symbol element dot ends with a t so we are saying filter these only take those things which satisfy these conditions so we are sending the logic again we are sending the logic to the filter method saying if this logic is true then go and do this otherwise don't do anything let's run this right now oops i did not change the call so let's do print with fp with filtering let's run this aha element bat and element cat isn't that cool so you can see what's happening in here right so instead of looping around we are talking in different terms in here with functional programming we are not trying to loop around and do a lot of stuff all that we are trying to do is we are telling what should you do with each element we are saying here first is filter that element so filter what should be the filtering logic be it should ends with at that's the filtering logic okay what if it's ending with at okay for each one of them take it and print the element out let's do a couple of exercises over here what we are doing is we are printing all the numbers right so we wrote list dot stream dot for each we are printing all the numbers try and filter only the odd numbers out so that's the first exercise the second exercise is try and filter out only the even numbers output of the first exercise would be 179 the output of the second exercise would be just 4 so you can pause the video in here and try those things as an exercise now let's go ahead and do that how do we do that list dot stream dot for each no nope. before for each what do we need to do we need to do a filter right so let's do a filter so what do we need to filter all elements element let's start with printing the odd numbers element mod 2 is equal to is equal to 1 so if it's is equal to is equal to 1 then it means it's a odd number so i'll put a parenthesis in here what is happening in here it's actually creating a filter directly to prevent that from happening what i'll do is i'll put filter and say dot so that i'm telling jshell okay there is more code i'm writing now i can say for each and write in the code that i would want to execute right so what do i want to execute what do i would want to do with each of the elements i would want to print it right system dot out dot print ln element you are printing 179 so if i write the same code on single line it would look like this list dot stream dot filter and to the filter i am setting each element filter using this logic element mod 2 is equal to is equal to 1 dot for each element hyphen system dot out dot print ln element make sure that you get the parentheses right and then it would work out fine so it's basically very simple so to the filter within parenthesis i am saying the logic to filter so it's element element mod 2 is equal to is equal to 1 and for each of these i would want to say element system dot out dot print ln element isn't this cool i mean 
without doing a loop we are actually trying to implement a lot of logic isn't that awesome let's move back what do we want to do we want to print the even numbers right zero that's it it prints the even numbers functional programming is a very tricky thing to understand but it's a lot of fun the initial steps might seem a little difficult but i'm sure if you spend a little bit of effort you'll start loving functional programming a lot i'll see you in the next step until then bye bye welcome back i'm sure you're having a lot of fun with functional programming and in this example which is example 3 what we would want to do is find the sum of a list of numbers using functional programming how do we do that let's get started so i'll create a new class i'll call this fp number runner and i'll create a main method and say finish right so it's very simple what we want to do is we would want to create a basic list right so we have created a number of lists before so list of oops not number i'll say integer numbers is equal to new list or i can directly initialize it in here list of let's take a set of numbers 468 13 3 15 1 import java.util.list make sure it's java.util.list now what i would want to do is numbers dot stream dot for each system dot out dot println right this is what we did earlier element for each element what do you want to do system dot out dot println of element cool right so this is what we did earlier and what is the output of this is we print all the numbers and we tried filtering this list in the previous example and that's cool right so now we are able to print the list what we want to do in here is we would want to be able to calculate the sum of all the numbers typically how do we do the sum of all numbers it's very simple for number in numbers take the in number in numbers and sum plus is equal to number you might be asking where is this sum okay let's create it in sum is equal to 0 now we have system sys out sum this is the usual logic that we write so if i do this what would happen the sum is printed in here 49 right so let's comment this piece of code out so that it does not disturb us when you run the program again 49 cool right so this is 49 which is the sum of everything now let's extract this to a function so that it doesn't disturb us anymore right click refactor extract method normal sum let's go and i'll now try and do it in the functional programming way how do we do it in the functional programming way we would start with the same way right so numbers dot stream what we want to do is we would want to add all these elements up so we have 1 2 3 4 5 and 6 what we want to do is we would want to reduce these six elements to one element how do we want to reduce it that's the important part right so what we want to do is take each one each pair at a time and add them up so let's start with 0 0 plus 4 is 4 4 plus 6 is 10 4 plus 6 plus 8 is 18 and so on and so forth how can i reduce a pair to one so how can i do that that's where another function called reduce comes into picture to the reduce function i can tell the initial value the starting value is 0 so i would want to start with 0 and for each pair of numbers number 1 comma number 2 what do we want to do we would want to add them up number 1 plus 
number 2 and we would want to take this and this would be the sum right int sum is equal to this let's remove this execution in here let's make this really clear so we are calling the reduce method with two parameters right the first parameter is zero the second parameter is the function definition the function definition is for every two pairs of numbers what you would need to do is number one plus number two now when i run this what would be the sum 49 exactly the same as before the interesting part over here is these parentheses right so you can see parentheses in here when you have only one element so let's uncomment this when you have only one parameter to a method then you don't really need a parenthesis around it so this is okay this is fine but you don't really need it but when you have two parameters here we have two parameters number one number two so when you have two parameters you definitely need to have parenthesis what we are doing in here is we are specifying what is the starting value and how each of the pairs from here on should be treated we have to reduce them right so we have to reduce all this set of values to one value and how can you reduce pair by pair to a lower value the way we can reduce it by adding them up so numbers dot stream dot reduce starting value is zero and from then on print number one dot number two so from then on keep adding each pair so it would start with 0 and 4 as the first pair so 0 comma 4 would be added in and that would be added to 6 and the next pair would be the sum of those and 8 and then the next pair would be the sum of those up to 8 and 13 and so on and so forth the exercise for you for this specific step is to find the sum of only the odd numbers in this specific list so you can try and update the code in here to find out the sum of only the odd numbers in this list. I'll see you in the next video where we will be solving that exercise. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. The exercise that we talked about in the previous video was to print only the sum of odd numbers. How do I do that? Before the reduce, I can call filter, right? Simple filter number for every number only allow the number to go through if it's odd so only allow the number to go through if number mod 2 is equal to is equal to 1 now let's run this mm -hmm. the last number is the sum 31 so it's only summing 13 plus 3 is 16 plus 15 is 31 right so if i comment this out i'd be able to see 31 being printed cool isn't it so what we are doing in here we are streaming numbers we are filtering those which are odd numbers by calling the filter function and sending the logic to it and then we are summing them up by using the reduce now spend some time comparing this piece of code with this piece of code i'll also extract this to a method so that we can compare easily so i'll say fp sum so we have normal sum and fp sum right next to each other i'll remove the filter as well because we can then do a apple to apple comparison code which is doing exactly the same thing right so i can reduce the code down so that you can actually read it much more easily this is much more readable format right so number dot stream dot reduce and do the addition and over here i don't even need a local variable right so i can say refactor in line so it will replace and directly return the numbers dot stream so what is the difference between these two methods think about it spend some time thinking about whether you'd like to write this kind of code or whether you'd like to have this kind of code how is functional programming different Right? One of the major difference that you can see in here is the value of the sum variable. Right? So the value of the sum variable is initially 0 
and each time you loop around the number the sum gets incremented so the value of sum is changing as you keep looping around this loop this is called mutations so the value of sum is changing your program has mutations think about another thing right here we are saying exactly how to do the sum so we are saying okay initialize it to zero we are saying loop around all the numbers take each one and add it out and then return that value back with functional programming we are not worrying about all that we are saying okay take a stream of numbers and for each one of them add them up so what should i do with every pair of numbers add them up that's the only thing i'm telling it i'm not worrying about local variable i'm not worrying about how to loop so i'm just saying what to do add them up here we are not just saying what to do but we are also saying how to do it create a local variable add each number to it store it into a temporary variable and finally return the value back two important difference between functional programming and typical procedural programming in functional programming we avoid mutation of variables so we don't really try to have variables whose values are changing the second thing is we focus on telling what to do so every pair of numbers add them up how many ever numbers are there keep adding them up that's what to do we don't worry about how to do it here we are trying to tell how to do it take each number from the array then add it to the previous calculated value of the sum and at the end of the entire method return the sum back you don't need to do that with a functional programming the idea behind this step was to compare the functional programming approach with the typical procedural approach that we follow i'll see you in the next step until then bye bye welcome back until now we learned that functional programming is all about giving first class status to functions one of the parts of giving first class status to functions is allowing them to be passed as parameters to another method we got our functional programming journey started with that in the previous steps and we also talked about the fact that with functional programming we would not have any mutation of state and we said functional programming focuses on telling what and not how to do it in this video let's look at some of the basic terminology that is typically used with functional programming the first thing is this thing called lambda expression so whatever you are seeing in here is what is typically called a lambda expression a lambda expression is nothing but a shortcut method so this is a shortcut form of creating a method which accepts two parameters and returns the sum of them back this is called a lambda expression and in a lambda expression actually you can have multiple lines of code as well so let's say i would want to see what's happening behind the screens of that so i can put this in parentheses and over here once i start putting up then i would need to do a explicit return i'll also add in a sys out so in within the parentheses you can write any specific blocks of code so i can say system dot out dot print ln number 1 plus number 2 so what we are doing in here is we are creating a method so this entire thing is what is called a lambda expression in the lambda expression we create method definition in a shortcut format a lambda expression has parameters these are all, all the parameters this is the body and what happens when we execute it you can see that first 0 and 4 are passed to this method the sum is 4 then 4 and 6 are passed 4 plus 6 is 10 Ten and eight are passed to this method. Ten plus eight is eighteen, and eighteen plus thirteen, thirty-one, and so on and so forth, unless until we get to forty-nine. Right? That's how this execution is happening. To like this might be a better way to format that specific method. You can have lambda expressions without the parentheses as well. But 
only if the logic is very simple. You cannot have multiple lines. You have to have only one line. And when you have only one line, you don't need a return. Cool. So this is basically return number one plus number two. And I can remove the semicolon also. The next thing that we were using is streams. Stream is just a source of objects. In this case, it's a stream of numbers. It could be stream of strings. It would be it could be stream of objects of a specific class or whatever stream it might be. And typically, when we talk about streams, there are two kinds of operations that we typically do. These operations are called intermediate operations as well as terminal operations. In our first example, what we did was try to filter it. So what we are doing in here is we are filtering elements. This is an intermediate operation. An intermediate operation takes an element, takes a stream of elements, either reduce the number of things in the stream or it might map one element to a different element of some other kind. But the result of an intermediate operation is another stream. So after filtering, you still have another stream of elements. Terminal operations are those where we process, we consume the element. So for each, what are we doing with the element? We are printing it out to the console. Reduce is another terminal operation. What are we doing? We are reducing it to one result. So we are taking a stream as an input and we are reducing it to one result. We are consuming the whole thing and giving a simple result back. That's called a terminal operation. So the difference between an intermediate operation is the output of an intermediate operation is typically another stream. And the output of a terminal operation is either to consume the entire stream or to return one result back. Examples of operations that are intermediate operations are filter. We'll talk later about sort, distinct, and wide variety of such stuff. The terminal operations are, for example, finding out the minimum element in a particular stream, finding out the max element in a specific stream, finding out the sum of a specific stream, or trying to consume, trying to take each element and trying to do something with it using a for each. These are all called the terminal operations. In this video, we talked about the basic terminology around functional programming. We understood what a lambda expression is. It is a shortcut for creating a function and it can have multiple lines of code. And when there is just one line of code, we don't really need to do a return. That's what we learned about lambda expressions. After that, we discussed a little bit about the streams. We talked about intermediate operations of the stream and also we talked about the terminal operations regarding a stream. Until the next step, bye bye. Welcome back. In this video, let's look at some of the intermediate operations that can be performed on streams. There are a wide variety of intermediate operations like sorting like finding the distinct elements and also trying to map one element to another element. Let's start with creating a simple list of integer as usual. So list of integer numbers is equal to list of, let's have a set of numbers, three, five, eight, and let's say 213, 4, 45, and let's say 4 and 7. This is a list of seven numbers. What I would want to do first is I would want to sort and print these values up. How do I do that? Sorting, what is the result of sorting this? It's another list of values, right? So when I sort a stream, you'd get another stream back. So it's an intermediate operation. So how do I do that? Numbers dot stream dot, what do we want to do? We want to do sorted. So stream dot sorted dot for each what do we want to do for each element e system dot out dot print ln e so i've reduced element to e now so 
what happens it's sorting and printing the values out right so this is how you do sortings in a stream so in this stream there is a method called sorted which would take all the numbers sort them and then we are sending them to for each to print it now let's create another set of numbers in here i would want to create a few duplicates just to make sure that our code is working right so three i'll insert a few duplicates in here so we we have two duplicates in the list right three and five and we want to find out the distinct elements in this specific list how do i we do that the function is distinct so you can see 3 5 213 45 and 7 and the important thing is it's also printed in the order in which they are present in the list now you can also combine a few intermediate operations so after distinct you if you want to do a sorted you can do that as well so distinct dot sorted now all the distinct values are sorted the thing is on a stream on any stream you can execute any number of intermediate operations obviously they can only be one terminal operation right so at the end the stream has to be consumed or reduced to one result or reduced to a list or something of that kind once you have reduced it to a list that's the end result so a stream can have multiple intermediate operations the last intermediate operation that we will be looking at in this specific step is something called map let's say i would want to take these elements from the list find the distinct ones and find the square of the number and print them so i don't want to print the numbers as they are but i would want to print the squares of each of these distinct numbers so i can say distinct once i have the distinct i would want to square the numbers up how do i do that i would need to map from each element so each element what do i want to do i would want to do e star e so i'm mapping each element to the square of that particular element let's see what would happen now you can see that now the squares of the elements are being printed if we actually wanted to do it then we could have done distinct sorted and then do the squares of the numbers as well in this video we are talking about a wide variety of intermediate operations that can be performed on these streams we started with looking at distinct sorted and now we are looking at the map operation i will see you in the next video where we will be discussing about the exercises until then bye bye welcome back in this video let's look at a variety of exercises related to the intermediate operations of a stream the first exercise what we want to do is print the squares of first 10 integers a clue in here the clue is integer stream dot range of 1 to 10 so this is something which you can use to generate a stream with the first nine numbers so you can try and explore this and I would want to print the squares of first 10 numbers. There is a small bug in this piece. You can find that out and print the squares of first 10 numbers. The second exercise is to take a stream like this, take a stream of strings and try and map them to lowercase. So I would want to map these to lowercase and I would want to print them out. The third exercise is to take these elements to take the same string and print the length of each of these elements and the calculation of the length i would want it to be done using a map operation these are the three exercises you can pause the video in here and give it a try okay let's move on to the solutions now the first problem is to print squares of first 10 numbers right so to understand in stream dot range of 1 to 10 i'll try and print them first as they are so in i'll do for each p system dot out dot print ln p it's printing up to nine so that's one of the first things that you need to learn about range the thing is the outer bound here is exclusive so it's not included so if i want to print from one to ten i 
can say 1 to 11. So that's number 1. Now, once I have this, how can I print these squares? The way I can do that is by saying map each of these elements to E star E. Right? I can map it to E star E and then for each do P system dot out dot print ln p cool now we are printing the squares of first 10 you can try to print double these numbers cubes of these numbers and all that and you can see how easy it is becoming to do things like this with functional programming you don't need loop you don't need anything you just say how to map one element and all the magic happens behind the screens with streams the second exercise was to have a list like this, right? So I would want to have a stream of this. And what I would want to do, map all of these to lowercase. How can I map these to lowercase? I'll say map s to s dot lowercase. And then for each p system dot out dot print ln Oops, the lowercase, aha, actually the function name is to lowercase. Cool. Now you have apple, ant, and bat. So from this list, we are printing apple, ant, and bat. That's cool. Now the last exercise was to print the length of each element, right? So over here, what we want to do now is instead of lowercase, what we wanted to do is s dot length. Cool. 5, 3, 3. That's awesome, right? So, what we are looking at is a few examples of intermediate operations. The result of all the intermediate operations is another stream. So, if I have a stream of 10 elements, after the intermediate operation, there might be more elements. Yes, there might be more elements also. There might be more elements or there might be less elements or you map it to some other elements. At the end of in intermediate operation, you will have another stream. I'll see you in the next video. We will be talking about terminal operations. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In this step, let's focus on the terminal operations in streams. The result of a terminal operation on a stream is typically one value. It might be uh, sum of the numbers, it can be average of the numbers, or it can be minimum or maximum, or it can even be a list. So there is one written value at the end of a terminal operation on a stream. We already looked at the most basic terminal operation to do the sum, right? We used reduce. How did you do that? I'll use the int stream that we learned in the previous step, int stream dot range let's say i would want to sum up the first oops ranga range one to let's say i would want to sum up the first 10 numbers so i can say in stream dot range 1 to 11 and i would want to add them up so reduce the initial value is 0 and with each of the next numbers n1 and n2 what do i want to do i would want to add them up right n1 plus n2 very simple and enter you get 55 isn't this cool earlier we had to write a lot of code to find the sum of 10 numbers temporary variables and all that kind of stuff no such thing is needed with functional programming because we are able to send a function as one of the parameters to the reduce method Think what reduce is doing, right? It's taking a stream of numbers and it's converting into one result value. That's what is called a terminal function. Now, there are other terminal functions as well. Let's create a simple list, list dot of. Let's say there are a list of few numbers, right? 34, 53. And I would want to find out the maximum number in it, right? How can I do that? First thing is we would do a stream and then there's a method on the stream called max. Can we call it as it is? Nope. What does it say? It says 
method max in interface stream cannot be applied to given types it says you need to pass in a implementation of the comparator interface if you remember the discussion that we had when we were discussing about collections we talked about a ascending student comparator right so we wanted to have students in increasing order so we created an ascending student comparator implementing the comparator of student and what did we do we implemented a method and we returned integer.compare these two student IDs. So this would help us in creating a comparator which would be allowing us to compare students. Over here, what do we want to compare? We would want to compare simple numbers, right? And we are doing functional programming. So we don't want to create a big method or big class like this. I can create this class and try and use it here. But let's think functionally. Now, how do I create a function which would be doing this comparison for me? The way I can do that is by saying n1, comma n2. So we are going to compare two numbers, right? Instead of students, we are going to use integers. So we are going to compare two numbers. And what do we want to do with them? We want to do integer.compare, integer.compare compare n1 comma n2 okay that's cool right if i just if i just press enter now i should expect the return value oops no i get an optional back optional is one of the types which is introduced into java in java 8 think of this if this list does not have any values what should be the return value what should be the max? Typically, when we do programming, null, right? That's what we would expect as the return value. However, using nulls is a very, very bad practice. And that's where Java brought in something called optional. When I'm doing max, then there might be a result or there might not be a result. So optional helps us in those kind of situations. You can query an optional object and check if there is a result on it. For example, I can say $24 dot and see the methods which are present in there. You can ask, is there a value present? So I can say is present. What does it tell me? Yes, there is a value present because there is a maximum in this specific thing. Right. So let's execute that. How do I get the maximum value? So I'm going back to this code. How do I get the maximum value? It's by saying get. And you are getting 53 back. Quickly revise what we have done until now. We discussed about the most basic of the terminal operations, which is reduce, right? So reduce basically reduces the list of stream into a single result. And the function which we are using to reduce is sum all them up. And we also discussed about the second terminal operation, which is from a stream. What we are doing in here is we want to find out the max. And we are sending a comparator implementation in here. We are saying n1, comma n2 within parenthesis and using the lambda expression operator and saying integer.compare n1, n2. So this is how you can compare the numbers. So this would actually put the numbers in ascending order. To find the max, it would pick up the last element and it would return that back. So it returns back a value of 53. Now, you might have a question on how is this code the same as this code, right? It's not really exactly the same. Here we are using student, here we are using numbers, but you can get the drift, right? So this is comparing students and this is comparing integers, but here we have a lot of code to do that. So here there is about six lines of code. How is all that getting replaced by just a simple statement in here? There is a concept called functional interfaces. At the end of the discussion on terminal operations, we will get to functional interfaces and discuss that in detail. And the other question you might be getting is, what are the other operations I can do on an optional? We will discuss that as well a little later. In the next step, 
we will discuss a couple of more terminal operations on streams. Until then, bye bye. Welcome back. In the previous step, we wrote code to get the maximum from a list of numbers, right? How do I get the minimum? And what are the other things you can do as terminal operations? That's basically what we'd be looking at in this specific step. Let's start with the same code that we started with earlier. So to get the minimum, all that you need to change is to change it to min. And you can get the minimum out of the list. Minimum is one of the other terminal operations which is present on a stream. Now, let's say from this list, I would want to get the list of odd numbers. I would want to filter them out. And at the end, I would want to have a list of just the odd numbers present. How can I do that? Think about it. Pause the video in here. And from this list, I would want to get only the list of odd numbers. How can I do that? You can easily guess the first step that we would need to do is to do a filter, right? So we would want to filter this and we would want to identify only those elements which are odd, right? So which are odd. So E mod 2 is equal to is equal to 1. So this would return, what would this return? This would return all the elements which are odd, right? So I can say for each, this is another terminal operation, right? So we talked about for each earlier and say S for each, let's use E because element is much more better word for me. It does not matter if it's E or S. All that I need to make sure is I use the same letter in here. Right now, if I press enter, what would it happen? It is printing the odd numbers out. Now, I don't want to print them out. What I want to do is I would want to convert them to a list. So I would want to take these filtered values and convert them to another list. The terminal operation I want to do in here is I would want to get a list as output with the values which are filtered. How can I do that? That's where there's another method called collect. What do I want to do? I would want to collect to a list so it's collect and within the parenthesis i put collection dot to list method call so this is a static method called to list so what we are doing in here is we are saying collect it as a list oops i'm getting a compilation error because i got the static thing wrong so it should have been actually collectors it's not collection anymore it's collectors dot to list be careful about it and now you would see that we are getting a list as the output, which has two numbers coming out. Now, I'll leave you with two exercises for this specific set of things that we were doing with terminal operations. The first exercise is to pick even numbers into a list. So until now, we have been picking up odd numbers into this list. I would want to pick up even numbers into this list. How do I do that? That's number one. And the number two is create a list of the squares of the first 10 integers. I want to create a list with the squares of the first 10 numbers. Now, you can pause the video in here and try those exercises. I hope you had a chance to get work on the exercises. Let's solve them one by one. The first one was to identify the even numbers and collect them into a list, right? So I, all that I need to do is change it to zero. Cool, right? Now you have 12 comma 34. That's awesome. So 12 comma 34 are the two even numbers in this specific list. The second exercise was a little bit more complex because we wanted to find out the squares of the first 10 integers and take it into a list. So if I want to get the list with First 10 integers, we know how to do that, right? So we use int stream. int stream dot range and say 1 to 11. So as we discussed earlier, the upper bound is exclusive. So this would generate numbers from 1 to 10. And from these numbers, what do we want to do? We would want to square them up. So what do we use first? Map. So I can say map E to E star E. Now, one of the important things is the 
type of the return thing it returns something called a integer pipeline so the important thing is this is not really a stream so it's not a stream of integer integer pipeline if you look at the integer pipeline it's not really a stream in the traditional sense of the word stream so it's not a implementation of the stream interface now what i would want to do is i would want to convert this int stream into a stream and the operation which is available is called boxed so i can take this thing and do a box this would convert it into an stream of integer and once i have a stream of integer i can use the collect on it so i can use the collect so inside the collect what do you want to do collectors dot to list and press enter now we have the list of the first nine squares actually the 10 should have actually been 11 right because it's excluding 10 i would now say 149 to 100 so this is the list of first squares one of the most important things with jshell i found is when i use jshell i would actually be much more focused because i'm typing it perfectly well and when i start using jshell more and more i see that it improves the pace at which i can type in code so if you are trying to practice something new i always recommend to start with jshell especially because you can focus on what you want to type and immediately see the results and that's exactly what we have been doing in the last few videos with functional programming wherever possible i was actually trying to switch to jshell and give you a feel of how you can learn things with jshell i hope you are having an interesting time learning functional programming within 28 minutes i'll see you in the next step where we will try and understand what's happening in the background until then bye bye welcome back in this video we would be talking about optional we initiated a discussion about optional in the previous step let's look at all the important methods that are present in optional and where you can use an optional optional is one of the new features which is introduced in java 8 it is majorly meant to avoid null pointer exceptions typically when we are having a list of values and we are trying to process them and at the end of it if there is no result typically we return null back and what could happen is the consumer of that api might not know that you are actually returning a null back so instead of using an object you can actually use an optional as the return value let's see how can we do that now let's create a simple example let's say i would want to create a list of a few numbers right 23 45 67 and 12. i'm just creating a list of a few numbers and i would want to filter them right so first thing is i have to convert them into a stream so stream and then i would want to filter only the even numbers from this right so n n mod 2 is equal to 0 so this would give me the filter of even numbers after that i would want to find the max among them so how can i do the max we learned earlier so n1 comma n2 and followed by integer dot compare n1 comma n2 right so this bracket is to close this one and between this you have n1 comma n2 what are we doing with integer dot compare n1 comma n2 right so this would return the max as we found out earlier this returns an optional back right so if i want to get the value from the optional i can say dollar 39 dot get right dollar 39 is kind of a temporary variable that j shall create for you so i'm using dollar 39 dot get and you'd get the value 12. so among the even numbers the maximum is 12. optional also has methods to check if there is a value so i can say is present so is present yes it is present so there's a value present now let's say i'm creating a stream which does not have a even number so i can say control a to go to the start and remove the even number out so now there are no even numbers i'm trying to find out the max and there are no even numbers out so this is going to return me another one 42 and you can see 
it's returning back optional dot empty it's not returning null back there are no even numbers so we are doing a max and it's not returning a null back what it's doing it's saying that it's optional dot empty now i can do oper same operations on this so if i say dollar 42 dot is present what does it do it says false there is no element present in here let's say i would want to have a default value assigned so i can say dollar 42 dot or else zero and it returns zero so i can use it in here as well so in the previous piece of code i can say or else zero so what does it do let's go to the start control a and execute this line of code again now with a number present 34 you can see that if I say or else zero, what we are doing is we are assigning a default value. If a number is present, it would return 34 back. Otherwise, it returns zero back. So optional is just a way to avoid returning nulls. Whenever you are returning something which might exist or might not exist, then you can return a optional back. And that's what most of the methods in the streams do. Max might be there, might not be there. Minimum might be there, might not be there. In all those kind of situations, streams return an optional back. And then you can use or else to assign a default value. Or you can directly call a get if you are sure that there would be a value. Okay, in this step, we took a behind the screens look at optional. And we'll continue the behind the screen stuff in the next step as well. We will see what's happening behind these lambda expressions. I'll see you in the next video. Until then, bye bye. Welcome back. In this step, we would start looking at what's happening behind the screens with lambda expressions. What is happening when I type a method like this element hyphen? or a lambda expression with element mapping to element dot ends with at what is happening behind the screens how is it really working all the magic of this is based on something called a functional interface okay i know we love practicals so let's do that so let's create a new class and i'll call this lambda behind the screens runner and give it a main method and let's type in a very simple piece of code, right? So I would want to just get a list of a few values. Let's say 23, 40, 43, 34, and 45. And out of this list, let's import list in java.util. What I want to do is filter out odd numbers. So filter and say the logic, right? number only get me those numbers which are odd and even within those oops before the filter i need to convert it into a stream how can i forget that so stream dot filter and now let's format it a little bit so we have a list we are doing a filter and out of for each let's say I would want to print them e I would want to say system dot out dot print ln e cool right so I can format it to make sure it's clear so for the stream we are filtering it and we are printing each element to the console what would happen when I do this you know it's printing 34 so we are printing only even number in here, right? So let's add in a few more even numbers, 36, 48, so that we have a little bit more output to play with. Now, 34, 36, and 48. That's cool, right? So we have a list, we are filtering it, and we are doing a forage. Now, what is happening behind the screens? How does this code get sent out to this filter method? If I look at the signature of the filter method, if you hover over it, you can see that it's taking a predicate. So what it's saying is you're using a stream of integer and the filter accepts a predicate, a class of type 
ready k that's what it's telling me right so let's go to this one so i just need to press control or command and press this control or command and press this and you would go to that method and this is the signature of that specific method right so what is it saying the signature of this filter method is filter and it accepts something called a predicate what is this predicate if you again do a control and or command and hover over it let's go there so if I go to the predicate it says it's a functional interface now the functional interface which is present in here is something called test now let's copy this test over here so what we have in here we have predicate is a interface and the predicate interface has a method called test and if you look at the predicate interface that is the only method which will not have a implementation as the only method without a default implementation inside the predicate so now how does this get mapped to a implementation of the predicate interface right so if i have a method which is accepting an interface then i can only send implementations of that interface objects of the implementation of that interface as parameters to it so how is it happening now let's do one more thing right so n is equal to n maps to n mod 2 is equal to is equal to 0 what i'll do now is i'll create a implementation of the predicate interface let's say because i would want to use integers right so here there's a list of integers so we would need to create a predicate of integer right we would want to create an implementation of that so let's create that right now so i'll go here let's go out here so class i'll call this even number predicate right we want to find out the even numbers and i'll say it implements what does it implement predicate of integer and let's do a control one and unimplemented methods oops you can see that there is a test method that's exactly the method that we saw earlier boolean test t so instead of t we are using integer so this becomes integer and r0 let's call it number now over here what i can do is i can implement the test method what i would want to do with the test when is it an even number so i would say return number mod 2 is equal to is equal to 0 if number mod 2 is equal to is equal to 0 return true because this is an even number otherwise return false right so now i would take this even number predicate and let's create the same piece of code again now, new oops i need to create an even number predicate right so new even number predicate let's run these pieces of code again you can see that the same output is being printed by both these lines of code that is exactly what is happening when you are passing some logic when you are passing some logic to the filter method what is happening is in the background the java compiler creates a implementation of the functional interface the most important thing about a functional interface like the predicate is that there would only be one method which will not have a definition and basically what we are doing when we are creating a lambda expression is providing an implementation for that specific method so what we are doing in here is we are saying take the only method which is not implemented and provide this as the implementation for it so what would happen is uh, implementation of the test method would be created with the logic that you are passing in in here that is what is happening in the background when i just say filter and pass in a method to it this specific interface is called a predicate because what it does is it evaluates and returns whether it's true or false so the predicate interface returns if the test has passed or not now 
I would leave it as an exercise for you to do the same thing with the for each interface. So take the for each, see what's happening behind the screens and try and create an implementation of it in here. So try and create exactly what's happening in the behind the screens for, for each in here and I'll see you in the next step. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In this step, let's look at what is happening behind the for each, right? So if I do a control or command and press this, I'll be able to get the declaration. So it says it's consumer. So it says consumer, right? Let's copy that in. So for each is based on a consumer. Let's Okay, for each is a consumer, filter was a predicate, right? For filter, we were passing in a predicate. So let's put that down here. Now, for each is a consumer, and what's inside the consumer? Control and click. And there is a simple accept method, right? So let's take that as well over here. So what does the consumer define? A consumer defines an accept method. And what is it returning back? Nothing, right? That's why it's called a consumer. What do you expect a for each to do? You take the element and do something with it. Here we are actually printing it to the console. So you don't really need to return anything back. You directly consume it. So behind the for each is something called a consumer interface. Now, how do I create an implementation of the consumer interface? Let's do that right now. So what do you want to do? Just create a consumer of an integer, right? So let's do that. So class system out consumer. So I'm trying to give it a very creative name. Don't really worry about what the name is. So consumer of integer, right? Oops, implements. Now, control one, and unimplemented methods. And over here, what do we want to do inside the accept method? System dot out dot print ln your argument of zero, right? Argument of zero. Let's rename to number. Number. Cool. Now, over here, what should I do? I should replace this with a new system out our own creative system out consumer. Okay, the output does not change, so we are printing it twice. The first one where we are actually using lambdas, and the second one we are actually creating even number predicate system outcomes, our own custom defined implementations. The most important thing for you to understand is behind the for each is a interface called a consumer, and what we are creating when we do this is we are creating the definition for the accept method inside the consumer interface. So in the background, uh, accept an implementation of the consumer is created and that's what we see in here. In the next step, we would look at what happens behind a mapping. We'll do that in the next step. Until then, bye-bye. In the previous steps, we looked at what's happening in the background of filter and for each. Now let's look at what's happening in the background for a map method. Let's say now I would want to map all these even numbers and print the squares of them, right? Some kind of a mapping. So n star n. Now, what would happen behind the screens of the map method? That's what we are interested in. So if I do a map of n star in over here as well, let's see what the output is. Yep, you have bigger numbers. Both these are exactly doing the same thing. Now, we can now look at what's happening in the background of a map, right? What is happening? I'll open in the declaration as usual. Let's copy this down here. For the map, behind the screens, we have a map interface, right? So what do we have? A map interface. And the map interface is accepting a function. Control and click. And what is the interface? What is the functional interface which is present in here? This is the functional interface, right? So let's now look at it, right? Over here, we are using an interface called a function. What does the function interface do? You pass it a value, it returns another value back. 
and also you can look at the map it returns a stream back and the function it takes one object as the input and returns another object as the output so what we are doing in here is we are actually creating the definition for the apply method what we are saying is the input is n take it and give me the output n into n so let's now create an implementation for this stream right so i'll call this class square or let's square mapper number square mapper implements what do we implement oops what do we implement we need to implement the function interface right so function of what is the input type input type is integer what is the output type is also integer because we are just doubling it right that's cool now control one and unimplemented methods and you can see that over here we get a apply method that's the thing which we saw in the function interface cool right now I can go ahead and implement it in here so I get a number arg0 number I would want to send number star number back right now I can say number square mapper over here I would need to create a new number square mapper and run this the same output right so the important thing for you to understand is what happens behind the screens when you write code with lambda expressions what is happening behind the screens is you're creating implementations of the functional interfaces and an instance of that implementation and that is what is being passed out to the filter method and that is what is being passed to the map and the for each as well so what we are looking at are three of the most important functional interfaces a function is one of the functional interfaces which takes an input and gives you an output it's like any function right a function typically you give it an input it gives you an output a predicate looks at a input and tells either true or false a consumer takes the input and consumes it so it doesn't return anything back so these are three of the most important functional interfaces and we tried to give you a background look on what's happening behind the screens when you're writing functional code i'll see you in the next step until then bye bye welcome back in this video let's focus on another important functional programming concept called method references let's create a new class i would call this method references runner and create a main method and over here let's start with a simple piece of code let's create a list of string so list of let's say let's take our favorite example and bat cat dog and elephant right so let's say i would want to oops let's import the list now from this list let's get a stream out so that we can do stream processing on it and once i got a stream out now what do i want to do with it i first want to get the length of it so how can i get the length of each one of this i want to use a map right so map uh, take it as s and say s dot length and after that for each i'd want to print it to the output right how do we do that system dot out dot print ln and s what do you want to print the argument which is passed in right cool so this is what we looked at as how we can map it to a length and print it right so what would be the output try and guess it up uh, three 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 and eight because the first three letter first three strings have three letters each and this has a length of eight that's cool now you might be asking what has this got to do with method references why are we talking about all this now right 
I'll tell you why we are talking about all this stuff now. Let's look at this specific thing, right? All that I'm doing is S, I'm mapping it to system.out.println S, right? Let's copy this piece of code again and paste it down here. And what I can do is do some little magic. So I'm removing all that and actually I'm taking out the dot and replacing it with colon, colon. So colon, colon, right? Now let's run this program. Let's see what would happen. Aha, same output, right? So we first printed 3338. So four threes and eight and four threes and eight. So the same output is being printed by this as well. So this method reference is a shortcut for this. So what we are doing in here is each string, take it and print it. Instead of going to the complexities of doing all this, all that you need to do is to say system.out. So the way you can think about it is on the left hand side is the class. So system.out is the class and the method which we'd want to talk to is println, right? One of the things is let's say I have a consumer method directly defined in here, right? So let's say I have a static method which is defined in here, public static void print. Let's just say I have a print method. It takes a string as an input and all that it does is System dot out dot print ln. So this is a static method which is printing string. Oops, str right. So it's printing a string. So if I want to use this one in here, all that I would need to do is take the name of the class. So replace this with the name of the class, and the method which we want to use is print. Oops. Actually, what we have in here is a length, right? So they should have been integer. So it should be integer number. Now you can see that this code would exactly do the same thing as it was doing earlier. What we are doing in here is using a method reference. What is happening in here is we are calling this method and passing whatever is the output. Each element would be passed to this method and executed. And this method reference is a shortcut. So instead of saying for each s call method reference runner dot print. Instead of doing this, what we are doing is we are saying method reference runner colon colon print. That's a simple example for a method reference. In here, method which is being consumed is a static method, right? So we are calling a static method in here. The thing is, method references also work with a method which is being called on an instance, right? Here, I'm calling s, I'm calling s dot length. We know that s is a string. So what I can do is I can replace this by string colon colon length. So not only static methods, but also instance method calls can also be replaced by a method reference. Let's run this same output. So what happens is the on the string instance, the length method is getting called. So you can look at these two pieces of code, right? So you can look at this and look at this. You'd find that the second piece of code is much more readable than the first piece of code. The reason why we go for method references is to make the code more readable. Now, Let's take an exercise for the method reference, right? I'll copy the code which we wrote in JShell when we were talking about optional. I'll take this and I'll put this down in here. Let's format it. Oops, there's a compilation error. Com I, mean, I missed a semicolon, so let's do this. So what we are doing in here is we are finding out the even numbers and finding the max of them, right? So this would finally return a integer. Integer max is equal to this. And let's do a sys out of that. Sys out of max. What would happen? 
it's printing 34 as the output right what i would want to do is i would want to replace this with a method reference i would want to replace this and also this with a method reference think about how you can do that you can pause the video in here and try and convert these two things into a method reference okay welcome back i hope you had a chance to try to convert this into method references the thing is here what we are doing is n mod 2 is equal to is equal to 0 right this is kind of custom logic so you can it's not really easy to convert it into a method reference so what we can do is we'll create a static method for it right public static is even so i'm saying i'm going to create a method called is even and it would accept an integer i right i'll accept an integer instead of calling it a number i'll say i instead of i it, i'll call it a number and it would return a boolean back right a filter will return a boolean back and it returns if number mod to the same logic which we have in there so now i can use is even instead of it here right i can call this nope one of the things with method reference is you have to give the class name right so now this would work so we have changed the filter to use a method reference with the static method right however with the max we are already calling one method integer dot compare right the integer dot compare accepts two parameters even those kind of things you can actually replace with a simple method reference colon colon compare that's it now if you print execute the code last line would be 34 and nothing has really changed the idea behind this step was to introduce you to the concept of method references and show you the fact that method references can be used with both static methods as well as instance methods and also we saw that a method reference can be used when the number of parameters are greater than one so you can see how simple the code looks now compared to this code this is the code we really started with for integer dot max to find the max of the even numbers and you can see that this code is not as readable as the code which is right below right method references makes your code much much more easier to read congratulations on learning a lot of concepts related to functional programming i'll see you in the next step welcome back when we started this section on functional programming i talked about the fact that functional programming is all about giving first class status to methods we said we would want to be able to store methods into variables pass it to a method and also return it from a method we have been doing one of these very frequently try and think which one of those are we doing very frequently and in this step we would look at doing the other two things as well we are talking about three things right one is storing functions in variables two is passing them to methods and three is returning functions from methods what we have been doing i'm taking the class lambda behind the screen runner which we have created a little while back we are passing method this is nothing but a method right a lambda is nothing but a shortcut to a method so we are passing a method a function to a method so to the filter method we are passing the definition of a method so this one we have already done but storing functions in variables and returning functions from methods do you think that's possible let's see how we can do that in this step now right click ref i'm selecting n n mod 2 is equal to 0 right click refactor extract local variable i'm going to extract a local variable and i'll call this even predicate so what we are doing in here we are actually creating a local variable which contains the code that we would want to run so now i can create another predicate called odd predicate as well right so i can create odd predicate and say it's is equal to is equal to run what we are defining in here is methods the code for a method we are creating the method definition and an instance of it this is storing functions in variables now if you want to return functions from methods 
you can do that as well. So I can take this and say right click, refactor, extract method and I can say method name is, I'll again give the same thing. I'll say create even predicate and let's see if there is a method called even predicate created in here. You can see that there is a method called create even predicate which is created in here and what is it written? It is written a function back. It's written a method back, right? All the magic of all these three is possible only because of functional interfaces. So even though we are actually defining the code for the method in here, what is happening is Java internally creates an implementation of this predicate interface. The same thing would happen in here. Java would internally create an implementation of this functional interface. In this step, we wanted to show that a function with functional programming is a first class citizen. You can store it into variables, you can pass it to methods, and you can return it back from methods. I'll see you in the next step. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In the previous few steps, we introduced functional programming to you. We discussed the concept of functions as first class citizens. We were able to store functions into variables, pass it to methods, pass it, them as written values. Now, this functional programming concepts open up a lot of new avenues for programmers. It enables us to write code which does not use mutation. Before functional programming, the only way to do sum of numbers would have been something of this kind. But with functional programming, you can go one level up. You can go from imperative style of programming. This is imperative style of programming because I'm exactly telling what to do and how to do it as well. In imperative style, we not only tell, okay, I would want to find out the sum of all integers. Nope. You're saying, okay, create a variable called sum, each time add it up and then return it back. That's imperative style. Functional programming allows a declarative style of programming. You just tell what to do. For every two numbers, every pair of numbers, add them up and return it back. Functional programming allows you to program at a level up, at one level up than what we usually do. Having said all this, functional programming is not really something which is intuitive to programmers, especially those who have a lot of experience with the imperative approach, which typically the object-oriented programming and structured programming use. If you are looking at this functional code for the first time, then you would kind of think it's very, very complex, right? You would not even understand what's happening in here because we are used to seeing code like this. So if you are trying to introduce functional programming into a project, then make sure that everybody in the team get comfortable with all the concepts around functional programming before getting it in. And the most important thing is functional programming is an ocean. It actually deserves a book on its own. There are so many methods which are present on streams. There are so many different streams which are present and there are so many new concepts that it brings in that it's really a very difficult topic to talk about. The idea behind all these set of steps was to introduce you to functional programming, to bring you into the thought process around functional programming. I hope I have been successful in that endeavor. Until the next section, bye-bye. Welcome back. Welcome to this section on threads Multi-threading is one of the most important programming concepts. In this video, we'll write a simple program and try and understand why we need threads. Let's get started with a simple project. Right, as usual, let's create a new Java project. I'll call this threads or you can call this multi-threading. Let's call this multi-threading and you can click finish. When you click finish, you can create a new project, uh, actually new class. So let's go ahead and create a class. I'll call this thread basics runner. I'll add in a main method and finish. So we have a main method also present in here. Let's say 
there are three tasks that we are doing task one and let's say there is a task two and there is a task three we'll just have simple code to represent what these tasks are doing right so i'll say for int i let's say task one for now is just looping around so int i is equal to 101 i less than equal to 199 i plus plus so it prints from 101 to 199 and what does it do it just prints out the number i'll use system dot out dot print and i'll use i plus a space okay let's say the remaining tasks are also doing something of the same kind so let's say this is running from 201 to 299 and this is running from 301 to 399 right so what would happen when i run this you'd see that each one of these tasks would run one after the other now let's go in here and let's say over here system dot out dot print i'll say slash n to print the new line and task one done right so task one is done and here task two is done and over here task three is done and this last thing is the completion of the main so main method is done right so the main method completed execution so when we run this we will be able to see everything going in right so you have task one that's completed task two is completed 201 to something and task next task three is done and you have main done let me just remove the spaces in here just cool oh. okay right this is typical programming what is happening is all the things in the task one are done and after that task two and after that task three right this is normal programming stuff right until now whatever code that we wrote runs after the execution of this line we would go into the next line so inside a method first these lines are executed then the next ones and then the next ones and then the next ones over here we have three different tasks right so task one task two task three typically in a lot of scenarios you might have situations where task one task two and task three are independent of each other and some of these tasks might be dependent on external services probably you are depending on io and a lot of that kind of stuff so during the execution of this task your cpu will not be fully utilized but even then the cpu has only one task to execute so what it would do it would keep waiting so even though we can execute task 2 in parallel with task 1 the cpu does not know that so what it would do it would keep waiting threads allow you to run all these tasks in parallel so you can have one thread running this code another thread running this code and another thread running this code so all these three tasks can be run in parallel parallelism you can actually increase the utilization of your cpu because while it waits for data from an external service or a database it can keep processing the instructions from the other tasks in the next step we would start with creating a thread and try and parallelize task one i'll see you in the next step welcome back in the previous step we understood the need for multi-threading why do we need to create threads now let's start with creating a few threads at the basic level there are two ways of creating threads one is by extending a class called thread the other one is by implementing an interface called runnable in this step we will focus on extending the thread and creating a instance of the thread class so what i would want to do is i would want to do this in a thread how do i do that i'll call this task one so i'll say class task one i'll say task one extends 
thread. And in the thread, you need to implement a method. The exact signature of the method should be public, void, run. So this is something which you need to remember. The signature should exactly match this. This is the exact signature that you need to have. Inside this, you can write the code for your specific task. So now I can go here and do this. Right, so I'm copying the code of task one into a thread. So into the thread, I've copied task one, done, and this loops and prints this stuff. How do I make the task run? So how do I execute this task in parallel? How do I create a thread for it and run this code in parallel? Let's see that right now. Over here, we would want to create a task, right? So the way I can create that is by saying task one, task one, let's create a new instance of the task one class. Once you create a new instance of the task one class, the way you can kick it off is by saying task one dot run. That's all. So task one dot run. And to make it much more clearer, what I'll do is I'll add another system dot print at the start. Task one started, right? So this is once the run method gets executed, it would start the print method. It would print this and then task one done. That's what is printed. The most important thing is I call the run method in here. That's not the method that needs to be called. I wanted to clearly tell you that it's the start method. So a lot of beginning programmers start calling it as task1.run. Task1.run will not really run it in parallel. If I do task1.run, what would happen is it would be executed like a typical method. It will not be executed like a thread. So if I do task1.run, what would be happening? You'd see that task1 started, task1 completed. Then you can see that task2 is started, 201, and task2 is done. Task3 has started, and task3 is completed. So this is typical execution, right? If I really want to kick off task1 as a thread, I should say start. And let's run this right now. Aha. One of the important things you would have started noticing in here is task one started and you see some of the things from task two coming and printed in here. So task 201, 202, 204. So not just the things about the task one. So task one, we are printing, what is task one doing? 101 to 199, right? So it's not just the task one, but even the task two code has started executing even before the task has completed execution. To make this even more clearer, what I'll do is say task 2 kicked off. So task 2 is going to be kicked off right now. So let's put another statement in here saying task 1 kicked off. Here task 2 kicked off. And over here, I'll put another statement saying task 3 kicked off. Right? Let's run this right now. You can see is that task one is kicked off and inside the thread we print task one started and even before the task one did any processing you see that the task two was kicked off so what is happening in here is this code which is present in here is running in parallel with this code as soon as i said task one dot start this code started running in parallel with the other piece of code that's what you would see, right? Task 1 started and you can see 101, 102. That's cool. And after 155, you can see that task 2 is kicked off. And after that, you can see some of the task 2 things in parallel to task 1 things. So if you can see here, it's 210, 209, 208 and all that is running in parallel. So task 1 and task 2 are running in parallel with each other. In this step, we looked at how to kick off a thread. We created a new thread by extending the thread class and we implemented a public void run method. The way we ran the thread was by saying task one, creating an instance of the task one and saying task one dot start. And this kicked off the thread and we saw that this code was running in parallel with this code. I would recommend you to try and run this program 
few times and look at the output and try to see where what is getting kicked off from. I'll see you in the next step where we would try and parallelize even task 2. Until then, bye bye. Welcome back. In the previous step, we extended the thread class and in created a class called task 1 and we kicked it off. Right. In this step, we would want to kick off task 2 as a thread as well. How do we do that? In this step, we would take the approach of implementing the runnable interface. Right. So, class task 2 implements runnable. That's what we would want to use. And as soon as I do this, it would say, okay, implement a method. I'll press control 1 add unimplemented methods. Now I would go ahead and implement the public void run method. It's exactly the same thing. So what I'll do is I'll copy it from here so that I can change things very easily. So what we want to do is task 2 started and task 2 as we know runs from 201 to 299 and I would say task 2 done. So be very careful. Task 2 started, task 2 done and it's 201 to 209. The reason why we focus on getting these things very clear is because we are going to look at the output and understand which tasks are running in parallel. So make sure that you get this right. And now what I can do here is I can remove this code, right? This is what we moved into the task two class. Now, how do I execute a task two here? Task two is actually implementing runnable interface. So let's create an instance task2, task2 is equal to new task2, right? Once you create a new instance of the task2, then you need to create a thread class. So I will need to create a thread, thread is equal to new thread of task2. So if I'm implementing runnable interface, after creating the instance, we would need to do an additional step to create the thread class. Once I create the thread class, then I can say thread dot start, right? And to make it very clear, I'll rename it, right click, refactor, rename, and I'll call this task to thread, right? So this is the thread running task two. And now let's see what would happen. So task one is kicked off. Task 2 is kicked off in here and task 3 is kicked off in here. Cool, right? So let's now see what happens. You can see that task 1 is kicked off and even before any code inside the task 1 is run, task 2 is kicked off, task 1 is started and even before task 2 gets started or task 1 is completed, we see that task 3 is also kicked off and we see that 300 and all that kind of numbers are getting printed and over here you can see all the different kinds of numbers that are printed right 300 200 117 so all the three tasks are running in parallel in here and at this point task one has completed and after some time task three has completed and after that some time main was completed and only after that task two is completed so task two completed after main also has completed, right? Even after executing main, so this is the last statement in the code that we executed, right? The task two completed after the entire main code was completed running. This is the advantage of going for threads, right? What we are able to do, we are able to get all these three running in parallel. Let's say these are three different threads which are doing three different activities. Then by doing them in parallel, we get a lot of benefits because now we are making optimal use of our CPU. We are keeping it busy even when it's waiting for something for task one or task two or task three. It has other tasks it can do. That's the biggest advantage of going for threads. In this step, we looked at how to implement a runnable interface and use that to start a thread of we created task two and then we had to do an additional step we had to create a new instance of thread and then we were able to call the start method and we saw that all these three tasks are running in parallel with each other 
that's cool right until the next step bye bye welcome back in this theory step let's discuss about the different states of a thread let's try and run this program and there is some output which is getting kicked off in so what i'll do is i'll copy this output in here this output would be useful for us when we are discussing about the states of a thread what is a new thread right so when i have created this task one so as soon as i created the task one this task one thread is ready but it's not executed yet right so we have not told it start running yet but it's ready right that state is called new the same state is present here for task two right the task two after line 62 the thread is ready but we are not asking it to start running this state is called new a thread is new when it's ready to run but nobody has told it to start running yet so before the execution of the start method the thread is in a state called new the next state is terminated terminated is when here task one is completed task one is done so task one thread after this particular point is dead the same is the case with task two thread after the task two done is executed so the test the threads are done executing so new is when i have not even started executing terminated or dead is when i completed execution the interesting ones are the ones in between right when 158 is being printed which task is in execution the task which would be executing that would be task one task one at that particular point in stage is in a state called running it's executing at that point in time when task two is printing 201 it's in a state called running right so that thread is running at that particular point in time when task two is printing this out 201 what is the state of task one is it waiting for anything nope it's ready but it's just that it is not being executed that state is called runnable runnable is when i'm ready to run i would want to do some work but the other thread is being executed so in here when 201 task 2 is running task 1's state is runnable task 2 state is running when 159 is getting printed then the state of task 1 is running because that's the one which is printing it however the state of task 2 is runnable it's waiting for the chance to get execution and print the next number 202 the same thing is the case when 301 is running when 301 is being printed by the task 3 that's main method right so task 3 is not really a thread it's just the execution so this is executed by the main method directly so the main thread when 301 is being printed the main thread is the one which gets the cpu the other through threads which are task one and task two what are they doing they're just waiting they're waiting for getting the cpu their state is runnable the last state is blocked the state of a thread is blocked when let's say i'm waiting for an external service to respond or I'm talking to the database and the database is slow then I'm being blocked because I cannot execute because I'm still waiting for some data to come back from an external service the other option is also when I'm waiting for some other thread to provide some data that I would need so let's say thread 3 depends on thread 1's data so the thread 3 is waiting for thread 1 to complete processing in that kind of a situation we would be in a blocked state so the five states of a thread are new when the thread is created however the start method is not really called after calling the start method a thread might be in any of these three states runnable running or blocked runnable is when i am ready to run however some other thread is running at this point running is when i am the one which is running so my state would be running blocked is when i'm calling an external interface or a database or something like that and i'm waiting on it or 
I need some data from some other thread which has not yet completed execution. So that's the state when I'm blocked. The last state is terminated or dead when I have completed execution. These are all the different states that a thread can be in. I'll see you in the next step. We would talk about more complex topics around multi-threading. Until then, bye-bye. In the previous steps, we learned how to kick off threads, right? We learned how to implement a simple thread by extending a thread class or by implementing a runnable interface. And we learned how to kick them off either by calling the start method on an instance extending the thread class or when I'm implementing the runnable interface, I would need to do an additional step and then kick off using the start method. These were the couple of things that we discussed in the previous steps other than the state of a thread. In this step, our focus is on giving priority to these threads. Let's say I would want to give higher priority to the task 2 over task 1. How can I do that? That's what we would focus in this specific step. In the thread class, there is a method called set priority. You can set the priority on a specific task, right? So if I go to the set priority method, you would see the documentation for that. It says it changes the priority of this thread. The priority has to be in the range of max priority and min priority. What's the value of min priority? Let's check that. So min priority is one, normal priority is five, and the max priority is 10. This is the range in which the priority of a thread can be. By default, a thread would be given the normal priority, which is five. And you can assign anything between a minimum priority and a maximum priority. Again, one more important thing you need to note is assigning priority is just a request. When I say a thread has priority 10, it's just a request. It does not mean that always that thread would get the highest priority. It's just a hint. The request might be honored or might not be honored as well. So let's get started with setting a priority on task one. Let's say I would want to set a priority of 10. Let's see what would happen right now. I'm giving a priority of 10 to task one. So you can see that task one has started and task two has completed. Task one has completed before task one. Let's execute it a few times. You can see that task one in this situation is even completed before the task three has completed, even before main has completed execution. In this specific situation, task one has completed before task two and task three. In this situation, task one has got real high priority. So it's completed very, very quickly, even before task two has got started. So in here, task one has got little lesser priority, but still it got completed before any of the task three or task two are completed. So as you can see, the priority is just a request, right? So let's, what I'll do is I'll set up less priority for task one. And now I'll give higher priority to task two, right? Let's say task two thread dot set priority 10. So I'm giving higher priority to task two and lesser priority to tasks one. Let's see what would happen. You can see task two started task one done and task two done. The priority request has not been really accepted. In this situation, also the same. Aha, for the first time, task two has completed before task one. <laughs> that's good. And task one, task two, and task three, that's the order in which they are completed. Now it has been added to task two has completed before task one. Now, if you run it 100 times, you would see that when you place a request to have higher priority for task two, then probably half the times this request would be added to. In this step, the idea was to introduce you to priority. We saw that we can set a priority between one to 10, and we saw that priority is just a request. It's not, it's a hint. It's not really an order. So it's, it might not be honored as well. So I'll see you in the next step. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In the previous steps, we talked about creating threads, we talked about priority of the thread, and we talked about different states of a thread. In this step, let's 
talk about the communication between threads. We have two tasks here, task 1 and task 2. And the task 3 is directly run inside the main method. So it's not really a thread, it's directly code which is running inside the main method. What I would want to do is I would want to have this task 1 and task 2 complete before I would want to start task 3. How do I do that? That's basically the focus of this specific step. Over here, task 1 has started. Over here, task 2 has started. Right Now, over here, what I would want to do is wait for task 1 to complete. So, I would want to go to task 3 only when task 1 has got completed. How do I do that? The way I can do that is by saying task 1 dot join. As you can see, documentation says wait for this thread to die. So it waits for this specific thread to complete execution. One of the important things is task1.join method throws an exception. So I can do a control one and say add throws declaration. When we talk about exception handling, you would learn about why would need to have a throws in here. For now, throws interrupted exception. That's the only thing that we need to add in. So all that we needed to do was there was a compilation error, so control one and say add throws. That's all that you need to do. And now we are saying task one dot join. Let's see what would happen, right? So you can see that before task three was kicked off, task one has completed execution. So you can run it 10,000 times. You would always see that task three is kicked off only after task one is done. Task 1 is done, task 3 is kicked off. Task 1 is done, task 3 is kicked off. Task 1 is done, task 3 is kicked off. So that's the thing that task 2 dot join does. What happens is only when this task is completed, the next line of code in here is executed. This is very important when before kicking task 3, I would want to make sure that task 1 is complete. Let's say I would want to check that both the tasks are completed before I go in. How do I do that? Task 2 dot join. Oops, it's not really task 2 join. It should be task 2 thread dot join. Let's run this now. You can see now that task 3 will be kicked off only after both task 1 and task 2 are done. Task 1 done, task 2 done and task 3 is kicked off. You can run this multiple times and that's exactly what you'd see. Task 3 will be kicked off only after both task 1 and task 2 are, have completed execution. Right? So you can see that in multiple executions. The advantage of doing stuff in this way is because now I've kicked off task 1 and task 2. So both of them are running in parallel and I'm waiting for both of them to complete execution. And after that, we are kicking off the other tasks. In this step, we looked at using the join method to wait for that specific thread to complete execution. The join method would ensure that at this point, when the join method is called, task one is completed. Only then the code execution moves forward. I'll see you in the next step. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. Before moving into execute our service, in this step, we would talk about a few miscellaneous things that are important regarding thread. The first thing that we would do is we would go to JShell, look at one of the important methods which is present in thread class. It's a static method, thread.sleep. So if I say thread.sleep1000, what would happen is the thread would sleep, it would go into a waiting state for one second. To make it even more clear, let's call thread.sleep 10,000. 10,000 milliseconds, that's 10 seconds, right? So I'm going to press enter right now. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Okay, you can see that the thread has went into a waiting state. And after at least a period of 10 seconds is when the thread get active. So that's one of the important methods whenever you would want to make your program sleep, whenever you want to introduce a wait time, thread.sleep is a good method to do that. The other method which you can use is something called thread.yield. 
Now, when do you use thread dot yield? There might be situations where I think, okay, I'm getting a lot of CPU. I don't want a lot of CPU. At this point, I'm okay to go into a waiting state, right? So thread dot yield is kind of that. So it's a request. So let's look at the documentation. So a thread dot yield is a hint to the scheduler that the current thread is willing to yield its current use. Obviously, the scheduler is free to ignore this hint, right? So this thread task one is telling the scheduler, okay, I had enough time in the limelight. I have enough CPU. So I'm okay to give up CPU. But the scheduler can tell back saying, no, 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 you should have the CPU. Take it. So this is just a request. So thread.yield is another method which is important. It's another static method on the thread class. Having looked at these static methods, there is another important keyword that's very important when it comes to threads. That's called synchronized. Let's open up the code for one of the collection classes. Let's open up the code for hash table. As you can see in here, hash table is available from Java 1. And this approach of synchronization is also available from Java 1. You can see that over here, most of the methods have a synchronized keyword. So synchronized, synchronized, synchronized. So almost every method in the hash table has a synchronized keyword. Now, you might be wondering why the hash table is synchronized. Let's say there is a piece of data. Let's say there is a piece of data that is shared between these two threads. Let's say these two threads share an instance of a hash table. When you put a synchronized on here, then only one of these two threads, either the task one or the task two, only one of these threads will be able to execute the code in any of the synchronized methods. What I mean to say is if there are 50 synchronized methods, at any point in time, only one of these threads would be able to execute any of the 50 synchronized methods. You have 50 synchronized methods. Let's say they have 1000 lines of synchronized code and only one of the threads would be able to execute any of these 1000 lines of code. If one thread is already executing any of these 1000 lines of code, then the other thread has to wait for the first thread to complete execution of the synchronized code and come out of it before it can get access to execute the method. That is the importance of the synchronized keyword. One of the important things to understand is synchronization would put a lot of overhead because these thousand lines of code will be executed only by one thread at a time and it would make all the other threads which needs to execute that code wait for it. So the performance of the system might get affected. In recent versions of Java like Java 5, Java 8, there are more alternatives to enable thread safety. We are not just dependent on the synchronized approach. When we talk about concurrent collections, we would talk about other approaches to thread safety. In this step, we looked at three important things. One is thread.yield, which is a request to give up CPU. The second one was thread.sleep, which is a request that I would want to sleep for some time. The third one is the synchronized keyword. Once you put a synchronized keyword, then only one thread would be able to execute that code on an instance. All the other threads which want to execute synchronized code in that specific instance should wait for access, should wait for the executing thread to complete execution. In the next step, let's move on to a very interesting topic which is related to threads called the executor service. Until then, bye bye. Welcome back. In the previous few steps, we created threads and started running them. One of the important things that is lacking in this way of running threads is we don't have any control over the execution of the threads, right? We don't know how many threads are running at a particular point in time. Let's say I'd want to allow only three threads to be running at any point in time. That kind of control is very difficult to establish when we allow threads to run themselves by using the start methods. The other problem is 
let's say i would want to wait until one of task one or task two is complete that's not really possible with the basic things that we can do with threads so i would want to wait until either of task one or task two to complete if i write code like this then this would wait for both the task one and task two to complete and only then execution goes here but if i want to do things like okay i would want to execute line 59 after at least one of these tasks task one is completed or task two is completed i would want to go to 59 that's not possible in this way of executing things and also the running of the threads is a very very tedious task right so if i want to run 100 tasks then the way i can do that is create all this kind of code and kick off start do this kick off start i can there is no way of managing them as a group and last but not the least is the fact that some of the times a thread executes a task and we would want to return this result back that's not really possible with the things that we have talked about until now that's where the executor service comes into picture executor service provides facilities to do all the things that we have talked until now it helps us to kick off multiple threads at the same time it helps us to monitor the state of these threads and it helps us to write logic which enables us to say okay if either thread 1 or thread 2 or thread 3 has completed then that's fine i would want to take the result of whichever one has completed first or you can even say something like okay wait until all the threads have completed execution in a single statement so that's all the kind of code that you would be able to do with an executor service. In the next step, let's get started with the hands-on on executor service. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome. In this step, let's focus on getting a program up and running with the executor service. I'm going to create a new class. So new class, I'll call this executor service runner and i'll create main and say finish what i'll do is we would want to run the same tasks using executor service and because i am in the same package i would be able to access these tasks as well let's get started with creating a executor service so the way you can create an executor service is by saying executor service execute service is equal to let's take the most basic version there's a static method in a class called executors and the most basic version is to create a new single thread executor what the single thread executor does is it provides facilities to execute one thread at a time so at a particular point in time this executor service would be able to run only one thread Let's import the executor service. It's Java util concurrent dot executor service. And now I can go ahead and run the thread. So I, how can I kick off a thread? I can say executor service dot execute and pass in the task I would want to execute. Let's say I would want to execute task one. Or I can create the new thread for new task two so we are creating task one and task two and we are trying to execute them using the executor service we are using the new th single thread executor so it only executes one thread at a time let's see what would happen so you can see that task one started task one completed task two has started and completed so what is happening in here is executor service when we are creating using new single thread executor it will only execute one thread at a time let's do a sys out here the same thing that we did in thread basics runner let's have the task three code also present in here one of the important things that we forgot to do is we would also need to do executor service dot shutdown otherwise your program would continue running so if you look at the previous instance then you would see that it would be still running here so you can see that it's still running kill it and executor service dot shutdown would completely shut down the executor service once the
tasks are completed execution. So what we have done now is added in executed service dot shutdown and also we added the code in the main method just so that we can see at what point in time this code of executor service is running, right? Now you can see task one has started, task three has started, so task three has completed and only after task one has completed, task two has begun and executed. So in the executor service, what we are executing are only two, right? So we are executing the task one and task two in the executor service. Task three is executing in the main method. So it's not executed by the executor service. The executor service at any point in time, because we are using a new single thread executor, can only execute one task. So when start task one started executing, only when task one has completed execution, task two would be executed. And that's exactly what we are seeing in here. So task one started and only when it's completed execution, task two has started and completed execution, right? So that's what executor service enables us to do. In this first step on executor service, what we did is we created an executor service and used it to execute a couple of tasks. We use the basic version of executor service, which has one thread. In the next step, let's try and use multiple threads and see how the executor service reacts to it. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In this video, we would want to play with executor service having multiple threads. How can we do that? I'll come at this line of code and I'll copy this in. The way we can do that is by saying new fixed thread pool and specify how many threads you would want. So let's say I would want to execute two threads, new fixed pool threads of two. Let's run this right now. You can see that task one has started and even before task one has start completed, task two also has got started and it started running. So you can see that two threads are active at any point in time, right? Before we can actually play with higher values, what we'll do is we'll refactor a little bit and create a new instance of a task. Right now, to differentiate between task one and task two, if I want to execute five or six tasks, there is no way we can differentiate them. I have to create six tasks. Instead of that, what I'll do is I'll create a thread which can accept a constructor and the constructor I would pass a simple parameter. So let's do that. So I'll say class task, instead of using the class name to differentiate between the threads, what I'll do is I'll create a constructor. So I'll say public task, I'll say int i, and this dot i is equal to i. Instead of i, let's call it number. Oops, number, this dot number is equal to number. And let's instantiate a field. Let's create a field, private int number. That's cool. And over here, let's change the logic a little bit. So what I'll do is 101. So whatever number this thread is from, so let's say number into 100 to, I'll say less than equal to number into 100 plus 99. So what we are trying to do is, if the number is 1, this will run from 100 to 199. If the number is 2, it will run from 200 to 299. So that helps us to differentiate which thread is running. And also over here, I'll start using the i. So I'll say plus i plus. So that we know, actually I should say number. So we know which number, which task number is started. And the same thing in here as well, right? Plus, number, plus. So this will enable us to kick off a lot of threads very, very easily. So we have par we have made it a constructor argument and we are using it in all the statements that we are printing in, right? That's cool. Now let's go ahead. What I would want to do is not to create a new task. Let's say I want to create a new task of one. Here, I would want to create a new task of two. Cool. And now I can add in more tasks, three and four. And to keep things simple, what I'll do is I'll remove all the code after this, except for the executor service dot shutdown. So what we are doing is we are creating four different tasks and we are kicking them off 
with a thread pool size of 2. Let's see what would happen. You can see that task 1 started, task 2 started. So both of them are kicked off and task 2 is done and task 1 is done and only then task 3 and task 4 are started. And let's add in a few more tasks and see what would happen. Task 5, oops, 6, 7. Let's kick them off. And you can see enough that task 2 started, task 1 started, task 1 is done and immediately because there are only one active task at that point in time, task 3 has started. Task 2 has completed, task 4 has started. So there are two active tasks, one active task. Now again it started, so two active tasks. Task 3 is done, so one active task. Task 6 is started, so two active, one active, two active, one active and zero active and the executor service completes execution. Now let's increase the thread pools to five. So I'm saying use five threads. What would happen? You can see task one started. Oops, let's go further up. So it says task two started, five started, four started, three started, one started. Five tasks have started. One is completed, so four is active. Five is active. Four is active. Five is active. So at a maximum, five threads are active at any point in time. In this step, we looked at how we can change the size of the thread pool and we saw how the threads in active execution are changing. So the new fixed thread pool allows us to create an executor service with a specific number of th active threads. So at a point in time, only these many threads would be active at a maximum. We'll look at more about the executor service in the next video. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In the previous step, we looked at the basics of an executor service. We executed a number of tasks using an executor service. In this step, let's look at how to return values from threads. Let's create a new class. I'll call this callable runner. And I will add a main method in here. And let's maximize and let's get started. Now, I would want to create a task which would return our value back. How can I do that? Let's see that in this specific step. Let's start with creating a class. So I would want to call this callable task. Right? Callable task is something which would return a value. So in, until now, to create threads, we were implementing a runnable interface. But for implementing a task which returns value, we have to implement a callable interface. And now I can go and say, let's import callable first, java.util.concurrent. And let's now say add unimplemented methods. This would create a method called call. What I'll do is I would want to return a string back. So let's say callable of string. And instead of returning an object, we will return a string back as well. So what we are doing in here is we are creating a call method which would return some value back. What I'll do is similar to the previous thing where we created in the executor service, what I would want to have is a simple parameterized thing. So what I'll do is I'll create a constructor. So I'll say public callable task. and say it's string name. So we are giving a name to this task and we'd say this dot name is equal to name. And I would create a field called name in here. And let's say when the call finishes, let's return hello plus name. And also one of the other things I would do is make this wait for a little while. So I'll say thread dot sleep thousand. The reason why we are making it wait is typically when you are executing a thread, you do a lot of processing in it. So what we are doing in here is doing a lot of processing and then finally returning a return value. How can I run this thread? I can use an executor service to do that. So let's create an executor service, executor service, executor service. 
is equal to executors dot let's use a fixed thread pool of size 1 let's import it in import concurrent okay cool now I can execute this callable by executor service dot submit until now we were using the execute method so the submit method can be used to execute a callable thing so something returns a value then you would need to use this submit so the task is new callable task and I can pass in let's say in 28 minutes so new callable task of in 28 minutes I can take the th thing and assign it to a new variable so I'm assigning it to a new variable saying welcome future so what we have done until now is we did a submit and we are taking the value and put it it to a future of string so one of the important things that you need to note is the future of string in here right so this is a thread this is what this is a thread the thread would only complete execution after a little while so this would be executing in parallel to the main method so for example if I have some code in here let's say I'll say sys out and sys, I'm doing a system dot out dot print and slash n main completed this is the last statement in the main so the main thread would be executing this just before main completed what I'll do is I'll also put another statement saying I'll just put this code in here new callable executed right so what I'm saying in here is I'm saying new callable of in 28 minutes is executed just so that we can see what is happening in the background right so now what we can do in here is we can try and get the return value how can we get the return value after the whole thing completes execution I can say welcome future dot get a value and this one actually throws an exception so I'll say add throws declaration so control one and add throws declaration it throws a few ex exceptions so we'll have the main throw them as well and what I'll do now is I'll assign this to a local variable so this is the welcome message and what we'll do is we'll print out the welcome message so let's see what would happen let's execute this you can see that it's executed and then the welcome message is printed that's hello in 28 minutes and after that main is completed in this step we looked at the basics of how to create a callable task and how to execute it using the submit method of the executor service one of the important things that the get method does is on a future you can call a get method future is not really a result it's a promise that there will be a result once I call a get method on the future then this would wait for the task to complete execution so only after completing the task the next line would be executed in the next step we would talk about a little bit more of a complex things with callable tasks until then bye bye welcome back in this step let's quickly revise what we have done with the callable tasks in the previous step and look at how to execute multiple callables and wait for multiple results with the executor service what we have done is we created a callable task implementing the callable and we implemented a call method which just returns a hello plus whatever name we have present in here we also made it sleep for a little while we used executor service to submit it and the response from uh, executor service is something called a future a future is something called a promise that we will have a result at a later point in time and when you do get method on the future then we are waiting for the result so only when the callable task completes execution and when we get the result back the rest of the code would be executed so what you'd see in here is the first line which would be printed is new callable executed so the task is submitted in here the first line which was printed is new callable task executed and after that let's use a printer then so that it's much more clearer so new callable 
task executed and after that this hello in 28 minutes that's the result and then main completed so the execution of this lane waits until the get is completed until the result is there now what we want to do now is we would want to be able to submit multiple tasks and wait for all of them to complete execution with a executor service how do we do that let's start with creating a list of multiple tasks so here we are submitting just one task what i'll do is i'll create a new class i'll call this multiple callable runner and i'll say have a main method and say finish over here what i'll do is i'll copy the code from the callable runner so i'll use one fixed pull thread and here we are submitting one task so let's take that piece of code and let's also shut down the executor service don't forget to do that otherwise the program continues executing shutting down the executor service will not make the program to stop right then and there what it does is it would complete execution of all the threads and then the executor service would be shut down so over here we are calling using a submit method right so in addition to the submit method there are a few other methods in the executor service let's create a list of tasks that we would want to execute so what i'll do is i'll say list of let's create a few callable tasks let's say the callable tasks are in 28 minutes ranga and let's just say adam right and i'll take this and let's import it in and let's assign it to a list so list of callable task is equal to list of this right so we have a list of callable tasks let's have a semicolon cool now let's format it a little bit so that we can see exactly what's happening in here oops i need to give a variable name right so list of callable task tasks is equal to list of whatever right so that's cool now what i can do is to the executor service there is a method called dot invoke all and to this you can pass in a collection so what i'll do is i'll pass in tasks to it what it would do is it it would invoke all the tasks and what it would return is not just one future it would return a list of futures you can do a control one and say assign statement to the local variable and you'd see that there is a list of future of strings so when we execute all these tasks what we will get is a list of results back so we'll get all the results back in here and i'll also need to do a control one and say add throws declaration so that we throw the interrupted exception in a call throws the interrupted exception so what we are doing is we are making the main also throw that as well now what we get back is the results i'll rename this to results what the invoke all does is it would wait for all the tasks to complete execution and then get the results and put them into this list now let's loop around the list for result result in results let's actually i should not say result it should have been future of string right so the type of this should be future of string and i can print this out result dot get result dot get also throws an exception so let's add a throws declaration for execution exception as well so that's cool now let's go ahead and execute this let's see what would be the output hello ranga hello adam and hello in 28 minutes that's the output let's run this again you can see that it takes a little while and then all the three complete execution because we have a pause of one second so it would wait for everything to complete so only after all the three tasks completes execution the results would be printed so you can see that this code is much much more easier to read and use if you want this to go further faster 
I can say new fixed thread pool of three. What would happen? It would actually use three threads. So you would do, see that it would run even more faster. So you can see that it, this run happened much more faster than earlier. Because now we have three threads where this code is running in. Try to play around with the number of tasks, number of thread pools, and see what kind of results you see. It's a lot of fun to play around with the executor service because it allows us to call a lot of things at the same time and we can do things in combination with all of them. In the next step, we would look at another important thing related to the executor service. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In the previous step, we executed multiple tasks and we waited for all of them to complete execution. However, some of the times you would want to wait for only one of them to complete execution and take the result of the one which completes first. And executor service also allows us to do that. Let's see how to do that in this specific step. Let's copy the multiple callable runner and I'll call this multiple any callable runner. Let's open the multiple any callable runner. And over here, the change that we would need to make is we create a list of tasks and what we want to do is not invoke all, but to do invoke any. So what invoke any does is it would wait for any of these tasks to complete. So if one of the tasks completes, it gets the result. So the result is just one result. So what would happen if you would see is we would just have one result back. So it directly returns a string with the result. And let's directly print the result out in here. What we are doing in here is very simple. Right? We are kicking off three tasks. Whichever one completes, we are taking that result and we are printing that out. So if there are three services that you are using and you want to give your customer the fastest result, then you would just take the first one and return it back. In those kind of situations, invoke any is very, very useful. Let's now kick off this. You can see that hello Ranga is printed. Let's kick it off again. Hello Adam. You can see that the result changes because we have three threads and three, th three tasks that are assigned. You would see that each time I run it, there might be a different result. Right? So you can see that there are different results coming in. Now, that's the invoke any method. In this quick step, we looked at how to use the invoke any method. You can pass multiple list of tasks, and as soon as one of these tasks completes execution, it returns the result, and we can use the result. That's the use of the invoke any. Until the next step, bye-bye. Welcome back. In this section on multi-threading, we started with the basics of how to create a thread. We looked at two ways of creating a thread, extending a thread and implementing a runnable interface. We also looked at the different states that a thread can be in, other than trying to set different priorities for different threads and waiting for threads to complete execution, trying to establish communication between the threads. We understood that execution of threads in the most basic way is not very easy. And that's where we introduced executor service. And executor pro service provides options for you to decide how many threads would be processing the tasks. So we created threads of various sizes we created threads of one, size 1, size 3, size 5, and tried to process a variety of tasks using the executor service. We saw that executor service also provides a way where you can get the results from a thread. And this was done using something called a future. And when we invoked the get method on the future, we would wait for the result to come back. And at the end of this section, we looked at executing multiple tasks at the same time and waiting for all of them to complete using invoke all. We also looked at how to wait for 
one of the tasks to complete, take the result and use it in the step where we discussed about invoke any. Multi-threading is always a very, very interesting concept. Because we always want to do things fast, we would want to run as many tasks as possible in parallel. So you would want to create a number of threads to process this task. And that's where executor service makes things very, very easy. The solutions which are implemented in Java for threading are not really perfect, but they are good enough. I hope you had a nice time getting an overview of most of the features which are there in Java to process threads. Until the next section, bye bye. Welcome to this section on exception handling. In this section, let's focus on all the important things around exception handling. The try catch finally block. We'll discuss about the exception hierarchy and how do you handle exceptions, throw exceptions, and things like that. In this specific step, let's discuss about your thought process when you are doing exception handling. How should you think when you are doing exception handling? One of the most important things is it's not just the bad programmers who cause exceptions. Even code written by good programmers can have exceptions. Exceptions are very commonplace. Exceptions can occur because of bad code and also because your expectations on the environment were not met. Maybe you are expecting a directory to be there or a folder structure to be there, but that was not present on your deployment environment. You are expecting some configuration to be done on a database, which was not done. All these could cause exceptions. For me, the most important thing is great programmers handle exceptions very well. When I write code which has an expectation, I would make sure that if that expectation was not met, then I would clearly highlight that. And that's done through proper exception handling. So what are the two keys to exception handling? For me, the most important thing, if something went wrong is in your system, you should give a good message to the end user. You should tell him what are the next steps he can take. If let's say your system expects a file to be there and the file was not present and because of that an exception happened, you should tell the end user, hey, the file that was expected to be present at this specific location was not there. That's the reason why the program failed. It should have a very friendly message to the user. And if the exception happened due to a programming error, the most important thing is the second key, right? You should not just gobble up the exception. You should give enough information to debug the problem. Try and make sure that enough information is logged to help the person who is going to debug the problem. These are the important things that you need to understand. And this is the attitude that you need to take forward when we talk about exception handling. We looked at the fact that both good and bad programmers cause exceptions. But the great programmers are the ones who implement exception handling properly so that there is a friendly message to the end user as well as there is enough information in the log or somewhere to debug the problem to find out what the problem is. I'll see you in the next step where we would start discussing more about exception handling. Until then, bye bye. Welcome back. In this video, Let's look at the basics of exceptions. When do exceptions happen and what is a stack trace? Let's start with creating a new project. I'll call this new Java project. We would want to call this exception handling. And when you click finish, you would see that there is a new project in here. I'll go ahead and create a new class. I'll call this class as exception handling runner. I'll have a main method and I'll put it in a package com in 28 minutes dot exception handling. Oops, let me get the spelling right and click finish. Awesome. We have a main method 
right now let's say i would want to cause an exception to happen in here how do i do that the easiest way is to say str is equal to null and try and do some operation on it so i'll say str dot length what would happen let's run this mm -hmm. null pointer exception one of the things is in eclipse if you click the null pointer exception oops one of the things is if in eclipse if you go and click the line number you'd be able to see which line caused the exception so what we were able to see when we ran the program was what is called the stack trace you can see which line of the program caused the exception so it says exception handling runner java 7 and it would say what is the error so if you don't handle an exception what happens is the exception would be thrown to the calling thing so the exception here is not being handled what is happening is whoever is calling this main method that's the runner here it's getting the exception out so this program has failed that's the message which goes out right so let's look at a few more things what i'll do is i'll select the, both the lines of code and i'll say refactor and extract method and i would call this method one now so the code main is calling method one and method one is where the null pointer exception is happening let's see what would happen aha null pointer exception same thing but now you can see the stack trace right so main is the one which is calling this and method one 11 is where the exception is happening so you can see exactly where the code was when the error happened so it says in main i was trying to execute line number six and in method one the null pointer exception was thrown by the line 11 so you can see all that information inside this stack trace now let's go one level deeper again i would do a right click refactor extract method and i'll call this method two now main is calling method one method one is calling method two and method two is the one which is throwing an exception right so let's run this you can see the entire stack trace in here right so you can see main method one method two and method two is causing an exception the important thing that you need to understand about an exception is if you have any code after the exception handling so if i say main ended over here i would say method one ended and over here i would say method two ended right so if i run this you would see that none of the system dot out dot printer lens are being executed why are they not being executed because main is calling method one and method one is calling method two method two is causing an exception on this line so once an exception is thrown and if it's not handled what would happen it would be thrown up so method 2 is trying to handle the exception it does not have any exception handling in here so it sends it to method 1 method 1 aha I don't know how to handle this it will send it to main and main it says oh I don't know how to handle this too so it would throw it out and the subsequent lines in that particular method are not being executed because of an exception in method 2 none of the code in method 1 main is being executed this might be a problem in a number of scenarios the idea behind this video was to get you to understand two important things one is when an exception happens and if you are not handling it then the code after that in that specific method is not executed and also in the calling methods if you are not handling the exception the code after the method call which is causing the exception will not be executed as well and exceptions go up the call chain so method 2 caused the exception and it's called from method 1 so it goes to method 1 method 1 is called from main so it goes to main and if at the end main is the final authority and if it's not being able to handle it 
then it would throw it out and that's what we see it in the output when we execute the program the other thing we saw was that when we have an exception we get a stack trace and the stack trace is very useful when you want to find out how the exception happened i'll see you in the next step until then bye bye welcome back in the previous step we were introduced to what is a stack trace and we saw that the code after an exception in a method is not executed and we saw that exception flows up the call chain in this step let's focus on how to handle the exceptions what i'll do is i'll copy the class and paste it in here so i'm just going here highlighting this control c control v or command c command v and i would call this exception handling runner 2 so let's open up the exception handling runner 2 and use that for this specific step now what i'll do is i'll go to the method 2 over here we are throwing an exception and i would not want that exception to be thrown to method 1 how can i do that how can i prevent this exception from going up the chain we can add in something called a try catch block so the try catch block syntax is very very simple right so try and you would start a block in here in the block after the code that you would want to handle the exception at and after that is your catch exception and you can say ex exception is one of the classes which is present in java as you can see it's in the package java.lang as you can read it in here it says the class exception and its subclasses are a form of throwable that indicates conditions that a reasonable application might want to catch oops flowery language okay in here what we would do for now is do exception dot print stack trace what we are doing is when an exception happens we are trying to print the entire stack trace to the output one of the things which we learned earlier is when you handle an exception if you don't do anything in here so i'm just not doing anything here and i'm running the program what do you think will happen it says method one ended and main ended so it says okay main calls method one method one calls method two method two calls i mean in the method two an exception happens and we are not doing anything in here that means the exception is gobbled up the exception is eaten up so nobody will know about the exception because it's handled in method 2 method 1 will not even know about the exception so it prints method 1 ended and main ended that's what we see in here and that's not a good thing to do we would always want to expose exception something happening wrong you should tell it out and that's what we do by doing ex dot print stack trace so you can see that now in the log at least there is a exception registered in this specific scenario what we are doing is we are not sending the fact that an exception happened to method one now let's make sure that the formatting is good so inside the try we just format it so that all the code which is under the try catch block is very very visible so what happens with the try catch block is if any of the code in here throws an exception it would be caught and it would be handled in here and because we are not throwing the exception out again what would happen is the exception will be hidden from the other methods so method 2 is causing the exception and method 2 handled it so method 1 will not know about the exception at all it would think okay method 2 did something right and it would go ahead and execute the next line of code and the flow shifts once the method 1 completes execution it goes to main ended so that's what would be printed in here right so you'd see method one ended and main ended an exception will not be thrown out to whoever is calling the main method because we have handled the exception the only thing which we are doing is we are also printing the stack trace to the output because we would want somebody who's looking at it to know that there was an exception that happened it will not cause the program to fail but whoever is looking at the log will know that there was something wrong that happened in this step we were introduced to the basics of exception handling with a try catch block so you put all the code that you would want put exception handling around in a try 
and do the exception handling in the catch block. We also realize that once you throw an exception, the line after that, the code after that will not be executed because this method to end it was not really printed to the console. The other thing we understood was if an exception is handled in a method, then the exception is not visible to the calling methods. So because method to handle the exception, the method one and main did not know about the fact that there was an exception. So they continued executing the next lines of code. I'll see you in the next step where we will be talking a lot more about exception handling. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In this example, let's dig deeper into the syntax of try catch block. One of the important things to understand that in the exceptions, there is a hierarchy as well. So there are a variety of exceptions and each one of them have a hierarchy. For example, if I open up a null pointer exception, right? null pointer exception is one of the exceptions. So you would see that null pointer exceptions extends runtime exception and runtime exception in turn extends exception. So null pointer exception is a subclass of runtime exception and runtime exception is a subclass of exception. So in a way, exception is a super class, super super class of null pointer exception, right? So when you are doing exception handling, one of the things you can do is you can have multiple cache blocks trying to handle specific exceptions. What happened in here was this code was throwing a null pointer exception. The null pointer exception matched the catch block with the exception because null pointer exception is a subclass of exception. It's in the tree of exceptions under exception. If you want to handle null pointer exception differently, what you can do is you can actually have a separate catch block for null pointer exception as well. So I can say null pointer exception ex and I can print out in here, let's say, sys out, hey, null pointer exception. So you'd see that when null pointer exception happens, you'd see that null pointer exception is printed. So this is the catch block which gets executed. When a specific exception happens, null pointer exception is a specific exception, right? Exception is generic. Under exception, there are a wide variety of exceptions like null pointer exception, array index, out of bound exceptions, and a lot of other exceptions. So when a specific exception happens, the catch block, which is the most specific one, so null pointer exception happened and null pointer exception matched. That is the one which is executed. So the two things are one, you can have multiple catch blocks. You can have different strategies to handle different kinds of exceptions. When an exception happens, the most specific of those exceptions is the one that matches. Now, let's look at another scenario. Let's say over here, I would comment out this piece of code and I would cause a different exception to happen, right? Let's say I have a int array. Int array i is equal to, let's initialize it with two elements. What I would do in here is cause an exception. How can I cause an exception? I'll say i of three, all right? What I'm doing here is I'm saying int number is equal to i of three, right? So I'm accessing the third element in a two, L, actually fourth element in a two element array. What would happen? Think about it, what would happen? Would it cause an exception? Let's see what would happen. Yep, it causes an exception. However, the exception is array index out of bound exception. Which exception block is being executed? This is the exception block which is being executed. Let's check that, right? So system.out.println, I'll just print exception, matched exception. Here also let's put matched to make it easier, right? So now let's execute this. You can see matched exception. So array index out of bound exception is not null pointer exception. So it is a subclass of exception. Let's see how it is array index out of bounds exception. So if you look at array index out of bound exception, 
it extends index out of bounds exception which extends runtime exception which extends exception depending on the type of the exception the specific thing would be handled now if this was not there let's say if this catch was not there what would happen will the exception be handled at all let's see what would happen you can see that the entire stack trace is coming up because this is throwing an array index out of bounds exception and you have only defined how to handle a null pointer exception the exception which is happening here is not handled what would happen it is thrown to the calling method and this is throwing to the calling method and this exception is thrown out that's why you would see that the subsequent lines are not executed you can see that the only thing which is printed in is this tag trace now if i want to enable this how can i do that i put back the exception and if i want to have specific exception handling for the array index out of bounds i can put that in place as well array index out of bounds f should be small and i can say matched array index out of bound exception and go ahead so you can see that the block which is being executed now is array index out of bounds exception aha isn't this a lot of fun exception handling is really really a lot of fun i hope you are having a good time understanding all the different cache blocks we have put in and the fact that we handle specific exception if a specific exception is there that would match that if there was no specific exception then if i have a exception cache block then it would be a catch all because any exception would match exception in this step we learned that there is a hierarchy in the exceptions as well null pointer exception is a subclass of exception array index out of bounds exception is another subclass of exception we also learned that if an exception happens and even though there is a exception handling for some other exception it will not match that so if if an array index out of bounds exception occurs and if there is exception handling only for a null pointer exception then the exception handling will not be executed for an exception to be matched it should be at least that exception or a super class of that exception for example if it's array bounds index out of bounds exception it should be either array index out of bounds exception the catch should either be array index out of bounds exception or a index out of bound exception or a runtime exception or a exception one of these cache blocks would match cool try and play around with exception handling a lot more and i'll see you in the next step with a lot more about exception handling until then bye bye welcome back in this video let's look at another important part of the try catch block which is finally we'll understand why finally is needed and we will look at what you can do with finally let's create a new class and i'll say finally runner and i'll call this main and what we want to do here is use a specific thing so earlier when we were scanning input from the user we were trying to get the input from the user we used a class called scanner right so scanner 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 is equal to new scanner i would want to get the input from the user so system dot out is output system dot in is input now i can import java dot util dot scanner so one of the things about a scanner is after using a scanner you should call scanner dot close if you don't call scanner dot close there might be some resource leakage so there might be some memory leaks which might happen let's say code in between there is some code in between doing a lot of logic let's not worry about all the code which is present in here let's say one of the places i have a array so int array numbers is equal to let's say 1 2 3 4 12 12 okay, 3 4 5 that's cool right so this array has four elements let's say i say numbers of 5 in here int number is equal to numbers of 5 what would happen if i run this program an exception would happen it says array index out of bound exception this line of code is throwing an exception now what would happen if there is an exception system.out.println what i can do is before scanner close now 
what happens? Will before scanner close be printed? Nope, because an exception happened, it goes out. It doesn't come to this line. So the scanner is opened, but the scanner is not closed. If you do that repeatedly for a number of times, it would cause a memory problem. A single object in memory might not be a problem, but let's say this is in a piece of code which is executed millions of times and out of which maybe 1000 or 10,000 times there are exceptions. Then you are causing leakage of the objects because this code is causing an exception and we are not closing the scanner. How do we ensure that a scanner.close is always called? That's where the finally block comes in. Let's now start with a try catch, right? So that's basically what we would typically do to do exception handling to handle this, right? So try and catch. And I'll catch exception in general. Just let's keep it very simple and do e dot print stack trace. Okay, let's format the code. Control Shift F and run this. You can see that e dot print stack trace is being printed. And if I do a line of code in here, after the try, you'd see that just before closing out main. You'd see that this line would be executed, right? Because the exception is handled, we are printing the stack trace out, and the line after that is executed. But what we want to also ensure is we would want to make sure that scanner.close is called. How can I ensure that even if there is an exception, scanner.close is called. The way you can do that is by moving scanner.close to something called a finally block. So I can say scanner.close in here. Now you'd see that there is a compilation error because scanner is defined in this block and it's not available. So what we would need to do is the scanner scanner, I would move it outside. Scanner in here. I'll say scanner scanner is equal to null, scanner is equal to new scanner here. And finally, we want to do a scanner dot close. Now, I'll move this statement also into finally. Now, let's see what would happen. Mm -hmm. Before scanner dot close, after that scanner dot close is called and just before closing out main. That's cool, right? So what is happening here is this code in finally is always executed. So even if there is an exception or if there is no exception, this code is executed. So if I'm, let's say, trying to access number of two, then what would happen? The code in finally is executed. So before scanner close, if there's an exception, what would happen? Even then the code in finally gets executed. So one of the important things is the code in finally is always executed. That's why we use finally to make sure that all the objects that are created are closed. If you really want to be sure, some of the times if let's say the creation of the scanner itself through an exception. To be safe, what we can do is say if scanner is not equal to null. This ensures that the scanner.close is only called if scanner is not null. That's why you see a lot of places in exception handling, people would add in a null check. This would ensure that if this line throws an exception, what would happen? Scanner would be null. So we just print this and go out. In this step, we learned about finally. We want to make sure that all the objects that are created are closed before we go out. And that's what finally helps us to do. It helps us to execute some code irrespective of whether an exception happens or not. I'll see you in the next step. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In this video, let's discuss a few puzzles related to exception handling. I'm sure the last few videos might be a little boring, so let's make it much more interesting with a few puzzles. Let's get started with the first one. You can Pause the video in here and try and think about this puzzle. See the code. And the question is, will finally be executed in the program below? So will the connection dot close be executed in the program which is present in here? Think about it. If an exception is thrown, will finally be executed? There is 
a little bit of trick to this question. Let's see if you would be able to get it. Okay, now let's discuss the solution now. So what is happening here? We are creating a connection, we are opening it, and within the try, there is a null pointer exception which is happening in here. So if this null pointer exception happens, finally would definitely be executed, right? That's the reason why we have a finally. Cool. But let's say this code did not throw a null pointer exception. So there was no str is equal to, let's say, was assigned to a proper value. So str has a proper string value and there was no exception that is being thrown. Do you think finally will still be executed? Think about it. There is a return statement in here as well. So I'm saying return back. Will finally ex be executed or not? The answer to that is yes, finally will be executed. So whether there is an exception, whether there is a return, whether there is no exception, finally will be executed. Aha, the next question is much more interesting, right? So when is code in finally not executed? When do you think a line of code in finally might not be executed at all? Let's look at this example, right? So we have this code in finally. When will a line in finally not be executed? Let's say system.out.println throws an exception. Only in that case, this if statement will not be executed. A line in finally will not be executed if the lines before it throw an exception. Or there is one more scenario where a JVM crash happens. Exception is thrown, you are trying to handle the exception and at this point, your JVM crashes. You can also trigger a JVM crash by saying system.exit and say one. I mean, don't do this, don't try. I mean, it's like the warning typically, right? Don't try this at home, right? Don't try this because this would cause your applications to crash. If you put it in a web application, Java E application, it might cause the entire application to crash. Not just your servlet, but the entire application. So it says terminates the current running Java virtual machine, right? Don't try this. So when you call system.exit, then also the finally code will not be executed cool i'll not not comment it actually i'll delete it right let's not do that so that's the answer to the puzzle let's look at the next puzzle will this code compile you can see that there is a try there is a finally but what is missing a catch is missing will this work we saw that there can be a try catch without finally can there be a try finally without a catch the answer to that is yes you can have a try with a finally. That's cool. Will this code compile? There's just a try and there's nothing else. There's no catch. There is no finally. Actually, this code will not compile because what is the use of putting something in a try without telling either finally or catch, right? Catch would help us to handle exceptions. Finally would help us to make sure that some piece of code is always executed. I hope you had a lot of fun doing these puzzles. I'll see you in the next video. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. One of the most important things to understand about exception handling is the hierarchy of exception handling and concepts called checked exception and unchecked exception. In this step, let's take our first steps towards understanding the concepts of checked exception and unchecked exceptions. This is one of the first pieces of code that we wrote when we started with exception handling. This thing in here is throwing a null pointer exception, but it's not forcing us to handle this in here. However, there are situations where you're forced to handle certain exceptions. What am I talking about? Let's create a new class. I'll call this checked exception runner and I'll add in a main method as usual, right? Over here, what I'm doing is I'm writing a simple line of code, right? Thread dot sleep 2000. So if you played with threads, you know that this is a method which would cause this specific thread, which is main, to sleep for two seconds. So for two seconds, this code will not do anything. But as soon as I write the code, you'd see that it's actually saying unhandled exception type interrupted exception. Aha. Let's look at the signature. It says throws interrupted exception. So this method is saying there's a possibility that I would throw an exception. What exception? 
interrupted exception and when a method says I am going to throw certain kinds of exceptions then you are forced to handle it or you can do something called a throws. Let's start with trying to handle it right so I can say try I can say catch and what exception should we handle? The exception which it's throwing, right? Interrupted exception. Interrupted exception E and over here I can say E dot print stack trace. Now, does that make the method happy? Now, if I execute the thing, you'd see that it would wait for two seconds and get killed. So, if you increase it to 5000, you would see that the program would wait for five seconds and then it would get killed. What I'll do is I'll try and call some other method from here. Let's say some other method. Oops, that method is not there. So let's get Eclipse to create it for us. I'll say create some other method. So this some other method is, let's say enough. I would want to do the same thing in here, which I'm doing in here. So control C and control V, thread dot sleep 2000. So it says again, same thing, right? It says unhandled exception, interrupted exception. Now, one option we saw was to use a try catch block, right? The other option is to say, hey, I don't, want to handle this exception. I'll just say I throw this exception. The throws declaration is very simple. Throws interrupted exception. So this is saying, okay, I'm doing something fishy. This is risky code. There is a chance that I'm throwing an exception. If you are having dicey code, so thread.sleep is risky code. One is you can say, I want to handle it. So I would want to handle the exception. That's the try catch. The other way is to say, hey, I don't want to worry about it. I'm putting in my declaration. Whoever looks at me knows that I'm throwing a risky thing. So I'm doing something risky. You be careful about it. So whoever is calling this, they need to be careful and they would need to make sure that they handle the risk. The important thing to understand is why is only for this method, it's forcing us to handle it. Let's take another example, right? So I'll create another method. So let's copy this and paste it in here. And over here, I remove the thread dot sleep and I remove the throws and I'll call this some other method two, right? Some other method two. And let's say it throws runtime exception. Runtime exception we saw was one of the things which is present in the hierarchy of exceptions right so some other method to throws runtime exception now let's say in the main method i am commenting this piece of code and i am calling some other method to oops main method is not complaining about it even though i'm calling it i'm saying it throws runtime exception Main is saying, I don't really care. Why is it so? The same thing if I said some other method, main is not happy. Main is complaining. It says unhandled exception type interrupted exception. Aha. Why is this so? What is the difference between interrupted exception and runtime exception? Let's see that in the next step. In this step, we learn the fact that certain methods are risky and they tell that I am risky by saying I will throw an exception. So some methods throw runtime exception, some method might be throwing interrupted exception, some methods like thread.sleep would throw interrupted exception as well. There are a lot of other methods in Java which says I am going to throw an exception, I am risky. Sometimes some of these exceptions force you to handle it. The way you can handle that is by either having a try catch block or by declaring that I would throw the same exception. The question is which kind of exceptions force you to handle it and which kinds of exceptions you can ignore. We'll get the answer to that in the next step. Until then, bye bye. Welcome back. In the previous step, we understood that when we throw some types of exceptions, we are forced to handle them like the interrupted exception. However, when we throw runtime exception, the calling method is not really forced 
to handle the exception. To understand the answer for that, we need to understand something called exception hierarchy. There are a set of predefined exceptions in Java. Null pointer exception, we saw array index out of bounds exception, and we saw interrupted exception. So these are all part of something called an exception hierarchy. Thing which is at the highest level, the superclass of everything related to exception handling is throwable. There are two important classes which extends throwable error and exception. Errors are errors which a programmer will not be able to handle. So you cannot do anything about this kind of errors. For example, you are out of memory. JVM is out of memory. Or think about a stack overflow error. There is a recursive thing happening and there's a you run out of thing and stack overflow happens. So these are called errors. Coming to the exceptions, right? So the next one is exception. Exceptions are things which programmers may be able to handle. So these are the things we should really care about when we are doing exception handling. When we talk about exceptions in general, we have two types of exceptions. Exceptions that are runtime exceptions and the subclasses of runtime exceptions. The other exceptions are exceptions which are not a subclass of runtime exception. You can kind of look at it as a tree. So everything under exception which is not a runtime exception. That's one classification. The exceptions which are under exception but not runtime exceptions are called checked exceptions. For example, you can look at the interrupted exception in here. Interrupted exception is a checked exception because it is directly extending exception. Interrupted exception and any subclass of interrupted exception will be called a checked exception. And when any method throws a checked exception, calling method should either handle it or say, I'm going to throw it as well. So Java says anything which is not a runtime exception. So anything which is not a runtime exception and a subclass of runtime exception, but which is a subclass of exception is a risky exception. And those risky exceptions, if a method throws, then the calling method should either handle it or throw it. If you are runtime exception, or a subclass of runtime exception like null pointer exception, array index out of bounds exceptions. All these are runtime exceptions or subclasses of runtime exceptions. If a method throws any of these, you don't really need to handle that. The calling method can say, okay, this is not really risky. This will happen only when there is a bad programmer and there are very few bad programmers. So let's not really worry about them. The most important things that you need to take out of this specific step is the fact that there is an exception hierarchy and at the top of the exception hierarchy is a class called throwable. There are two important things which extend throwable, error and exception. Errors you cannot do anything about, stack overflow or out of memory. Make sure that you don't create them. There is no way you can handle them. The things which you can handle are exceptions. And there are two kinds of exceptions. Those which are runtime exceptions and subclass of runtime exceptions and those which are not runtime exceptions and those are called checked exceptions. Runtime exception is a unchecked exception. Any subclass of runtime exception is a unchecked exception. If a method throws a checked exception, then the calling method should either handle it or throw it. If a method throws a runtime exception, then the calling method need not do anything about it. Okay. That's all you need to know about the exception hierarchy. Let's get back to doing a lot more hands-on stuff in the next step. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. Until now, we discussed how to handle exceptions which somebody else has thrown, something which was in the Java API and things like that. Now, let's focus on throwing exceptions in our code. How do we throw exceptions from our code? In this step, Let's focus on throwing a very simple exception from our code. To have a good understanding of the whole thing, what we'll do is we'll set up a simple example. Let's create a new class. I'll call this class as throwing exception runner. And I'll call this 
I'll have a main and finish. And what I would do is I would start with a simple class. What I'll do is I'll create a class. I want to have amounts stored in a specific class. I would want to store what kind of currency and what is the amount. So I would say class amount and over here what I would want to do is I would have private string amount actually private string amount string amount nope currency right private string currency and private int amount right very simple nothing glamorous about it right so now I'll generate constructor using fields let's go ahead and generate a constructor all that it would do is just create a very simple constructor right string currency int amount this dot currency is equal to currency amount is equal to amount that's cool let's also create a two string very simple one so that we can print currencies whenever we would want them public string two string i'll just return currency oops let's start with amount amount plus space plus currency cool so let's say we are only storing integer kind of amounts no big decimals and things like that let's keep it very simple and we are using string no enums and things like that right ideally i should use a enum big decimal in here but let's continue keeping things very simple we have an amount class right now i would want to add two amounts of this kind i'll create a method in here so i would want to add one currency to another currency how can i do that i'll say public void add method and the input is amount other so what i would want to do is i would want to add the amount from this currency to here so i can say this dot amount is equal to this dot amount plus other dot amount is that good logic think about it now let's create a couple of amounts right so let's say amount amount one is equal to new amount of usd oops do we have string first and currency next right so amount two is usd comma 20 and amount one dot add amount two cool let's do this out amount one mm -hmm. should be cool right let's go ahead and run this 30 usd awesome now there's a friend of mine who doesn't like simple stuff he wants to make everything complex so he says okay now i'm giving you eur what does our program do aha it ignores that it says hey i don't care about it 30 usd right is that good nope right so if i'm doing something of this kind i should tell my consumers that you are doing something wrong one of the things i can do is in a later version of this program i can implement currency conversion and try and convert it into usd and put it in here but let's say that feature is well off the way for now i would want to implement exception handling in here to make sure that you not be able to do exactly this how can i do that i can say if this dot currency dot equals other dot currency actually it's even better to call it that if this dot currency that dot currency and that dot amount that's cool right so if this dot currency equals that dot currency you'd want to add them up if they are not if not of this then what do we want to do we want to throw an exception how do we throw an exception this is the way throw new exception of currencies don't match aha this is not really accepting it so when i'm saying exception it's not accepting it let's for now be happy by saying runtime exception it's not complaining right think about it exception it's complaining 
runtime exception it's not complaining i'll put it on the back burner think about it we'll talk about it in the next step but for now let's see if this code throws an exception cool this is throwing an exception so nobody will be able to add currency which don't match that's cool right so we are preventing our users from doing something which is not right i cannot add right now the application does not know how to do that what we would need to typically do in these kind of situations in the main method we would want to handle this and display a proper message to the ui and also we would need to typically put a proper exception trace in the log so that whoever is debugging it knows okay somebody is trying to add currencies right now we don't have that feature in the system that's cool right so in this step what we did is we understood how to throw exceptions in next step we'll try and understand why there was a compilation error when i tried to do new exception and let's see how we can fix that compilation error until then bye bye welcome back in the previous step we saw that when we are throwing a runtime exception it's everything cool right so the method exception goes to the main and let's assume that there is a big application where the exception is going to be handled properly the thing which we observed in the last video was when i say throw new exception there is a compilation error what does the compilation error say aha unhandled exception type exception the thing is whenever you are throwing a checked exception a checked exception is anything which is not runtime exception or a subclass of runtime exception right whenever you are throwing a checked exception your method needs to tell that in its signature so i would need to say here throws exception cool right whenever you are throwing a checked exception your definition needs to tell i am going to throw an exception i am risky guy the other thing which is happening here is now there's a compilation error as soon as i said throws what i would need to do the add method is throwing a checked exception that means this specific method the main method in here also has two options right what are the two options think about them either it can put a try catch block or it can say throws exception typically in large applications you would want to have a try catch block and make sure that you are logging the right exceptions but for now let's say i'm going to just throw the exception this is how we throw a checked exception when i say it's runtime exception it's an unchecked exception when i say it's a exception it's a checked exception let's see what happens when i run this cool it's the same exception it says currencies don't match java.lang.exception you really want to actually make it even more thing you can add in the currencies that don't match right so i can say this dot currency and plus that dot currency right this would be even more clearer to somebody who is looking at it saying okay the currencies don't really match so currencies don't match usd and eur if you want really to make it even more beautiful let's put couple of spaces on the either side currencies don't match usd and eur handle that right that's cool right we are giving as much information as possible in this step we saw that if you throw a unchecked exception you don't need to worry about throwing that exception out but if you are throwing a checked exception then you need to say throws and whoever is calling you needs to either handle it or say throws in the next step we would try and define a custom exception of our own over here we are throwing an exception instead of that it might be cooler to say currencies do not match exception right let's do that in the next step until then bye bye welcome back in this step let's throw a custom exception of our own so i'll try and comment this code out i would want to create a custom exception how do i create a custom exception let's create a simple class in here right so class currencies do not match exception right that's the one which you would want to do and i would say extends exception as simple as that right so extends exception now i can say currencies do not match exception over here instead of this i can say 
throw new currencies do not match exception since currencies do not match exception is a subclass of exception this is fine but even to be more specific you can say throws currencies do not match exception and even in the main method you can say throws currencies do not match exception and let's run this cool right now we are throwing a currencies do not match exception so we are throwing our own exception somebody can use this in the catch block so whoever wants to handle this can put this in the catch block and try and handle that so in the main if we want to handle currencies do not match exception separately then we can do that that's the provision that we are providing right now the next thing we want to do is it's not just sufficient if i actually have an exception type right we would also want to have a message so what i can do in here is string message so i can create a constructor saying public constructor and typically what we would do is just say super of message because we there's a method in the exception also which can handle the message so i can pass the exception message out as well so now i can say the message as well in here right cool now i can say aha now currencies do not match exception and i can say currencies do not match usd and i eu or i can send a specific detail as well one of the other things is you can also extend runtime exception so if you would want you can also extend runtime exception if you extend runtime exception then you are creating a unchecked exception that means i don't really need to say throws so if you are throwing a runtime exception then you don't really need to say throws inside in here so i can remove this and still the code would continue to compile fine so if you are throwing a checked exception then it needs to be handled if you are throwing a runtime exception or an unchecked exception then you don't need to handle it cool isn't it in this video we created a custom exception of our own currencies do not match exception and we created it as a checked exception as well as an unchecked exception and we saw what kind of changes we would need to make typically it's a difficult choice to make whether you would want to actually make it a checked exception or an unchecked exception the thing you can you need to think about always is your consumer right so what is your consumer going to do about that exception if you would want your consumer to definitely handle that exception to definitely know about the exception then you would force him by creating a checked exception but if your consumer cannot do anything about it then in those kind of situations you would typically go with a runtime exception i'll see you in the next video until then bye bye welcome back when we talked about finally we saw that writing finally code is little cumbersome right we had to split the declaration up and then we had to do try catch finally and check the null and do this kind of stuff so this kind of code is a lot of cumbersome thing to write a lot of manual things to make sure that we are getting it right in java 7 there was a new feature which is introduced which is called try with resources let's look at that in this specific step how do you create a try with resources what i'll do is i'll copy this class finally runner control c control v and call this try with resources runner what i'll do is i'll remove all the try catch blocks so i'll go like this so this is the basic code that we wrote right so this is the scanner and we want to do a scanner dot close now if you want to make sure that the exception handling for this is fine all that you need to do is say try and put this in parenthesis and start a try block you don't really need to do a scanner dot close the try with resources is a specific thing and in this kind of thing you don't even need to have a catch or a finally if you really want to do a catch you can do that as well you can have a catch block saying what would you do if there is an exception 
and you can also have a finally. But these two are not really mandatory. What this would do is the try with resources would automatically call the scanner.close at the end of the execution. So this is one of the new features in Java 7. Java 7 is not so new anymore, but still it's not a feature which a lot of Java developers are aware of. Whenever you are doing things which would need to be closed, typically this is the new way of doing it. So one of the important things is this scanner implements a class called auto closable. So if you look at this closable, it implements something called, it extends something called auto closable. So anything which implements the interface auto closable, we can use it in the try with resources. You can see that in the auto closable, there is a method called close. What this does is if some error happens in the code, then close is called on this specific variable. So you don't need to explicitly make the call to the close. This helps us in making our try catch blocks much more simpler. In the code of the try with resources, you can focus on reading the input and things like that and don't really worry about how to do the exception management. We are done with one of my favorite features of exception handling in Java 7. I hope you are having a nice time. I'll see you in the next step. Until then, bye bye. Welcome back. In this video, let's discuss a few puzzles about exception handling. What do you think would happen if the method has this kind of a code? This code is throwing a null pointer exception. So what would happen if there is, let's say this is inside a main method. What would happen? Would the exception be handled in this method? Okay, you're right. The exception will not be handled because what we are handling in here is only the currencies do not match exception. We are not really handle, handling the null pointer exception. So this catch block will not match and therefore the exception would be thrown out. And if some other method is calling it, then the exception would flow up the chain. Now look at this puzzle. Would this code compile? I already give you a clue. Okay, right. The answer is this code will not compile. Currencies do not match exception is a subclass of exception. So your catch blocks should always be in the hierarchy starting from the subclasses to the superclasses. So the hierarchy should be currencies do not match exception and then runtime exception and then exception. So if you don't have a runtime exception, then the way it should be is the catch block for currencies do not match exception first and then you should have the catch block for exception. So the order of these catch blocks is not right. Actually, this is not really a puzzle. It's one of the new features in Java 7. What you can do in Java 7 is you can define multiple exceptions in the same block. So I'm trying to handle IO exception and SQL exception in the same block. All that I need to put is a pipe symbol. So IO exception, pipe, SQL exception, space, the name you are giving to that variable. Well, that's all you would need to be able to handle both these exceptions. In this step, we tried to look at a few puzzles related to exception handling. I'll see you in the next step. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. Let's now review some of the important exception handling best practices from my experience. I have more than 20 years of programming experience and I have probably debugged more than 1,000, maybe 2,000, maybe 3,000 errors. So these are all those best practices which came from my experience. So what's the first best practice? Never hide exceptions, right? If exception happens, put the entire stack trace into your log. Stack trace would really help and also try and put some context in. In the example which we saw, we said currencies do not match and we also listed what currencies did not match. So that kind of context really helps somebody who's trying to handle the exception. The moment you start hiding the exceptions, the guy who's trying to solve it does not know where to start. He knows something is going wrong, but he does not know which line of code threw the exception, right? Without the line of code which threw the exception, it's very, very difficult. So context and the stack trace, those are the two important things which will help whoever is solving the exception at a later point in time. 
The second thing is do not really use it for flow control, right? So you cannot have exception handling to redirect traffic. You cannot use it like a if else kind of a thing, right? Do not use it because exception handling is very expensive. It consumes resources. So don't use it for flow control. The most important thing about exception handling is think about your user. If an exception happens, what does your user want to see? What does your end user want to see? What can he do about it? So always think about whenever I'm writing code, what can go wrong and what should I tell an end user if something goes wrong in here? As long as you are thinking about it, then you are doing very well. The other thing is to think about your support team, the guy who is going to handle the call from your end user. What kind of information does he need to solve the error? The support team might also include the developer who might want to have a lot of information in the log or wherever your logging chain might end up in. Also think about the calling method. So if you are designing an API, think about what the calling method can do about this exception. If you are throwing an exception as a checked exception and there is nothing your calling method can do about it, then probably there is something wrong. One of the best things that Spring Framework does is it makes most of the exceptions as runtime exceptions. Therefore, the calling method does not need to handle them. The important question you need to ask is there a way calling method can react to this exception? Is there a way it can solve it? If it cannot, if all it if all it would do is pass it to the next method, then do you think about if you need to make it a runtime exception, make it unchecked. Last one is have global exception handling. Let's say you have 10,000 lines of code which is starting from main. Make sure that in the main, you are not throwing exception to the outside world. Make sure that in main, you have proper exception handling and the exception does not go above main. Similarly, if you are developing a web application, make sure that you have something sitting on top of everything, which is like the global exception handling, so that no exceptions actually go to the user. To the end user, it should always be a proper exception message which goes out, which should tell him what he can do about it. An end user will not be able to do anything with a stack trace, right? So all that you need to show him is a good message and put the error in the stack trace so that when the end user comes and talks to the support team, he gets what he wants. Okay, there you go. These are all the best practices. I know some of these are not really easy to implement, but the most important thing is for you to keep thinking about this. Once you have the attitude of trying to think about the end user, your support team and the calling method, that's all you would need to make sure that you have awesome exception handling. I'll see you in the next section where we would be talking about a lot more topics. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. Welcome to this quick section on files. In this section, we'll try and understand how to list the files in a directory, how to search for a files in a directory. And also, we will look at how to read all the text from a file and also how to write to a file. In this step, let's start with the most basic thing. We would want to take a directory and list all the content of that specific directory. Let's get started. I would start with creating a new project. So let's create a new Java project as usual. And we would call this files. When you click finish, a new Java project would be created and you have a new source directory in here as well. What I'll do is I'll create a new directory. So in the files, I'll create control N and I will say new folder. And I'll call this resources. What we'll do is we'll put some of the text files in there later. For now, let's focus on our source. I'll start in with creating a new class. I'll call this directory scan runner and let's put a main also in here cool now what i would want to do is when i run this project the dot maps to this so whenever we say dot that's the current directory that matches to the root of your directory structure so in this project if i'm saying dot to refer to a directory then it refers to this 
So over here, I'd want to list up all the files which are present. Because I'm using Eclipse, then you would see that this directory has a lot of files. Not lot, there are a couple of files which would be present. So let's see what are there in this specific step. Let's get started, right? So the first thing is I'd want to find out whatever is present in the current directory. Before Java 7, there was a very complex way of doing this. But since Java 7 and after functional programming was introduced in Java 8, all these kind of stuff became very, very easy. So in this section, we'd be using functional programming concepts to scan through the files, scan through the directories and things like that. So if you did not get a chance to look through the functional programming section, I would definitely recommend you to spend some time with it and get a good understanding of the functional programming before trying to do this section. That disclaimer aside, let's get on to it, right? So I would want to find I would want to find the path to this specific directory, right? So paths help us to get on to a specific directory. So I would say import paths. You can see that it's in a package called Java NIO. NIO stands for new IO. I don't know how, why they call it Java new IO because it was introduced in Java 7. And now in 9, it's not so new anymore. Okay, let's not worry about it. What we want to do is from this path, we would want to read all the list of files. How do I do that? In the files class, there is a method called list. And you can see that list accepts a path. And this returns a stream back. If you look at the files.list, it's a new method again. It's introduced in Java 8. If you look at the documentation, it says it returns a stream. The elements are the entry, the elements of which are the entries in a directory. And the most important thing is listing is not recursive. In the sense, it just returns what is present in the current directory, not in the directories underneath the current directory. Let's go ahead and use the path in here. So files.list, this is written a stream, right? On a stream, I would want to print everything out. How can I do that? For each and define your consumer. I'm going to use a method reference, print ln. Now, one of the important things is exception handling, right? There's a chance that this folder does not exist or things like that. That's why you have to handle an exception called IO exception, control one and say add throws. Cool. Now, let's run this. Now, you can see all the things. Right? Dot class path is created by Eclipse. Dot project is created by Eclipse. Bin is where all the class files that are compiled are stored. We created the resources folder and we also have the source folder which is present. So, these are all the folder source resources. We don't see the bin and the dot project dot class path. But if I open up the files, you can see all the things in here, right? Dot class path, dot project, bin, resources, and source. Let's end this step in here. And in the next step, let's do a few more operations and get into searches and things like that. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In the previous step, we wrote simple code to try and list all the files which are present in a specific folder. So we did, listed both the files and the directories which are present in there. But sometimes you'd want to search the entire directory. So you'd want to do it recursively. In those kind of situations, you can go for something called files.walk. As you can read it in here, oops, it's not really readable. So let's actually go in there, say the walk, it says, it returns a stream that is lazily populated by walking the file tree rooted at the given starting file. What we want to do is we would want to walk through our directory, right? So the same path. So let's extract the path out to a variable current directory. So we have current directory in here. So we would want files.walk current directory and you need to specify how many levels deep do we want to go? So let's start with one level deep. What we'll do is do the same thing for each system.out.println. Oops, let's fix this very quickly. What I'll do is I'll move this to one line as well. 
Now, I will comment this line out list that we did in the previous step. Now, what would happen if I run this? Exactly the same output as list because we are giving go through at one level. If I say two levels, mm -hmm, it's going one level down. So, it's saying class path ds store dot project. It's also going bin files and source files, right? Let's go four levels deeper you would have a lot more files that are being printed, right? So it's printing bin files, the directory scan runner.java and the file that we created just now as well. Cool. So we can use the files.walk to walk through a current directory. Now, I would want to filter those files, only the Java files which are present in here. How can I do that? Functional programming, filter, right? So I can have a filter and define a predicate in here. What I'll do is I'll not define the predicate directly in here. I'll take it to a local variable. So I'll want to create a predicate down here. Now the predicate is path. So path is whatever is coming in. So path, what we want to do is we would want to get the string value of path. So string dot value of path and we want to check if it contains dot Java. Right, so that's or dot ends with is also a good option. Oops, I should not have a semicolon here, that's why there is a compilation error. So, what we are doing is walk the current directory and filter based on this predicate. And what is this predicate doing? It's just saying take it to a path variable and it says string dot value of path contains dot java. So, we are checking the path, the string value of the path if it contains dot java. Let's run this. You'd see that only the Java file is printed. So what we are doing in here is walking through a current directory and trying to print files which match a specific condition. There is another method to search through the files. It's called files.find. The first two parameters are exactly the same. Current directory and what depth do you want to scan up to? The second one is something called a matcher. Let's just say it's matcher and let's put a semicolon in here. Now I'll create this as a local variable. So control one, create local variable. As you can see, the type of the matcher is a bribe predicate. So it's accepting two parameters, path and the file attributes as well. So now I can define a predicate based on these two. So I can say path comma attributes mapping to what we are defining in here is called a lambda expression, right? So this lambda expression accepts two parameters. That's why within parentheses, I'm putting two variable names, path and attributes. And now I can use these path and attribute names, right? So if I want to filter based on the path and say I want to only get the Java files, I can copy this thing from here. Right? String dot value of path contains dot Java. Now this would return all the files. Now I can actually take this for each and execute it in here as well. So what I'll do is I'll put this into one line and comment this out so this does not get executed and let's run this. You get the same output. But the additional thing that the files.find method provides is the attributes of the file, right? Instead of defining a predicate, let's say here we are saying Java matcher, right? So what I can also do is I can copy this and put it down. I'll create another matcher. Here, I don't want to use the path. I would want to say attributes dot is directory. So I only want to print the directories which are present. I'll say directory matcher. And now we'll use the directory matcher in here. Now, let's see what would happen. Oops. Errors exist. Oops, I should not have a semicolon in here, right? So dot for each, that's cool. Let's format it so that it's clear. Let's run it. Mm -hmm. Now it's only printing the directories which are present in here. You'd see that actually attributes have a lot of other attributes. You can filter based on the creation time. You can filter based on the size of the file. You can filter based on the last access time and the last modified time as well. So you can use any of these attributes in our filter.
Cool. In this second step for files, we started with using the walk method to look through the directories and print the Java files. The predicate that the walk offered was just providing us with the path. So what we did was we did stingo.value of path and checked if it contains Java to filter the values. But the find method provides us much more better filters. So the predicate defines both the path and a few basic file attributes. So you can filter based on the name of the file and the path as well as you can filter based on certain characteristics of the file. Here we are using the directory matcher. In the next step, let's move towards trying to read from a file. I'll see you in the next step. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. What I'll do is I'll try and copy this file out again. Control C, Control V and I'll call this file read runner. So we have a file called file read runner. I'll remove all the code which is present in there. We don't really care about any of that right now. I'll just leave the current directory path variable in here. Cool. Organize the imports, Control Shift O, so that we remove all the unused imports as well. Now, what we want to do now is we would want to read from a file. Where do we want to create the file from? Let's go to the resources. This is a folder which we created earlier. So what we did earlier was to say right click new folder and we created a resources folder in here. Now I'll say right click new file and I would want to call this data.text. Let's just say there is a lot of data in this specific text file, right? 123, 122, there is a, some text and apple, bat and cat, <laughs> right? Doesn't matter what's in this file. So we have a file in the resources data.txt, right? As we discussed earlier, the path to this would be dot slash resources slash data.txt, right? So dot slash resources slash data.txt. Cool. This is file to read. Oops. I'll call this path file to read. Before the new file IO came into picture, reading and writing from files was very complex. You had to define a lot of streams and do variety of things to get this working. But now with the NIO, it's much, much, much more easier. The way we can do that is another static method in the files, files dot read all lines. And I can pass in the path. So path file to read. What would this return? This would return a list of all the strings. So I'll say lines. And let's do a sysout lines. Aha, it's taking all the lines from the file and it's printing into a list, right? Isn't this very, very simple? Now think about it. Is this a good approach to do this? Let's say your file has million lines of code or million lines of text in there. Do you want to read them all at once and print them all at once? What would happen? Everything gets read into the memory at once. So all the million lines which are present are scanned and put into memory at the same time. That might not be a good thing to do in most of the situations unless your files are very small. What are the alternatives? As usual, the new IO provides an alternative. You can say files.lines and specify a path. So I'll say path file to read. Let's comment this out, this specific thing. So files.lines, path file to read, and you can say, what does this return? This returns a stream of lines. So let's look at that, files.lines, it returns a stream. It does not read all the lines at once. It would give you a stream of each of the lines. Now, I can use this stream to process them. So I can say for each, I can define the consumer, right? System dot out colon colon print ln. This will process the lines one by one and it prints them out. That's cool, right? So this would not actually try and read the entire file at once. This would take one line, process it, one line, process it, one line, process it, and so on. So that's why this is much more efficient when you have a lot of things to do. And the other important thing about this is you can now say filter. I can filter, I can define a predicate. So 
I can say I would want to only take certain kinds of things or you can do a map. Let's say I would want to convert everything to lowercase. So I can say string colon colon lowercase. Oops, the method should be actually to lowercase. Okay, the C should be capped. So it's string colon colon to lowercase with a capital C. You'd see that everything is getting printed in a lowercase. And let's say you'd want to filter them as well. Filter, I'd want to only take those ones, str dot contains a. So you can see that one of the lines is filtered out. So what we are seeing here is we are seeing ways of how to read content from a file and we are using map to map it to a different piece of text. You can do a filter and you can do a lot of other processing around these lines. In this step, we learned how to read from a file. What we saw was reading from a file with new I.O. is a simple cakewalk, right? Either you would use read all lines if it's a simple file or you can read it as a stream using the lines method and you can do map, filter, whatever functional stuff you would want to do it or you can directly print it to the console. I'll see you in the next step where we would discuss about writing to a file. Until the next step, bye-bye. Welcome back. In the previous step, we tried to read from the file. In this step, let's focus on writing to a file, right? So control C, control V, I'll call this file write runner. And let's open up the file write runner. Let's remove all this stuff which is present in here. And I would say in resources, file write. This is the file we want to create. Now, what do I want to write into the file? Let's create a list, right? So let's say list of, I'll say apple, boy, cat. Very interesting stuff, right? Elephant. Let's say these are the things I would want to write it into the file. Yeah, don't laugh. So I'll say list of string, list is equal to this list, right? So I would want to write this list out to the file. How can I do that? you can easily guess, right? So all that I need to do is say files dot write and say the path file, actually I should rename this. It should be for path file to write, right? The names we give to variables are the most important thing when it comes to programming. So let's give good names. And what I can do is I can pass the list. You might be wondering, is it as simple as this? Yes, it is. Cool, right? The program succeeded. Let's see if the file was created. Oops, there's only data.txt. Let's do a refresh, right click refresh. And there we go. There's the file write.txt. And it contains apple, boy, cat, dog, and elephant. That's cool, right? It's as simple as that to write to a file. That's the magic of new IO. So, one of the important things you can check is the exact path, right? So sometimes you might have got the path wrong. In those kind of situations, you might have a problem, but make sure that you have resources and the slash in the right way. This is how you write to a file. I'll see you in the next step. Until then, bye-bye. Congratulations. In this section on files, we learned various operations that you can perform on directories and files. We started with finding ways to list files in a specific directory and then we walked through recursively through all the files and we tried to filter them as well. We also found a way where we can actually use the find method to filter things based on the attributes of the file, whether it's a directory, what is the size and things like that. After that, we learned how to scan the content of a file, how to read the content of a file. When we use read all lines, we discovered that it would read all the lines in and that might not be a very good approach when you have large files. And that's where we talked about files.lines, which gives us a stream. And once you have a stream, you can do a lot of operations on it, map, filter, and things like that. The last thing which we looked at was how to write to a file, how to take some content and put it into a file. 
I hope it was a nice little section which gives you an overview of how things are done in new I.O. So all the things that we looked at are features which are either introduced in Java 7 or Java 8. In Java 7, Java brought in this Java new I.O. Java NIO that's the package which is present in here and we use things when we were scanning and things like that we used lambda expressions here we used predicates and things like that which are concepts from functional programming so this is kind of an advanced introduction to files if you look at old programming related to files you might be finding things like streams and all that kind of stuff you don't need to worry about all that all that you need to focus on is trying to learn the new way of programming with files with Java. I'll see you in the next section. Until then, bye bye and have a nice time. Welcome to this new section where we will discuss a lot of things about concurrency. While we talked about threads, we talked about synchronized. And that's the only approach that we discussed until now about concurrency. In this section, we'll explore something called locks. We would look at implementations of atomic operations like atomic long, atomic integer and a wide variety of stuff related to that and also will be introduced to some of the important concurrent collections. We'll talk about concurrent hash map, copy on write array list, copy on write array set and things like that. In this step, let's set the ground up for our particular section. Let's get started with creating a new project, our project. I would say concurrency. You can go ahead and click finish. Now over here, let's start with creating a very simple example. What we want to do is to create a new class, right? So let's go ahead and start creating a class. Um, the package I would try and use for this is com.in28minutes.concurrency. And the name of the class I would give is concurrency runner. Let's have a main method also in here. Cool. Right. So we have a concurrency runner class and we have a main method in here. What we want to do is we would want to implement a simple counter. I'll explain you why it's important to understand a counter. We'll talk about something called an atomic operation and the fact that our typical implementation of a counter will not be atomic. That's basically what we would want to discuss in this specific step. Let's create a simple counter class, right? So let's create a new class, control N, class, counter. And in the counter class, let's have a simple int variable as a counter, right? So int i, let's say, is the counter. And I would want to have increment method for i, void increment. Let's make it public. Public void increment. And what does the increment do? Think about it, i++, right? So i++, let's also initialize the value of i to zero. Let's have a getter as well, generate getters and setters. Um, for i, I only want to have a getter. Cool, this would help us to get the value of i. Using this counter is very simple, right? So all that I need to do is in here, counter, counter is equal to new counter. And I can say counter dot increment and I can say sys out counter dot get i. This might not be a perfect implementation of the counter, but it's good enough, right? If I increment it thrice, it would increment it three times. That's pretty cool. That's kind of standard thing. Now, one of the things that you need to realize is I++ looks like a very, very simple operation, right? But actually, when we look at it in depth, it's involving three operations. What are those three operations? The first thing is to get the value of i, increment, and the third one is to set the value of i. Now, let's say this counter is shared between five threads. What would happen if, let's say, Two of them are trying to do the increment method and the first one has done the get i and the second one also also has get i. So let's say the current value of i is 15, right? So the current value of i was 15. The first thread did a get i. So it gets, what does the value thread one gets? It gets 15. 
The second thread also at the same point did a get i. So what does it get? 15. The first thread increments it. So what does the value become? 16 and it sets it to i. So the value of i at this point would be 16. Now the other thread now has the value of i as 15. So it would increment it as 16 and it would set the value of i as 16. So even though two threads have done the increment, from 15 the value should go to 17. But what would be the value in i? It would be 16. So the thing is i++ is not really a thread safe operation in the sense that if I'm executing the same method at multiple threads, there is a chance that some of the updates might be missed. This is called not thread safe. Thread safety is when a method can be safely run by multiple threads at the same time. However, this method is not thread safe because there's a chance that an update to i might be lost. And that's where we talked about synchronized. So if you put a keyword called synchronized, then only one thread at a point in time would be running this specific method. So if there are two threads trying to run this method, the first one is starting to get, execute this, then the second one has to wait for this specific thing. In this specific video, we introduced you to the concepts of thread safety. We understood that even a simple operation like I++ is not thread safe. We saw that I++ is actually a set of multiple operations. It's not really atomic. So multiple threads might be executing multiple sets of operations. And therefore, we said we have to use the synchronized keyword to make sure that only one thread is executing this method at a specific point in time. That's cool. Now, this is thread safe. However, there are a few problems with this kind of an approach. In the next step, we would discuss about these problems and look at furthermore solutions for this problem. The idea behind this section is to kind of give it like a journey, right? You set the context, you try something, you try some other thing, and then at the end, you end up with a solution. So it's kind of a journey from the basics to kind of the advanced stuff related to concurrency. We'll look at other approaches in the next steps. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In this step, let's look at some of the problems which we might face with a synchronized approach. Right, so this counter has just one variable that is being incremented, right? So let's say I have a new class I'm copy pasting it, counter. So I'm calling this by counter. So by counter, and I would want to say by counter. And over here, we would want to have two variables, int i is equal to zero, int j is equal to zero. Oops, I forgot to have a private on the i. That's not cool. So private, let's add private on the counter as well. I don't want it to be accessed from outside, right? Let's encapsulate it better. Now, because this is a by counter, I cannot just call this increment. It should be increment i, and this should be get i. That's cool. So increment i and i plus plus. Now, what I'll do is I'll copy these methods, synchronize public void increment j, and I would also say get j and this would be returning j back, and this is doing j plus plus. So this would in, in, involve get j, set j. Only one thread would be able to execute j plus plus at a specific point in time. This is a by counter, right? So we took the similar logic from the counter. So we just took the approach of the counter and created a by counter. And this is a very, very, very simple example, right? If you look at real world applications, it would be much, much more complex than this. Now. Think about it. What is the problem with this approach? I have two methods which are synchronized. Increment i, increment j. Both these methods are synchronized. What is the problem with synchronizing both of them? Only one thread can be executing any of the synchronized methods. So there might be one thread waiting for increment i, the other thread waiting for increment j, even though these two operations are completely different. So i++ will not affect j++ at all only one thread would be allowed to execute either of these methods. 
This is the case when there are two methods. Imagine if there are 10, 15 synchronized methods which are present in there. And there are a lot of threads waiting to be executing those methods. This would have a significant performance impact. Basically, the problem with synchronization using synchronized is the fact that only one thread can be executing all the synchronized code on an instance. So, if there is a lot of synchronized code on a specific instance, it would have significant performance impact. In the next step, let's discuss a solution for this. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In the previous step, we understood the problem with using synchronized. In this step, let's look at a solution for it. We would talk about locks and how they help you to prevent the problem that happens with the synchronized keyword. Let's copy this code by counter, control C, control V, and I'll say by counter with lock and say OK. As we discussed with synchronized keyword, everything is synchronized in the sense that all the code is synchronized and that means only one thread is allowed to execute any of the synchronized methods. Locks help you to break the synchronized code into multiple sets of code. With locks, you can say, I would want to get the lock and at the end, you can say, I would want to release the lock. So you can say at this point, say get lock for this particular thing. And you can say release lock at the end of it. Same thing, let's remove this. We know that I++ is a complex operation. It's not as simple as it looks. Let's remove this as well. So get lock and I can say release lock. So locks allow you to say, okay, I would want to get the lock for this specific thing. And with locks, the thing is you can get the lock instances. So you can have a separate lock for this method and you can have a separate lock for J method. So you can get lock for I. You can say release lock for I get lock for j and you can say release lock for j. That means that if two threads are trying to execute increment i and increment j, they'll be allowed to execute them. However, if two threads are waiting for increment i, they can only execute it one after the other. That's basically what locks allow. So let's now implement a lock. Lock, lock for I. So I'm saying a lock for i is equal to new reentrant lock. So reentrant lock is one of the implementations of lock. And let's import lock as well. Control 1, Command 1. And I'll copy this and have lock for j as well. Now, I would want to get the lock for i. How do I get the lock for i? So lock for i. says lock for i dot lock and over here I can say lock for i dot unlock and the same in the synchronized methods as well right so here I would be using a different lock and lock for j dot unlock that's it. Doesn't this code look cool? I would need to also remove the synchronized because synchronized is no longer needed. What we are using is locks. So what would happen here is when I say lock for i dot lock, what would happen is this call would check if there is any other thread having a lock i. If no other thread is having a lock for i, then it would get the lock. It would acquire the lock, go ahead and do the i plus plus. And then it would release the lock. When I'm executing lock for i dot lock, there is another thread holding a lock. Then we would wait for it to release. So basically, we are actually having locks for different parts of code. The thing with locks is instead of having one big synchronized chunk of code, we are breaking it up into multiple small chunks of synchronized code. So a thread can be executing this. And in parallel, another thread might be executing this as well. That is the flexibility that locks provide. There are other methods which are present in locks as well. So you can 
kind of look at a few other methods which are present log for i dot this try lock try lock tries to get the lock then and there so if it does not get the lock it would return a false back so you can react to that the other one is you can also say try lock with time and a time unit basically you can say i would want to wait for the lock for 10 seconds and no more than that so possibilities like that exist with lock but at the simplest level this is the code that we would typically write lock for i dot lock lock for i dot unlock and that would al allow us to make this code synchronized or make this code thread safe without going in for synchronized in the next step we would look at how we can improve this further using atomic classes until then bye bye welcome back one of the important reasons why we had to have the locks is because this is not an atomic operation this involves three steps and that's the reason why we cannot do i plus plus and depend on it being thread safe right what if there are more thread safe operations what if there are classes that are providing those thread safe operations that's where the idea for atomic classes comes into picture let's look at a few of the atomic classes in this specific video let's go to the by counter with log control c control v and i'll say by counter with atomic integer the thing is over here we are declaring it as an int instead of int if we use atomic integer so atomic integer is one of the concurrent classes so you can see java util concurrent import it in so you can see java util concurrent atomic atomic integer that's where it is and now it cannot be zero i'll say new atomic integer now why should we use atomic integer good question let's look at it so i'll create j also using atomic integer and now i can remove the locks why because atomic integer provides basic atomic operation so if your methods are just doing basic atomic operations then you can remove the locks what i can do here is i dot increment and get what atomic integer does is it provides increment as an atomic operator it makes sure that this piece of code is automatically thread safe so once i call i dot increment and get i can rely on atomic integer making sure that it is thread safe and the same thing now over here it should be get i should be i dot get and instead of j plus plus increment and get and instead of get j j dot get now the responsibility we are taking away from our locks and giving it to the class called atomic integer however you need to understand that this approach will not work for everything the fact is we are doing a simple increment and that's why atomic integer is good but there might be multiple steps in your operation which might need thread safety and in those kind of situations you have to go with a lock but in this situation because it was a simple operation we go with an atomic integer if you look at the atomic integer class you can see that it says an atomic integer is used in applications such as atomically incremented counters this is the one which we used it says atomically increments the current value as you can see there are a number of get and set methods there are also methods like get and increment get and decrement as well so decrease a value and also you can do get and add as well so there are a wide variety of atomic operations that atomic integer offers and other than atomic integer there are other classes as well so if i double click it in here and do this so you can see that there is atomic boolean atomic integer array long long array and also there are classes called long adder and long accumulator we'll look at long adder a little later in this specific section which would help us to do things like addition and subtraction also in an atomic way the idea behind this step was to introduce you to the concept of atomic classes we looked at atomic integer an example with it we looked at a few methods with it and also we looked at other atomic classes which are present in the java util concurrent dot atomic package until the next step
Welcome back. In the previous steps, we looked at synchronized keyword, we looked at using locks, and also we looked at atomic integer and a few other atomic classes. In this step, let's discuss about something called concurrent hash map. We'll look at an interface called concurrent map and we'll implement a simple example using concurrent hash map. Concurrent hash map is part of something called concurrent collections. The thing is, with the emergence of logs as an option to synchronize different methods based on different logs, there are new kinds of algorithms that are emerging to enable thread safety. And all these concurrent collections use different kinds of algorithms to provide thread safe code, which can be used in different kinds of scenarios. One of them is something called the concurrent hash map. Now, what is the problem with a hash map or a hash table? Hash table is thread safe, right? So what is the problem with it? Let's look at it in this specific video. Consider this code we wrote while we were doing collections, right? We used a hash map and what we did in here is we were trying to find out how many times a specific character occurred in a string. And to find that, what we did is we tried to get the character from the hash map and if it's null, then we put a value of one. Otherwise, we put a value, we incremented the number of occurrences. That's the logic which we are implementing in here. We know that hash map is not thread safe, right? So this one is not thread safe in any way. But imagine we are using hash table. So instead of hash map, if we were using hash table, even then this code would not be thread safe. What we are doing in here, there's a chance that one thread reads the thing and before that thread processes it, another thread also might try to read the character and thereby an update might be lost. The important thing is this whole thing is a complex logic and there might be a chance that different threads are executing different parts of it. What concurrent hash map provides is a combination of atomic operations like this. What we are doing in here is if it is not present, we are initializing it and setting a value of 1. If it is present, then we are incrementing it. So for operations like this, concurrent collections provide basic atomic operations. Let's look at that when we talk about concurrent maps. Let's open up the concurrent map interface, concurrent, so control shift T, concurrent map. If you look at the concurrent map interface, there is one method which is present in here, compute if absent. What the compute if absent method does is if the key is not present, if the key is not present in the map, it would default the value to whatever value is returned by this mapping function. When we talked about lambda expressions, we looked at functions. So if we create a function and put a reference to it in here, whatever value is returned in here would be made as the default value if the key does not exist. And after that, you can perform whatever operation that you would want to perform. So the entire operation that we are seeing in here is offered by a simple atomic method in the concurrent map. There are a lot of other operations like this which are present, compute is present and a lot of other things. The thing is, these operations are all atomic in the sense that once you call it, you can depend on it being thread safe. It's not like this code in here, which is definitely not thread safe and the responsibility of making sure that it is thread safe falls on you. In this step, we looked at the fact that this kind of code might not be thread safe. And we also talked about a few operations which are present in the concurrent hash map, which might help us to make this code thread safe. In the next step, let's try and implement that. Until the next step, bye-bye. Welcome back. In the previous step, we discussed the fact that code like this might not really be thread safe. And we said we would be using concurrent map to make this code even more thread safe. In this step, let's look at how to implement it. We would start off with implementing the example with a hash table, and then we would switch that example to use a concurrent hash map. Let's create a new class. I'll call this concurrent map 
runner with a main method and click finish and let's create a string so string str is equal to let's just have abcd 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 and we would want to find out how many characters are there in i mean how many times a character repeats right typically when we solve problem like this what we would do is we would say map of character because you would want to find out how many times a specific character is stored and we would say long or integer right so what i'll do now is not use long typically we can also use atomic integer or atomic long because it would ensure that the increment operation is atomic with long the increment operation is not atomic because it involves multiple operations so to introduce a new class to you i would use something called long adder and over here what i'll do is say occurrences is equal to new if you want it to be thread safe we can say hash table right let's import hash table actually hash table has a t small and let's import map and let's import long adder as well so the typical way we would be implementing this operation is by saying for char character in str.2 char array for each character we need to check if this character is in occurrences occurrences dot get for character so i'm saying long adder is equal to that if long adder is equal to null what we want to do we would want to say long adder is equal to new long adder we can say long adder dot increment and after that we can say map occurrences dot put it's it's typical code right there is nothing uh, very difficult about this character comma long adder the reason why we use long adder is because it provides an atomic increment operation if we were using integer we had to do i plus plus that would mean that it's not an atomic operation all right so now you can see that this is typically how we can do that and now i can say sys out occurrences and now i can say run you can see that space is pre present twice a is present three times all the others are present three times right so that's cool i mean that is how we would typically do it but when we look at these three lines of code these are not really thread safe because we are getting this so let's say two threads execute this code at the same time what would happen and let's say the character is present five times before that so the thread one would increment it to six however the thread two also had the value of five so it will also increment it to six so an update is lost to prevent that from happening we have the concurrent hash maps when we want to use a concurrent map we can do this so concurrent map is equal to concurrent hash map and import it in so now we are using a concurrent map you can see that concurrent map offers all the operations that a typical map offers in addition to that concurrent map also offers other methods so i can say occurrences dot compute if absent so if the specific key which is the character is absent what i can do is i can create a mapping function when we learned about lambda expressions we learned how to create a function right he, here you can see that it's a function the input is a character and the output is a long adder so what i can do is i can take a character ch and the output i can return is a new long adder so what does this do if it's absent it would 
set the value to long adder and now I can do a increment so all this code will not be needed anymore so it does the increment and also the put now let's see what would happen if I run this code no change in output so all the code that was present earlier is now replaced by an atomic operation and that's the beauty of going for a concurrent collection. Concurrent collections make a lot of operations which involve multiple steps into atomic operations. I would recommend you to spend some time looking at the other methods which are present in the concurrent map as well. I'll see you in the next video. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In the previous step, we saw that concurrent hash map provides certain atomic operations which are not really present in a hash table or a hash map the thing is that is not the only advantage of a concurrent hash map in this step let's look at another important advantage that a concurrent hash map provides the thread safe alternative for concurrent hash map in earlier versions of java is hash table and we know that in hash table what is used to synchronize all the methods are synchronized that means if i'm inserting in any of these buckets let's say i'm inserting in bucket 6 a value and at that point the entire hash table is logged the entire hash map is logged you cannot do anything with it the other thread has to just wait concurrent hash map takes an intelligent approach towards this problem it says let's divide the hash map into multiple regions and let's create locks around them what I'm saying is just a simplistic way of looking it to make it easy to understand. However, the regions might not be according to the buckets or things like that. With that disclaimer aside, let's say this entire hash map is divided into three regions, right? So I would say the region up to four is considered to be one, nine is considered to be one, and the remaining is considered to be one more. With a concurrent hash map, if you are inserting in one region, you can do updates and retrieval from the other region because concurrent hash map uses different logs for each of these regions. So this region one uses a different log compared to region two compared to region three. Different logs are used for each of these regions. Thereby, you get not only the advantage of atomic operations, but also you get better performance. So if a thread is doing operation on region one, another thread does not need to wait if it has to do operations on any of the other regions, region 2, region 3, or region 4. That's the advantage that concurrent hash map provides. In this step, we looked at another advantage of a concurrent hash map. In addition to the atomic operations, it also divides the hash map into multiple regions, and each region have a separate log, thereby increasing the amount of concurrency that is possible. I'll see you in the next video. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In the previous step, we looked at concurrent hash map. In this step, let's look at a few other concurrent collections which are based on an algorithm called copy on write. If you do a control shift T and search for copy on write, you would see copy on write array list, copy on write array set. What is the copy on write thing? And what are the operations that you can do on copy on write array list and copy on write array set? As far as the operations are concerned, it's no different. The copy on write array list also implements the list interface, so it does not provide you any new operations. Whatever you can do on an array list or a linked list, the same operations you can do on copy on write array list. But there is a small difference in terms of how it's implemented. As you can see in here, the copy on write array list says a thread safe variant of array list. It's a thread safe, so it's thread safe, in which all mutative operations, so add, set, whatever operations which make changes are implemented by making a fresh copy of the underlying array. So that's the name, right? It's copy on write. Copy on write, what it does is whenever you make a change, it copies the entire array. So underneath the array list is an array that we know, right? So what happens is whenever I modify anything in a simple array, it would make a 
fresh copy of the entire array and copy the elements into it. As it says in here, it is very costly typically, right? Copying the entire array is not going to be a very efficient thing. But the thing is, this kind of an array list is very efficient when you're going to read a number of times. So you are going to do a number of reads and very less changes in your array list. So if you have situations where I'm doing 10,000 reads from an array list, or 20,000 traversals in an array list, but only 15 insertions or 20 updates. In these kind of situations, the number of updates are very, very less. And the number of traversals, the number of reads are very, very high. In those kind of situations, this might be a useful alternative because when you use this kind of an approach, you don't need to synchronize the read operations. You don't need to use locks and on the read operations. All that you need to do is make sure that your write operations are synchronized and thereby you get a huge performance boost. Let's create a simple example. There's no different from an array list actually. So let's create a new class. I'll call this copy on write array list runner and have a main method. And over here, list, list is equal to new, copy on write array list. Oops, let's just say string. And over here, I will say list of string. You don't need string in here, right? Okay, copy and write array list import, import list, control one, that's cool. So now I can say, if let's say we are just adding a few strings, right? So we are doing and that. So this is no different from a typical array list. I'm repeating this multiple times, right? Let's say there are multiple threads which are inserting values and let's say the number of threads which are inserting the values are very less, let's say three threads. And there are 10,000 threads which are looping around this and doing a list dot get operations. So let's say there are 10,000 threads which are actually at a point in time, they're looping around the thing or let's keep it simple. Let's use a for string If I run this, it's no different from typical, right? And bad cat, that's it. But let's say this is in a separate method and this is in a separate method. And there are three threads which are inserting values very rarely. Probably it's they're inserting 15 to 20 values in total, but there are 10,000 threads which are consuming the list values and printing them. In these kind of situations, if I synchronize everything, so if I'm synchronizing all the methods at the same time, so let's say, I'm synchronizing the add method and I'm synchronizing the get method as well. What would happen? At any point in time, only one of these 10,003 threads would be able to execute the add or the get. And that would impose a severe performance penalty. What copy on write array list does is it only synchronizes the add operations. It does not need to synchronize the get operations because it implements add operations by copying the entire array. So while it's copying the array, the other threads can continue reading the old array. That's not a problem. Once it copies it, then it switches the old array with the new one which is created. Copy and ar write array list does a little bit more work, not little bit, a lot more work when there is a change that is done in the array list. But the advantage is in that you get more concurrency. One of the other things that you'd need to understand is the fact that based on your usage scenario, you can come up with new algorithms to make sure that you get the right performance to ensure that you have the right amount of concurrency. So based on the kind of operations that are present, if there are more reads and very less writes, or if there are a lot of writes and very less reads, 
you can create logs or you can synchronize different parts of the code differently using logs and things like that and thereby you'll be able to get better concurrency copy on write array list is one of the such implementations copy on write array set this is the one i was talking about so copy on write array set and copy on write array list are an implementation of this copy on write approach until the next step bye bye welcome back in this section on concurrency we took a big journey starting with using synchronized to synchronize the counter and we discussed the advantages and disadvantages of using synchronized and then we looked at by counter we said by counter has problems because of the synchronized keyword and we said let's implement it with a lock we implemented by counter with a lock and then we moved into atomic integers we said this kind of implementations using a lock for the basic atomic operations are provided by things like atomic classes one of the atomic classes is atomic integer we also talked about atomic log and wide variety of other stuff after that we switched into the concurrent collections we talked about concurrency map or actually the concurrent map and we looked at an example of concurrent hash map where it divides the entire hash map into multiple regions and it ensures that different logs are used for different regions thereby promoting more concurrency so you get more performance the other thing we looked at is the atomic operations that it provides as well things like compute if absent atomic operations like this would ensure that writing thread safe code is much more easier after that we looked at copy on write array list we discussed the fact that copy on write array list is perfect for scenarios where there are very few writes but a lot of reads copy on write only synchronizes the write operations because it creates a copy of the whole thing on modifications it creates a new array whenever something is modified thereby the need to synchronize the get methods the read methods is removed the idea behind this section was to give you a big picture of everything which is involved so that in your mind you have a high level picture of what's going on the details with things like this are not really important it's very important to have a big picture in your mind very very clearly and that's what this section aims to provide i hope we were successful in that endeavor i hope you had a lot of fun doing this section and i'll see you in the next section until then bye bye welcome back over the course of this course we have used imports a number of times in this video let's quickly revise them let's get started i'll create a simple class as usual class and i'll call this imports runner and let's put this in com in 28 minutes dot tips slash imports and let's add our main method and finish what we want to do is we would want to look at something called imports right so if i say string str is equal to this do i need to really import the string class i'm using the string class in here but am i importing it in do you see an import in here nope why is it so the reason it is so is because string is in a package called java.lang java.lang is part of the default import so even though you don't do a import it's almost like you're doing a java.lang.star import so this is kind of what is happening in the background and when i say this you'd see that it says java.lang is unused or i can say import java.lang.string so over here we are specifying the import for a specific class this is the way you would specify the import for everything from a package however the important thing is the fact that java.lang is imported in by default so if you are using anything in java.lang let's press this so i've opened up string class by control and clicking this or if you are on mac command and clicking it and once you have opened it i'm clicking this thing in here so once we click this thing in here this class is shown in the jar file and 
you can see that there are a lot of stuff which is present inside the java.lang. So I would recommend you to take a look at what is present in the java.lang. You can use all these classes automatically without specifying an import because they are in the java.lang. Instead of string, let's say I was using big decimal. It doesn't really matter, right? So we are looking at imports. You'd see that I would need to import it in. So it gives a compilation error because it's in java.math package. So import big decimal would actually try and import it in this way. One of the best practices in Java is whenever you do an import, import a specific class. Don't use something like a star which is used in here because that's not a good practice. Typically, the good practice is to import all the specific classes. The important things that you need to remember about imports is that by default, java.long package is imported. You don't really need to specify java.lang. And all the other classes that we want to make use of, we have to do an import for them. An interesting thing would be something called a static import. Let's say system.out.println. So this is something which we keep doing, right? We kind of say system.out.println imports. This is how we typically write code. And when I run it, it would print imports, right? Instead of specifying system dot every time, what we can do is we can do something called a static import. We can do something called import static, the package for system. I'm doing a control click. It's Java dot lang, right? So you can say import static Java dot lang dot system dot out. So what I'm doing is I'm doing a static import of the system.out.method. And now I don't need to specify system dot anymore. So whenever I use system.out.println, I can just do this. So I can say out.println static imports. And you know, we can run this. And you'd see that it's printed. So instead of calling system.out.println each time, if we do a static import, then we can directly do something of this kind, out.println imports. Over here, until now, we had done a static import of a variable. So inside the system, there is a static variable called out. So you can see that there is a static variable called out, and we used static import to import that. And from now on, I can say out.println and all that kind of stuff. You can also do static imports with methods. So let's say you are doing collections sort so let's say i'm doing a collection dot sort right so collection dot sort i don't really care about it so i'll say new array list actually this should be something really uh, which is a real list which you need to use in here but i'm lazy right so i'm creating a new array list in here directly so first thing i would need to do is i would need to import array list in here so let's import array list you can see that there is a new java.util.array list coming in and now I would need to do an import of collections as well. So over here what we are doing is we are importing array list and collections in to be able to execute this line of code. Sort is a static method on collections. So instead of always calling sort and collections dot sort, you can also say import static. I know collections package is directly in here. And you can say import all the static methods inside collections. And now what I can do is I don't need to specify the type. So I don't need to specify collections and I don't need to specify the import as well. What is happening in here is a static import of all the methods which are present in the collections class. From now on, I can just call it sort. I don't need to say collections.sort and import it in. These are very useful when I'm, let's say, using sort in a specific class thousand times. I don't want to be maintaining that class, but yeah, let's say there is a specific method, static method, which you are using multiple times in a specific class. You don't need to use the class name dot the name of the method each time. You can just call it by the name of the method and do a static import in this specific way. In the short step, what we looked at is the default import, which is java.lang. After that, we looked at importing static variables java.lang.system.out. After that, we looked at importing static methods, java.util.collections.star. 
I would recommend you to try and take another example of a static method and try and import it statically and try and make use of it. Until the next tip, bye bye. Welcome back. In this tip, let's look at something called blocks. We have been using if blocks, for blocks a number of times. In this specific tip, we'll look at it in a little bit more detail. Let's create a new class. As usual, new class, I'll call this blocks runner and I'll change the package tips. Not imports, we would want to call it blocks, right? And let's add in a main method and finish. And over here, we looked at if conditions a number of times, right? So if I, if let's say three greater than two, then do something. System dot out dot print three greater than two. This is what we have done a number of times. So anything between the curly braces is called a block. So this is a method block. This is a code block. This is a if condition block, right? You can also have a else condition block and so on and so forth as well, right? One of the important things is not using curly braces and writing code like this is a very bad practice. So what would happen is somebody might come and add in code like this, right? And they might be thinking, okay, this is might be this is in the if. But actually, only the first statement is inside the if, right? So I would need today, if you have multiple statements, to put them under if, you need to have a block. The fun fact is that you don't really need a if condition to have a block. This is valid. See, this is cool as well. I can even declare variables in here. So I can say int i. The thing is, once I declare a variable in a block, it's only useful inside that block. I cannot say over here, I cannot go out of the block and say this is not out dot print i. That's not allowed because i, it says, I cannot be resolved to a variable. So a variable which is declared in a block, so there might be a statement of code which is present in here. Let's type in quickly something in here, system.out.println main. So I can have some statement of code in here and start a block after that. And within the block, I can declare variables and I can also have logic in here. This is kind of a tip. I have never seen code which does something of this kind. But the most important thing for you with blocks is to make sure that you use braces or you make sure that you have a specific block created. Whenever you're using a if or a for or a while, whenever you have conditionals or loops, make sure that you're using blocks. Blocks are considered to be good practice. I'll see you in the next tip. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In this tip on Java programming, let's look at something called a equals method. Let's create a new class. I'll call this equals runner as usual and equals as the package name as well. Let's have a main and finish. What I would want to do is create a simple class. So over here, what I can do is actually create a class in here. So I'll call this class client. And let's say this guy has an ID. So let's make it private, private int ID. And let's add in a constructor, generate constructor using fields, and say we have an ID present in here, right? One of the important things that we have learned earlier when we were talking about equals is by default, two objects are equal only if they are referring to the same object. What does that mean? Let's create two clients, right? So client C1 is equal to new client of one. And I'll create a C2 with the same ID. So both these clients have the same ID. So typically we would kind of think of them as the same client. However, if you go ahead and do something called equals, there's a method called equals. So let's do this out and say c1 dot equals c2 what do you think this would print let's run this aha it says false even though they have the same ids because by default the equals method would only compare if they are the same object it does not look at the values it just sees okay are they the same object 
nope, C1 is different from C2. If you do C1 equals C1, what would be the output? The output would be true because they have the same object. Or C2 equals C2, it, you'd get the same output. But if you do C1 equals C2, you'd get a false back. The default implementation for equals method is provided by the object class. As we know, all classes in Java, which does not extend anything, inherit from object class. So we are inheriting the default implementation from the object class, which only compares if they are the same object, if they are present in the same memory in location. That's basically what it compares. But we would want to add logic to this to say, okay, I would want to do a little more than that. I would want to compare the IDs of the objects. That's where equals and the hash code methods come into picture. You can say, I can, I've said equals method. Why do we need to talk about hash code also? Don't worry about it. We'll talk about it a little later. For now, what we'll do is over here, I'm inside the client class. What I'll do is I'll do right click, source, and say generate hash code and equals. That's the awesome thing, right? We are using Eclipse. So instead of writing the code for hash code and equals, I'm getting Eclipse to generate it for us. Generate hash code and equals. I'd want to use the ID to compare. And let's go ahead and create this. Now, you'd see this is the default implementation which is generated for hash code and equals. Like instead of OBJ, I actually like calling this that. So I'll say instead of OBJ that, so you can say right click refactor rename and say that. So if this is equal to, op so that is the object that we are comparing against, this is the current object. So if this and that are the same object, return true. If that is equal to null, if that is null, that means they are not equal because there is an object with this and that is null, so it's false. And if the classes, so we are comparing the classes, if the classes are not the same, if the if that belongs to some other class, then return false. You can see that the, the parameter which equals accept is of the type object. It is not of the type client, it is of the type object. That's another thing that you need to remember. Over here, what we are doing is we are getting the client, other client, and comparing the IDs. We are saying if IDs don't match, then return false, return true otherwise. So if the IDs of two objects are the same, then we would return true back. If this logic is a little bit confusing, don't worry. Try and do a debug and you should be able to easily understand what's happening in there. For now, what we'll do is we'll run this program. So we have generated the equals method and now you can see that this is printing true. This is actually comparing one and two. Now, if To make sure that it's working, I'll create a C3 and I'll have a client with an ID2 and c1 dot equals c3. Let's run this. Mm -hmm. This returns false. That's cool, right? So c1 and c3 have different IDs. However, c1 and c2 have the same IDs. So we were able to return true back. So in summary, what we have done in this specific step is we discussed a little bit about the equals method inside the object. By default, the equals method in the object only compares if they are the same object. So the logic would be something of this kind. If this is equal to that, return true. Otherwise, return false. This is the default implementation which is present in object. So all this code will not be there. We generate an implementation which compares the IDs using Eclipse. What we are doing in here is if the IDs are the same, then we return true back. If the IDs don't match, then we return false back. There's one thing you might not understand. Why did we generate the hash code method? We'll look at it in the next tip. I'll see you in the next video. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In the previous step, when we implemented the equals method, we also implemented the hash code method. The way Eclipse generates it is right click, source, generate hash code and equals. There is nothing called generate equals or generate hash code separately. It's combined generate hash code and equals. Why is it so? And what is the importance of hash code? That's what we would be discussing in this specific tip. Let's take a step back and look at how hash map works, right? When we create a hash map, internally we use something called buckets. How is an object allocated to a bucket? We said it is based on a hashing function. This 
hashing function is nothing but your hash code. So based on the hash code value, objects will be placed into different buckets. The efficiency of a hash map depends on the hash code implementation. So whenever we are creating a hash map and adding a specific class, you need to make sure that the hash code implementation is good. You need to make sure that the hash code implementation properly distributes values into different buckets so that in a specific bucket, you don't want thousand objects and zero objects in the other ones. You would want equal distribution of objects among all the buckets. That's what the default implementation of hash code provides in here. There are a few things that your hash code function should satisfy. One of the things is if two objects are equal, so if the IDs are the same, then their hash codes also should be same. The second thing is the value of the hash code should not vary unless the ID changes. So the value of the hash code should not be X at one time and Y at another time. And for these two reasons, we would recommend that whenever you implement the equals method, you also implement the hash code method compliant with these two properties. The exact implementation of the hash code method is beyond what you would need to understand as a beginner. The important takeaways from this specific video are one, whenever you implement an equals method, you should also implement a hash code method. Your hash code method should distribute the objects evenly among the different buckets. That's the most important thing about a hash code method. And the two properties which a hash code method should always satisfy are if two objects are equal, then their hash codes should also be equal. And also hash code should not change unless the values of the object changes. Those are some of the important takeaways about equals and hash code. As a beginner, I can understand that some of this code that you are looking at in here is confusing. But as you gain more experience, you would see that these become much more easier to understand. Until the next tip, bye bye. Welcome back. In this tip, let's look at something called access modifiers. There are multiple access modifiers, private, public, default, and protected. What are all these? And how are they applicable to classes, variables, and methods? That's what we would want to learn in this tip and the subsequent tips. In this tip, let's focus on the class level access modifiers. Let's get started. I'll create a new class. I'll say class access modifiers. And I would use the package com in 28 minutes tips. I'll say access and I'll call this package one. So in access, we are creating a package called package one or you can call it package A. Package one is fine, I think. And let's go ahead and create a main method as well. Typically, the access modifiers which are allowed are public, protected, default. I'll put it in parenthesis as it's actually absence of an access modifier. That's what makes it default and private. All these access modifiers are used to enforce encapsulation. These don't really protect you from outside security threats. These actually help you to decide what kind of things in your class are accessible to people who write code outside your class. If I say something is public, so public class, class access modifiers, this means that this class can be used from anywhere. So not only this package, so I can, in this package, I can say class access modifier C is equal to new. So in this, in this class itself, I'm able to create an instance of the class access modifiers. You'd see that even if I had a different package, let's create a new package. I'll copy this, Control C, Control V, Control C, Control V, and I'll call this package two. So access dot package two. And what I'll do is I'll 
I have the class access modifiers class also created because I copied this in. What I'll do is I'll rename this. I'll not want to have this as class access modifiers. Let's call this class access modifier runner in other package. I'm just calling it class access modifier runner in other package. Right click refactor rename. Continue. Cool. I would want to delete this line of code in here, right? So now what is happening in here is this is in another package. Class access modifiers is in a different package. If this class is public, then what would happen is I can use class access modifiers class in other package as well. So even in here, I can use the class which is in a different package. So even though this class is in package two and this is in package one, I can use that specific class. Now what I'll do now is I'll go and remove the public. I'm removing the public from the here. And you'd see that there's a compilation error. Why is there a compilation error? Let's see the import. The type is not visible because a default access modifier class is only visible in the package in which it is created. So inside the same package, it's visible. Inside the same class, it's visible. But outside that particular package, in a different package, package two, it's not really visible. That's your tip number one, right? So a public class is visible everywhere. So once I say a class is public, it's visible everywhere. But if I remove the public, then this becomes default class. And the default class is only accessible inside the same package. So you can use it in this package or sub packages of this specific package. But in all other places, it's not available. That's tip number one for this specific video. Tip number two is that you cannot use protected on a class. So on a class, you cannot say either it's protected or you cannot even say it's private, public and default. That's basically the absence of the keyword public are the only two modifiers that you can use on a class. I'll see you with more tips in the subsequent videos. Until then, bye bye. Welcome back. In the previous tip, we talked about class access modifiers. We learned that the only access modifiers that can be used on classes are public and default. And default classes cannot be used outside that specific package. And we also learned that protected and private cannot be used on classes. Now, what we'll do now is we would look at something called method access modifiers. So what are the access modifiers that can be present on a method? To understand the different access modifiers, what we'll do is we'll create a new runner class. So I'll say control N and I'll create a new class method access runner and I'll say create a main method let's use package one as well in here so we have a method access runner in here right so method access runner is present what we'll do also is create a simple class so I'm going to the package one in the package one I'm creating a class what do I want this class to do let's look at it right now Right, so let's call this example class and over here let's create different kinds of methods right so I'll create a public method public void public method let's not really do anything in here what we want to check is if this can be accessed or not protected method so how can I say something is a protected method how do I need to say? Yep, it should be protected in here, right? Now let's create a private method, right? And the last one I would want to create is a default method, right? So these are all the things that we are actually creating. I need to rename this. It should be default method, right? Let's create a main method also in here main and over here let's create an instance of the example class example class example class is equal to new example 
class and over here let's try and do example class dot and you can see that I can use private method protected method I can call public method and also I can call default methods that's cool right so inside the same class so this is main method which is present inside the same class inside the same class I can access everything that's not a problem at all that's cool right now this is a method access runner so what I'll do is I'll copy the same code in the method access runner into method access runner I'll rename this actually I'll have to call method access runner this is inside same package right this is inside same package so method access runner inside same package so right click refactor rename should be easy so the thing you'd see is only the private method does not compile so inside the same package you can access all the things except for private so you can access protected public and default but you cannot access private let's now copy this method access runner inside same package to package to I'm copying this control C and doing a control V and you can see giving a compilation error let's rename it first I'll say method access runner in different package and say continue let's import the example class it's imported in now you can see that even protected and default would give you compilation errors this is because in a different package you can only access the public methods in the class you cannot access private you cannot access protected and you cannot access default as well all these are not accessible until now in this specific video we saw examples of what would happen when I have a private method protected method public method and default method and access it from the same class same package and a different package let's look at it from the perspective of an example class if you declare any method as public it is available everywhere so wherever you can access the example class you can access the public method whether it's the same package different package anywhere you will be able to access it protected on the other hand can only be used either in the same package or in sub classes so if another class extends example class then you would be able to use the protected method in there private methods are only available inside that specific class nowhere else default methods are available only inside that class and the same package if you go outside that package even if you inherit you will not have the default methods available a good understanding of all these is important because when you create your classes you need to decide what kind of things you would want other classes to access so you would always need to think about okay what are the things my subclasses need to be able to access you need to make them protected what are the things every class needs to access okay those things I would make them as public all the other things you should make them private this would ensure that your class is properly encapsulated one of the important things is whatever discussion that we had about methods is equally applicable to variables however you don't really want to make any of your variables public unless those are final variables which are not going to change in value all the other variables should remain private most of the time you should allow access to these private variables through methods of various access levels protected or public until the next tip bye bye welcome back in this video let's look at the final non access modifier in the previous tips we looked at access modifiers public private protected and default there are also things called non access modifiers these are final and static in this video let's look at final access modifier on methods and classes what would happen when I put a final on a class or a method let's create a new class 
I'll call this final, actually it's non-access, so final non-access modifier and let's say runner, final non-access modifier runner and over here I want to have a main method as well. So let's go ahead and run this. Now let's create a couple of classes, right? So I'll say final class, final class, cool. Now what happens when I put final before a class? What would happen? What do you think will happen? Let's try extending this class. So class, some class extends final class. Mm hmm. Compilation error. It says type some class cannot subclass the final class, final class. The important thing is when you call a class final, that means it cannot be extended further. Nobody can inherit from that specific class. That's final. Why do you want to make a class final? Good question. Let's look at string class. So I'm opening up the string class, control shift T, command shift T, or opening up the string. You can see that string is a final. So in Java, string is a final class. You can look at the wrapper class integer. It is also a final class. That means nobody would be able to extend string, integer, long, or any of that kind of wrapper classes. Now, why, why is it important that you make a class final? Whenever you think you don't want to allow extension of your specific class, you don't want somebody to extend the functionality in your class and modify the behavior of your class. One of the important things to realize is that whenever somebody extends your class, they have the privilege of modifying some of the code of your methods. And that might not be something you'd want to allow in certain situations. If you look at string class, it is used as hash code. It is used to decide where an object is stored in memory and all that kind of stuff. So it's kind of a sensitive class and Java decided that, nope, I will not allow extension of a string class and that's why it's labeled as final and the thing is not just classes but methods or can also be declared as final so let's comment this just to keep the code compiling let's create a new class right class some class and let's have a method which is present in here let's say this is a public method it returns void and let's call this do something. Let's not really worry about the names of the methods. What we are really interested in is what is happening when I put final on the class, right? So I'll say class, extending class, extends some class, right? Typically what I can do, I can override the definition. So this is fine. But what would happen when I put a final inside the method? So I'm making this method final. You can see that there is a compilation error coming up. It says cannot override the final method from some class. It says, nope, this method do something is final. That means you cannot change the code of it. You cannot override it at all. So a final method cannot be overridden. A final class cannot be extended. That's the way you can remember it. Why do you want to make a method final? If you remember, we created something called a recipe, right? So we created a class called abstract recipe where we decided these are the steps that are present and all the other subclasses can get to implement all the steps, but they cannot change the logic in those kind of situations. So if you want no, none of the subclasses to change the execute method, you would want all the subclasses to strictly follow this order. This should be one, this should be two, this should be three then you can actually put a final. Once you do this, then none of the subclasses would be able to change the order of execute. It will always be get ready, do the dish and clean up. Okay, there you go. That's some of the important things related to final access modifier. A final class cannot be extended. A final method cannot be overridden. And I'll see you in the next tip. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In the previous video, we looked at final class and final methods. In this step, we look at final variables and final arguments. Let's get started with the final variable. 
So let's have, let's say I have an int i, i has a value of 5, and let's say at a later point in time, I am saying i is equal to 7. This is allowed because variable's value can change, right? But let's say if I want a variable's value not to change at all, that's when I can put final. So as soon as I make a variable final, you'd see that there's a compilation error here. It says the final variable cannot be assigned. So once you put something as final, it can only be assigned value once. So I can say i is equal to 5 instead of this, I can say i is equal to 5 as well. This also allow first time you can assign a value, but you cannot change it. You can assign a value once, but not more than once. So final va variable, the value of it can only be assigned once, and after that, it cannot be changed at all. Now, what's the final argument, right? So let's look at it. Let's copy this class. Cut, 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 cut. Let's take this method, public void, do something. I'll say do something else. And let's have a final int argument, final int arg, right? So if it's a normal argument, no final in here, then I can say arg is equal to I can change the value of argument, right? It's not a good practice. I mean, the most important thing to realize is changing the value of an argument is not really a good practice, but it's allowed. But if I make it final, what would happen? Aha, compilation error. This is not really allowed because this is final. Once an argument is final, you cannot change the value of it. Now, you might be asking, when should I use final? When should I use final on variables? When should I use final on arguments? The answer is typically final is recommended on all variables and all arguments. Typically, you should assign values to variables only once and you should assign values to arguments only once. You should not keep modifying the values of variables. This is called immutable programming. And that's recommended because it leads to code which is easily understandable. That's why you'd see coding standards, a lot of coding standards recommend, okay, every variable should be final. And if you don't use final on a variable, it would come up as a coding standard violation. While it is not possible to have every variable as final, at least attempt to have most of the variables as final where you would only assign values to them once. In this quick tip, we looked at final arguments and final variables. A final variable can only be assigned a value once. And the same is the case with a final argument. You cannot change the value of a final argument inside the method. I'll see you in the next tip. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In the previous step, we understood a little bit about the static variables. We discussed why we need static variables, because we need to share the same data between multiple instances of the same class. We don't want one instance per object. We want a shared instance between all the objects, and that's when we go for a static variable. Now, let's discuss why we need static methods, right? Let's look at that in this specific tip. Let's get started. So earlier we said player one dot get count. Think about it. Is count belonging to player one or does it belong to player class? Right? So will player one have a different count from player two? Not really. Right? So player one and player two would have the same count because it's the shared instance between all the instances of player. They'll have the same value for the count. Then why should I access it using player one dot get count and player two dot get count? Why can't I access it through the player itself? So instead of player one dot get count, can I say player dot get count? Player dot get count, right? So that's what static methods enable us to do. So I can say static in here, static public int get count. This method in here is only accessing a static variable. So you can call it static, and now you'd see that the thing compiles. And let's run this. It's one. So the value of player count at this point is 1, at the end of this is 2. The thing is, static methods can also be called using instances. So I can still call player player1.getCount and player player2.getCount, but that's not really recommended. So it's not recommended that you use an instance to call a static method. That's why you get a pointer from Eclipse saying the static method 
should be accessed in a static way. Why are you accessing it in a instance way? Why are you using an instance? Why don't you call player? The fact that we are using a class name to call the method tells that it is a static method. It's something which is shared between all instances of that specific class. So even though I have multiple instances of this class, there will be only one instance of the count and this get count method is shared between all of them. Cool, right? In this method, we try to understand why we need static methods. We understood that we can call static methods using the name of the class directly. The thing is, we had been calling a number of static methods until now, right? So we used collections.sort. We also used a number of methods to create collections, right? List.off, map.off, and a lot of static methods. But this is the first time we actually created a static method of our own. Until the next tip, bye-bye. Welcome back. In the previous step, we understood a little bit about the static variables. We discussed why we need static variables, because we need to share the same data between multiple instances of the same class. We don't want one instance per object. We want a shared instance between all the objects, and that's when we go for a static variable. Now, let's discuss why we need static methods, right? Let's look at that in this specific tip. Let's get started. So earlier we said player one dot get count. Think about it. Is count belonging to player one or does it belong to player class? Right? So will player one have a different count from player two? Not really. Right? So player one and player two would have the same count because it's the shared instance between all the instances of player. They'll have the same value for the count then why should I access it using player1.getCount and player2.getCount? Why can't I access it through the player itself? So instead of player1.getCount, can I say player.getCount? Player.getCount, right? So that's what static methods enable us to do. So I can say static in here, static public int get count. This method in here is only accessing a static variable. So you can call it static, and now you'd see that the thing compiles and let's run this it's one two so the value of player count at this point is one at the end of this is two the thing is static methods can also be called using instances so i can still call player one dot get count and player two dot get count but that's not really recommended so it's not recommended that you use an instance to call a static method that's why you get a pointer from eclipse saying the static method should be accessed in a static way. Why are you accessing it in a instance way? Why are you using an instance? Why don't you call player? The fact that we are using a class name to call the method tells that it is a static method. It's something which is shared between all instances of that specific class. So even though I have multiple instances of this class, there will be only one instance of the count and this get count method is shared between all of them. Cool, right? In this method, we try to understand why we need static methods. We understood that we can call static methods using the name of the class directly. The thing is, we had been calling a number of static methods until now, right? So we used collections.sort. We also used a number of methods to create collections, right? List.off, map.off, and a lot of static methods. But this is the first time we actually created a static method of our own. Until the next tip, bye-bye. Welcome back. In the previous tips, we learned a little bit about the static methods and the static variables. In this tip, let's learn a little bit about what are the rules around static variables. Where can you use them, where you cannot use them, and all, all that kind of stuff. Let's continue using the same example from last time. What I'll do in here, I'll create a couple of getters and setters for name, right? All shift S, generate getters and setters. And I would want to generate a getter and setter for name. So we created the getter and setter for name, right? So name, get name and set name are instance methods, right? The get count on the other hand is a static method. 
it is a class method this one here is a class variable it's shared among all the instances name on the other hand is an instance variable or a member variable because it's unique per member the thing is inside static methods you cannot access instance variables so the static method is a class level method inside class level method you cannot try and access instance data so you cannot say system.out.println and say name this is not allowed it says compilation error what it say you cannot make a static inference to a non static field name so it's saying in a static method i cannot have a non static value being accessed right however in a non static method in a instance method you can access the so you can say sys out and say count that is allowed in instance methods you can access instance and static variables in static methods you can only access static variables that the most important thing that you need to understand out of this specific video static methods can only refer to static variables and only call static methods you can even not call the member method from here so i cannot say system.out.println oops sys out and say get name nope that's not allowed you can only call static methods from here you cannot call the instance methods of that specific object from a static method okay there you go those are some of the tips related to static methods i'll see you in the next tip until then bye bye welcome back in this video we look at a few good uses of non access modifiers we would be looking at the internals of the java apis let's look at the integer class right so as we discussed earlier it's a wrapper class so it's final so the implementers of java don't want anybody to extend the integer class so they made it final if you look at the integer class there are a number of values which are declared as public static final right so it's a combination of static and final why do you want to use static and final together static means it's a class level variable right and final means this value cannot change why do you want to do something like that when you have something which is a constant value in those kind of situations you'd use public static final so the value of min value is not going to change integer dot min value is going to have the same thing but in programs you don't want to do something of this kind right so let's say i have a small program i'm going to use one of the classes which we did earlier so over here i would want to print the maximum value in an integer what i can do is either hard code the value right i can say okay i can start hard coding the value what's the value it says 0x this right and i can run this right it prints the value okay all the other stuff is because of this don't greatly get confused okay cool now if i run this you'd see okay this is the minimum value which is going to be present inside a integer somebody who looks at this program will not be able to understand okay what is this why is it being used in here instead of that if i say integer dot min value think how easy it would be to understand right earlier we did a program right we did a program to find out number of seconds in a day right so the number of seconds in a day the way we did that was we started with 60 seconds in a minute into 60 seconds sorry 60 minutes in an hour into 24 days sorry 24 hours in a day right so this is what we did earlier so when you print this i'll come at the line above people would understand that this is going to be 86400 right but what is 60 representing in here 60 in here 24 in here somebody who looks at this program will have no idea so in those kind of situations so what we can do is we can say public static final int public static final int and say seconds in minute is equal to 60 
seconds or minutes in hour is equal to 62 right why am I changing it let's copy this again hours in day is equal to 24 and I can say seconds in day is equal to multiplication of all this right I can even go ahead and take it one further and say seconds in minute into minutes in hour into hours in day actually this might look an extreme thing to do we are trying to complicate things a lot in here but when you look at real world applications sometimes this might be good thing to do so now you'd see that the same output is printed but anybody who looks at this program knows exactly what you are doing you know he knows that okay seconds in minute is 60 minutes in an hour is 60 hours in a day is 24 and the way seconds in day is calculated by multiplying seconds in minute minutes in hour and hours in day it clearly communicates what you are trying to do and that's what you'd be able to do by using public static final the great thing about public static final is not just in this class because we made this variable public you can use this in any other class in your application that means you can use seconds in minute anywhere else from this specific thing maybe you don't want to call it blocks runner you would want to give it a proper name probably time unit or something of that kind but you can use it anywhere else you'd see that public static final is one of the common thing that is used so you can see public static final min value max value and you can also see here arrays so this is not made public because uh, java does not want to it to be accessed outside the package so it's creating an array with 0 to 9 and a to z if you look at the collections class also there are a lot of things which are declared as public static final it's not really important to understand what these are but you can see that public static final is a common thing across multiple apis and one of the ways you can try and make it easy to understand is by creating constants by using public static final until the next step, bye-bye. Welcome back. In this video, let's discuss another important tip. This would be regarding nested classes, inner classes, and static nested classes. What are these and what is the difference between them? Let's cr start with creating a runner as usual, right? So I'll call this it should be nested class runner. And the package, I'll say com in 28 minutes tips dot nested class and let's have a main method and finish right until now we created a few classes of this kind right so class we said person and we create a person class down here this is a default class right so this is nothing but something like a default class this has default access this can be only used inside this package that's what we discussed when we talked about class access modifiers over here inside the nested class runner inside the class I can create a few classes let's try and create them so I can say class inner class and create a class here yep it's allowed and also you can create something called a static nested class what's the difference between an inner class and a static nested class static keyword this is nothing but a default class i'll call this instead of person default class this is a default class this has got nothing with what we are discussing right now what we are talking about are some things which are called nested classes anything which is nested inside another class is called nested classes and nested classes are of two kinds the first kind is called a inner class the inner class is a nested class which does not have static before it and a static nested class is something which is inside another class and has the static keyword before it okay that's the nomenclature so the nomenclature is anything inside another class is called a nested class a non-static nested class is called a inner class there is a static nested class which is nothing but a nested class with the keyword static so that's the what 
Now, let's get to what is the differences between these two. What is the difference between an inner class and a static nested class? Let's try and create an instance of the inner class, right? So I can say inner class, inner class is equal to a new inner class. Is that allowed? Mm -hmm. Compilation error. It says no enclosing instance of type nested class runner is accessible. Now, I'll comment this. I'll say static nested class, static nested class is equal to new static nested class. Is this allowed? Yep, this is allowed. So a static nested class, an instance of it can be created without creating an instance of the nested class runner. So without creating an instance of the containing class, you can create an instance of the static class. How do I create an instance of an inner class? The thing is to create an instance of the inner class, you need an instance of the class which is enclosing it. So I would need to create an instance of the nested class runner and only then I'd be able to use something of this kind. So this is the syntax of how you can create a inner class. The thing is an inner class instance cannot exist without an instance of the enclosing class. Only when the enclosing class instance exists, you can create an instance of the inner class. Because of this, you can actually access values in here. So if there is an int i in here, I can have a method in here, so public void method. You can try and access the value in here, so I can say i is equal to 5. Because when I am creating an inner class, I know that there is an instance of this class which is created and thereby I can actually access the value of this. But if I try to do the same thing in a static nested class, what do you think will happen? Yep, you can see that this gives you an error. It says making a static reference to a non-static field. It should be uh, commented out. In summary, nested classes are those classes which are inside another class. The declar entire declaration of the class is inside another class. A non-static nested class is called an inner class and an inner class cannot exist without the enclosing class instance. So an enclosing class instance is needed to be able to create instances of the inner class. Therefore, in the inner class methods, you can access variables which are declared inside the nested class. A static nested class, on the other hand, is a static thing, so it can exist without an instance of the enclosing class. You can directly create an instance of the static nested class and use it as if it's a separate class on its own. However, inside a static nested class, you cannot access the member variables of the enclosing class. Okay, there you go. That's a quick summary of nested classes, static nested class and inner class. I'll see you in the next video. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In this video, we would talk about something called a anonymous class. Let's first set up a simple example and this, then discuss what is an anonymous class. Let's get started. Let's create a new class. Control N class. I'll call this anonymous class runner. I can create a main method and I would want to have it in tips anonymous. Finish. We have the anonymous class runner and what I would want to do is to create a list of strings, right? So let's say list dot of let's import list and say list of or of and at ball elephant and I would assign it to a new animals 
and I would want to be able to sort this specific list. So what I would want to do is I would want to create a new array list so that I can actually modify this. So I'll say new array list of string. So by default, list dot of creates immutable things, right? So I don't really want immutable. I would want things which I can change. So I'll create an array list. Cool. Now, the way we can sort this typically is by saying collections dot sort list, right? Animals. And what would happen if I do a sysout animals now? It prints the things in alphabetical order. We saw that there is an overrided thing in the sort where we can use a comparator as well. So if I don't want to sort in alphabetical order, but I would want to sort by, let's say, length, we can create a comparator. So the way we created instance of the comparator earlier is length class length comparator implements comparator of string, right? It compares string values. And over here, I can say import comparator, control one, again, control one, I add the unimplemented methods. And now I can say return. I'd want to sort them in the order of lengths. And I'll say string, str1, str2. And we would want to compare their lengths. So we have integer.compare. There's a method in integer.compare which I can use str1.length, comma, str2.length. Right? This is what we did earlier when we did the comparator. So now, over here, I can say sort animals, comma, new length comparator, and run this. Animal, cat, ball, elephant. You can see that they are sorted by length. Three characters, three characters, four characters, and eight characters. Cool, right? So this is what we did to implement an interface earlier. The thing is, I don't really need to do this. So let's say I don't want to create this. So I don't want to create this class at all. And still, I can use the comparator. I can say new comparator. Over here, I can press open brace and close brace. And I can implement the entire interface methods in here. So I can say new comparator, control one, and say add unimplemented methods. And now I can implement the compare method in here. I can say str1. Oops, let's actually, it's generating object. What I'll do is I'll remove this method. I don't want object. I would want to compare strings. Now. I can do add unimplemented methods. You can see that strings come in, str1, str2. And over here, now what we want to do is compare them. Right, integer.compare, str1.length, str2.length, all right. So what we are doing in here is instead of creating a new class and doing everything, we are actually directly implementing the comparator in here. So we are directly writing the code for the comparator in here and directly creating an instance of it. This way of creating a class is called an anonymous class because this class does not have a name. So let's run this animal, cat, ball, elephant. This class does not really have any name at all. You can actually right click refactor make sure that you are selecting the right way and you can say extract local variable and say length comparator you can see that this is creating a instance so here we are creating an instance called length comparator but there is no class this class does not have a name the instance of the class has a name but this class does not have a name any class that does not have a name is called a anonymous class one of the things that we have seen while we discussed about functional programming is that we create lambda expressions. Lambda expressions are nothing but 
implementations of the functional interface and they don't have names as well so they can kind of be thought of as anonymous classes as well so typically we create anonymous classes because we think uh, for example this comparator which we are creating in here the length comparator I will not use anywhere else in those kind of situations it's unnecessary ceremony to create a class put it somewhere and maintain it instead of that I can directly create it where I would want to and use it be careful when you're using anonymous classes because they get hidden in code so the anonymous classes get he completely hidden somewhere and people might not know that similar logic is being performed somewhere else so use it only in scenarios where you are 100% sure that this kind of logic will not be reused anywhere else until the next tip bye bye welcome back in this video let's look at a very important concept in java called enum enum stands for enumeration so let's look at what it is in this video let's start off i'll create a new class i'll call this enum oops enum runner e n u m and in tips enum as you can see i cannot create a package called enum because enum is keyword in java so i'll say enum s enums okay how do we get around all these restrictions finish with a main method and now why do we need an enum let's consider a scenario right so typically if i want to represent a seasons so string season i can say is equal to summer or i can say instead of summer i can say winter or fall or whatever right but the thing is if I use string I cannot restrict so somebody can come and store garbage how can I pose restrictions in terms of what are the values which a specific thing can contain that's where enums come into picture you can create enums with a very simple way so enum so enum is very similar to a class so instead of class I'm saying enum and let's choose seasons right so season I'm going to specify what are the different seasons so let's start with winter I'm a negative guy right so I'm starting with a winter winter after that spring summer come on fall cool now we have all the seasons defined so the thing is with this if I say season season is equal to something it's going to complain it can it says okay garbage it does not is not a valid value you can only have these values present season dot winter or season dot summer or season dot fall so this is what enums allow you to do and the other thing with enums is you can pass them to methods you can store them into instance variables so you can if you want create a season season in here as an instance variable wherever you can use a class to define a type you can use a enum to define the type as well now you might be wondering is that all nope that's not all there are a lot of utility methods that are present on the enum so this is one way of creating a season the other way you can create another season let's say season one is by from a string if you want to create a enum you can do that by saying season dot value of and pass in a string value so let's try winter oops it should be season not string it should be season and let's now print season one this out season one what would happen mm-hmm it says no enum constant of this type so you cannot use winter with capital w you should use all caps because that's the value which we have defined in here right so it's winter so if i want to get the value from a string then i would need to exactly match the string value which is present in here or you can say winter and then i can use 
winter in here. This is not really consistent, but I'm just showing you as an example. So ideally, I would want to have winter and winter in here. Cool. What are the other utility methods which are present? So you can say season one, that's winter, right? So season one is winter, and you can see that there are a lot of, lot of methods which are present. So you can say name, and it would print just the name of it, which is winter. It's just exactly the same what would happen when I system.out.println. Or you can print something called an ordinal. Each value in the enum is assigned something called an ordinal. So you can see that it prints a value of zero. So this value which is assigned is in the order def by default ordinals are zero, one, two, three, and so on. So ordinal for spring, for example, if I say if I say season dot spring dot ordinal, what's the ordinal? It's one. Now if I change the position of string spring, let's say to fourth the ordinal would be 3. One of the things is it's always a constant discussion as to how to store enums into the database. Can we use the ordinals to store enums into a database? The thing is, it's not really a good practice because if you use ordinals to store the thing, if you change the position of the thing in the enum, then the ordinal is going to change. So all the values that you have stored earlier into the database with uh, earlier ordinal have all been now modified. So that's not really a good practice. In the next video, we'll give you a tip as to how you can store values, how you can assign values to the enums. But for now, the ordinal is which position a specific value is inside a enum. It starts with zero and ends up to n minus one. The other method which is also present in enum is season dot values. So you can also get all the list of values. So this is going to return an array. So if I print it, you'd see all the values which are present. Will I? It's going to return an array. So it's printing the array thing. So to do a two string on an array, I should do arrays dot two string. And now this would print the content. Cool, right? So now it's printing summer, winter, fall, and spring. So season.values provides a way where you can actually get all the values, all the enum values, which are present in a enum. Okay, there you go. In this video, we gave you a lot of tips around enums. Enums help you to restrict the kind of values that are present to a restricted set. It also has a property called ordinal, which is by default assigned based on the position in the enum. And also, you can loop around all the values of an enum by using the values. We also looked at the value of method using a string. We also looked at the fact that this string should exactly match whatever is present in the enum, and it's case sensitive. Until the next tip on enum, bye-bye. Welcome back. In the continuation of the tip on enum, let's look at a few more things around enums in this specific video. In the earlier video, I said you should not use ordinals to assign a value or to store the value of an enum into a database. Then you might be wondering, how should I store this into a database? The typical way we would do that would be kind of assigning a value to it. So you can say summer of and say assign a value of it. So for now, let's assign an integer value. So I can say winter 2, fall 3, spring 4. Right. It gives you a compilation error, right? So how does how do you get this to compile and work? Let's look at that right now. So what we are using in here is a constructor. So this is like creating an instance of an object. So now I need to create the constructor. So I can say public season. If you make it public constructor, then everybody from everywhere can use it. I don't want to allow that. So I'll make it private. So private season, and I can say int value. So you can create a season by passing an int value. However, I'm making it private, so it can only be called from inside the class. So season of value, I'll say this dot value is equal to value. Now, this dot value, where is value present? Let's now create value as well. So I can say private 
int value. Cool. Right, so now the code compiles. The things that you are understanding right now is I'm not, not only am I assigning a value, but enum can contain variables and enum can contain constructor as well. Now, you might be asking, how can I get the value of this outside? Because right now, the value is not accessible outside. And that's what this is also telling us. It says, the season dot value is not really used anywhere. What we can do is we can create a getter. So I'm doing an all shift S and generate getters and setters. So you can even have methods inside an enum. What I'm doing is creating a get value method. I don't want to allow setting a value from outside, but I would want to allow get value. So now I can do a get value. So instead of ordinal, I can say dot, oops, let's leave that as it is and I'll print ordinal and over here I'll say get value. Mm -hmm. Is that good? So you can see that the odd value which is being printed is 4 and that's basically what we have assigned for spring. So the ordinal of spring is 3, however the value that we have assigned is 4. And the important thing is the value does not change irrespective of the position. So spring 4 the value would be retained. So the value of spring would be printed as 4. The ordinal has changed, but the value remains as it is. So in this tip video, what we discussed is the fact that enums can have variables, enums can have constructors, enums can have methods, and we also discussed how you can assign a specific value for an enum, and you can use this value to store it to the database. This value is not going to change, even if you're going to change the position of the value inside the enum. Until the next video, bye bye. Welcome back. In the previous videos, we looked at the basics of enum. We looked at how to create an enum called season and we explored how to use enums. Thing is, the enum can exist on its own. So it does not really have to be inside another class. So I can take this enum and actually put it in a class. So I did a control X and now I'm going to go to the package enums and I can paste it in control V and you'd see that the season is created outside and you can even make this public to say this is a class on its own and now I can save this. Let's do a format control shift F. Now you can see that a enum is stored in a file of its own. So you can do that as well. And that's how typically enums are stored. There are a lot of enums that are created as part of the Java API. And let's explore a couple of them. Let's look at one of the enums. Control Shift T, day of the week, right? So in a week, there are seven days only, and that's not going to change. That's why in the java.time API, there is something called day of the week enum. And the day of the week stores the possible values for a enum, right? Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Another example of an enum is month, java.time.month. So control shift T or command shift T and type in month and you can pick up the java.time. What would be the months which are present in here? You can see that in here as well. So it says January, February, and so on and so forth. You can also see that you can create a month off by passing in the value of a month. So there is a static method which is present in here, which allows you to create a month based on the number of the month. So you can start with one and go on up to 12 and pass it and get this specific month from the enums array. Over here, you can see that the month.values is taken and put it into a private static final. So all the values are put onto an array and it's used to access it in here. I'll recommend you to spend some time with the day of the week and the month classes to understand how enums can make your job as a programmer easier. One of the things that a lot of programmers have is something called primitive obsession. What does that mean is typically anything would be a string or a number. They would not even think about enums in most of the scenarios. And that's not good. 
So whenever you think there is a specific list of values and you would want to restrict to those set of values, try and go for a enum. Until the next tip, bye bye. Congratulations on completing this course on Java programming in 250 steps. I'm sure that you are as tired as I was when I'm creating this course. This was a very, very long journey. We started with the basics and then covered a wide variety of advanced Java topics as well. I hope you are better equipped as a programmer now compared to when you started the course. One of the most important things I would recommend you to do is to continue this journey of learning. Programming is not something which you'd learn in a month. Programming is a journey which would take years to complete. Make sure that you continue learning and I hope our paths cross sometime in the near